Reality Trend Surfing Volume 1 The Space of Variations Chapter 1 The Model of Variations The Rustling of the Morning Stars The barking of my neighbor's dog wakes me up. That vile creature is always waking me up. God, I hate that dog. Why do I have to wake up from the noises that ugly thing is making? I need to go for a walk, calm myself down, and try to suppress the desire to burn down my neighbor's house. There are always bastards breaking into my life and trying to get to me. I'm getting depressed, upset, and angry. It's wet and foggy outside. I am walking along a slippery trail in the gloomy forest. Most of the leaves have fallen, exposing the gray trunks of half-dead trees. Why do I live in the middle of this depressing swamp? I take out a cigarette. I don't really want to smoke, but an old habit forces me. Forcing me? Since when has a cigarette become a necessity for me? Yes, it's disgusting to smoke on an empty stomach in the morning. It used to be that when I was at a party or with friends, I liked smoking and got pleasure from it. Smoking was a symbol of fashion and freedom. But parties end, gray and rainy everyday life takes over with puddles full of messy problems, and each time I smoke away my problems by lighting up, telling myself, okay, I'll just have a little smoke, catch my breath, and plunge back into this hateful routine. Smoke from the cigarette gets in my eyes, and I cover them with my hands like a hurt child. I am so sick and tired of all of this. And then, as if echoing my thoughts, the branch of a birch tree, bent in an insidious way, hits me painfully in the face. Damn it! In a rage, I break the branch and throw it away. It hangs on the tree, and then starts bobbing up and down, back and forth, like the head of a jack-in-the-box as if mocking my inability to change anything in this world. Depressed, I drag myself further along the path. Every time I try to fight this world, it gives in, creating hope, only to flick me on the nose even harder later. It's only in the movies that you see heroes going towards their goal, destroying all obstacles in their way. That doesn't happen in real life. Perhaps life is similar to roulette, Maybe you win one time, a second, or even a third. Already you see yourself as the winner, and it seems the world is in your pocket. But in the end, you always lose. You're nothing but a Christmas goose being fattened up so you can be roasted and eaten to the sound of music and laughter. But it's a mistake, because this is not your party. You've made a mistake. Wallowing in these unhappy thoughts, I walk out to the sea. Little waves are biting at the sandy shore. The unfriendly sea blows a cold, wet wind on me. Fat seagulls are lazily waddling along the shore, pecking at something rotten. Their eyes have a cold and black emptiness to them, as though the world surrounding me is reflected in those eyes, a world that is just as cold and hostile. A bum is collecting empty bottles on the beach. Just get the hell out of here, you slob. I want to be alone. No, looks like he's heading my way. He's probably going to beg. I had better head home. Not a moment of peace. God, I'm so tired. I'm always feeling tired, even when I'm resting. It's almost as if I'm doing time in prison. It seems that very soon, everything will change. A new era will begin, and I'll become a different person, able to enjoy my life. But that is all in the future. For now, I'm stuck in the same miserable sweatshop. I'm always waiting, but the future never comes. I eat a tasteless breakfast and drag myself off to a boring job where I once again will have to squeeze out some sort of result that is needed by someone other than me. Another day of burdensome and purposeless life. Then I wake up from the rustling of the morning stars. What was that depressing dream that felt like a fragment of my previous life returning to me? Thankfully, it was only a dream. Relieved, I stretch myself the way a cat does. There he is, that lazy bone, sprawled out on the bed. You can tell by the way his ears are pointing that he is aware of my presence. Get your whiskered muzzle up and let's go for a walk. I've ordered a sunny day today, so I'm off to the sea. 
The path leads through a forest, and the rustling of the morning stars gradually fades away into a multi-voiced choir of the bird community. Over there in the bushes, someone is making an extra effort trying to sing, Food! Food! Ah, there he is, the little good-for-nothing. How can a fluffy little bundle like you be chirping away so loudly? Incredible, it never occurred to me before that each bird has its unique voice, and yet, not one false note is sung. And the many voices produce a wonderful, melodious symphony, something a skilled orchestra can never match. The sun stretches its rays amidst the trees. This magical illumination brings the beauty of the forest to life, transforming the woods into a hologram. The path leads me gently to the sea. Emerald waves are quietly whispering, talking with the warm wind. The empty shore seems endless, but I feel calm and content, as though this overpopulated world has created a secluded space just for me. Some people think our surroundings are just an illusion that we ourselves create. But I'm not arrogant enough to think that all this beauty is simply the product of my imagination. Still under the influence of my oppressive dream, I start to remember my former life, which in fact was just as gloomy and hopeless as the dream. Very often I've tried, as I'm sure you have, to demand from this world what I felt it owed me. In return, the world turns its back on me indifferently. Experienced people tell me that the world doesn't give in that easily, that you have to fight it to conquer it. So, I try doing that, but to no avail. I just wind up wearing myself out. But those supposedly experienced people have an answer for that too. That I'm a bad person, that I have to change myself, and only then can I demand something from the world. So I try to fight myself, but it turns out to be even harder. A few nights later, I have another dream. I find myself in a kind of nature preserve. Unspeakable beauty surrounds me, and I am walking, admiring the splendor. Suddenly, a stern old man with a gray beard appears. He seems to be the overseer of the reserve, and he starts to observe me. I move towards him, and as I open my mouth to speak, he silences me. His voice is cold when he tells me that he doesn't want to hear anything, that he's tired of cranky and greedy visitors who are never satisfied, always demanding something, making noise, and leaving piles of garbage behind. I nod silently in agreement and move on. The magnificent nature of the preserve astounds me. Why haven't I been here before? Entranced, I wander around with no particular aim, staring in awe. No words can describe how incredibly wonderful the nature around me is. I feel exalted without a single thought in my mind. Soon the overseer appears again. The austere look on his face has eased. With a gesture, he asks me to follow him. We climb to the top of a green hill where a spectacular view of a picturesque valley opens in front of us. Down in the valley, I see a village of some kind. Little toy houses overflowing with plants and flowers. It is a scene from a fairy tale. I could study the scenery in amazement for a long time, if only it did not seem so unreal. I start to suspect that such things can only be experienced in dreams. I look questioningly at the overseer, but he just smiles through his beard as if to say, you haven't seen anything yet. As we walk down to the valley, I realize that I can't remember how I got to the reserve in the first place. I want some kind of explanation from the old man. I make a silly remark about how lucky people are who can afford to live amidst this beauty. The overseer seems irritated and replies, Who stops you from being one of those people? I reply that not everyone is born rich and you can't control your destiny. The overseer ignores my words and says, That's exactly the point. Every man is free to choose any destiny he likes. The only freedom we have is the freedom to choose. Anybody can choose whatever he wants. His ideas are beyond my comprehension and philosophy of life, so I want to argue with him. But the overseer doesn't want to hear any of it and says, You fool, you have the right to choose, but you don't use that right. You simply don't understand what this means, to choose. This is all insane, I think. 
What does he mean that I can choose anything I want? As if everything in this world is allowed. Then I suddenly understand that it is just a dream. I am puzzled because I have never had the previous experience of waking up in a dream. I don't know how to act in such a strange situation. Once I realize I am dreaming, I hint to the old man that in a dream, as in waking life, he can say all the nonsense he wants, and that is all there is to his freedom. But my comment doesn't bother him, he just laughs at me. Realizing the absurdity of the situation, why even bother starting a discussion with a character in my own dream, I start thinking that it might be better to wake up. The old man seems to read my mind. Well enough, he says, we don't have a lot of time. I never thought they'd send me an idiot like you. Nonetheless, I have to complete my mission. I start asking him what this mission was and who they are. He ignores my questions and gives me a riddle which seems silly at the time. He says, Everyone can acquire the freedom to choose anything they want. So how do you get this freedom? Then he adds, If you solve this riddle, apples will fall into the sky. I start to lose my patience and tell the old man I have no intention of guessing any riddles. Only in dreams and fairy tales can you see all kinds of wonders, and in reality, apples fall to the ground, not into the sky. He replies, Enough, let's go. I have to show you something. When I wake up, I realize that I cannot remember what happened next in my dream but I have the strong feeling that the overseer somehow put information in my head, information I cannot express in words. Only one strange word remains in my memory. Transurfing. And the only thoughts in my head are that there is absolutely no need to furnish my world by myself, that everything was created a long time ago without my participation but for my well-being that it's not worth struggling with the world because that's the least effective method, and that no one is keeping me from simply choosing the world I want to live in. At first, these ideas seem absurd, and I probably would have forgotten all about the dream, but to my amazement, I soon discover that I can remember specific details about what the overseer meant by the expression to choose my own world, and how I can go about doing that. The solution to the overseer's riddle comes to me on its own, out of nowhere. Every day I discover something new, and each time I am surprised and a little afraid. I can't explain rationally where all this knowledge comes from. I can only say one thing for sure, that there is no way it could have come from me. Ever since I discovered transurfing, or rather ever since I was allowed to discover it, my life has been filled with joyful new meaning. Anyone who has ever done any creative work knows how much joy and satisfaction comes from something made with your own hands. But this is nothing compared to the process of creating your own destiny. Although the expression creating your destiny is not quite right because transurfing is a method, not of creating, but of literally choosing your destiny, much like choosing an item at the supermarket. The Riddle of the Overseer There are different theories about destiny. One says that destiny is the same as fate, that it is predetermined. No matter how much you try, you can't escape it. On the one hand, this interpretation seems hopeless because if your destiny is not one of the better ones, then there's no hope for improvement. On the other hand, there are always people who are content with this state of affairs because it's comforting when the future is more or less predictable, when it doesn't scare you with uncertainty. But for some people, the idea of not being able to escape their destiny evokes feelings of discontent and inner protest. They feel cheated, out of luck, and they start complaining. Why is life so unfair? One person has everything in excess, while another is constantly in need. Everything comes easy to one person, while another runs round and round like a mouse in a wheel getting nowhere. One person is gifted with beauty, intelligence, and strength, 
whereas another, unaware of what sin he is paying for, is labeled a second-class citizen his entire life. Why this injustice? Why does life, with its infinite variety, put limitations on certain people? Why are less fortunate people at fault? A deprived person feels resentment and tries to find an explanation for why things are the way they are. Then all kinds of teachings appear, like the ones that say you have bad karma and are paying for terrible sins committed in past lives. Other teachings try to explain why inequalities exist in the world and try to give hope by promising compensation to those who are suffering and in need. But these teachings also say that you will be rewarded somewhere in heaven or in another life. And no matter how you look at it, none of these explanations is satisfying. And it is not important whether your past and future lives exist or not because you are aware of and remember only this life. In this sense, it is your only life. If you believe that fate is predetermined, then the only way to avoid depression is to surrender and accept your fate as it is. After all, the experts say you were unhappy because you were always dissatisfied due to wanting too much. That the only way to be happy is to be happy. That you need to take joy in life. So you agree, even though it doesn't quite work. But you still wonder, is there really something wrong with wanting more out of life? Why force myself to be happy when I'm not? It's just as impossible as forcing myself to love. Meanwhile, you're surrounded by so-called enlightened individuals who are busy calling for universal love and forgiveness. If you want to avoid harsh reality, you can put this illusion over your head like a blanket and sure enough, you'll feel a little better. But deep down inside, you still don't fully understand why you should be forgiving people you hate or loving those you are indifferent to. What's the use? After all, it isn't natural happiness, it's forced happiness. As if joy, instead of coming to you by itself, needs to be squeezed out of you like toothpaste. Of course, some people aren't satisfied with the idea that life, their fate, is simply predetermined. They prefer to take joy in their achievements. For them, there is another concept of fate, that man forges his own happiness, that he must struggle to achieve happiness. To them, how could it be any other way? Smart people say that nothing comes easy, and it seems like an irrefutable fact. If you don't want to accept your life as it is, then you need to elbow your way to your own happiness. History also tells us how bravely heroes fight and how they sacrifice themselves day and night overcoming unimaginable obstacles. Those who win the battle are rewarded, but only after enduring tremendous burdens and loss. But that's not the whole story because millions of people fight and toil, but only a handful actually succeed. Which means that you can waste your entire life in a desperate struggle for a place in the sun all in vain. Is life that cruel? Is everything really so hopeless? The truth is that there is a way out. And it is simple because it is found on another level of existence. According to Transurfing, destiny is based on an entirely different view of the world. If you decide that fate is predetermined, something you are not in a position to change, then it will be that way. In that case, you willingly put your life into someone else's hands. You turn into a little paper boat that follows the waves of the sea, bending to their will. If on the other hand, you believe that you shape your destiny, then you consciously take responsibility for everything that happens in your life. You struggle against the waves, trying to take control of your little boat. Keep in mind that your choice is always made into reality. What you choose is what you get. Whichever worldview you adopt, it will be the right one. At the same time, other people will disagree and argue with you simply because they are also right in whatever worldview they adopt. If you take any phenomenon in our reality, and make it your point of reference, you can create an entire field of science. This field would have no contradictions in it and would successfully reflect one manifestation of reality. To create an entire knowledge system like a field of science, 
It's enough to take a couple of facts that don't have to be fully understood, but which nonetheless have a place in the system. For example, quantum physics is based on several improvable truths called postulates. They cannot be proved because they are the initial points of reference of quantum physics. In quantum physics, a micro-object can act as a particle in some cases and as a wave in others. Scientists cannot interpret such dualism, so they simply accept that this is the way things are. The postulates of quantum physics can accommodate the immense variety of shapes and forms through which our reality is manifested. Three blind men can then agree that an elephant sometimes behaves as a pole and sometimes as a snake. If we choose to see a micro-object as a particle, we get a model of the atom first conceived by the famous physicist Niels Bohr. In that model, electrons revolve around the nucleus much as planets revolve around the sun. If on the other hand, we take a wave as the micro-object's fundamental characteristic, then the atom looks like a blurred stain. Both models work, they just reflect different ways that reality can manifest. By its nature, the world is a whole, yet it is always taking on different appearances. As we try to explain one appearance, another enters and contradicts the first. Scientists try to unite different manifestations of reality so that contradictions can be removed. However, that is extremely hard to do. There is only one fact that is not subject to doubt a fact that is able to unite and reconcile all branches of knowledge and the immense variety of forms through which reality can appear to us. This one fact is that the diversity of variations is the foremost and fundamental quality of our world. By trying to explain separate manifestations, different schools of thought avoid the fact of the multiplicity of variations. They treat multiplicity as the beginning of the story, the point of origin, and they regard any branches of knowledge are secondary to it. But no one bothers with the point of origin as it contains no information. But oh yes, it does. It contains the most incredible information. We will use the multiplicity of variations as our starting point to solve the riddle of the overseer in my dream we will see that reality can manifest in an infinite number of ways. And despite the general nature of this claim, we will find that it reveals interesting and unexpected knowledge. Let's start with the fact that all forms through which reality manifests must have an origin, a place where the multitude of variations exists. Where are the laws of our world recorded? The world reveals itself as matter moving through space and time, and moving matter is subject to certain laws. If we distribute points on a graph according to a mathematical formula, we could say that the movement of a point along the graph is governed by a defined function. However, the formulas and laws are just abstract inventions of our minds, created to facilitate our understanding and explain what we perceive with our senses. It's highly unlikely that nature is keeping these formulas and laws hidden somewhere. How else can we fix points on a graph? Well, we can store the coordinates for each point, which is already a problem because there is an infinite number of them. Our memory is only so big and cannot handle such a massive amount of information. But to nature, infinity is not a problem. There is no need for nature to map the location or movement of points on a graph by using a formula. If we break up a linear function into an infinite number of small points, then each point can be a cause and each consecutive point can be an effect. Thus, the movement of any material point in space and time can be seen as an infinitely long and continuous chain of infinitely small causes and effects. Science uses laws to represent the motion of matter, while nature houses this motion in its pure form, as an infinite number of causes and effects. Broadly speaking, data about every possible material object and its path along the infinite number of points is stored in a field of information that we will refer to as the space of variations. 
This space of variations contains information about everything that was, is, and will be. The space of variations is an informational structure with a material basis. It contains all possible variations of any event that could take place. We can say that the space of variations contains all information. Even though our minds don't know exactly how this information is preserved, the essential thing to remember is that the space of variations works as a template, a coordinate network for moving matter through space and time. Each point in the space of variations contains its own variations of a particular event. To make this easier to understand, imagine that a variation consists of a script and decorations. The script is the path along which matter is transported, while decorations represent the external view or form that manifests as reality. The space of variations can also be divided into sectors, with each sector having its own script and decorations. The more space between sectors, the greater the differences in scripts and decorations. In this scheme, a multitude of variations represents your destiny. Theoretically, there are no limits to the number and types of scripts and decorations that can exist in a person's life. This is because the space of variations is infinite. The least significant event could have an impact on your destiny. Your life is just like any other transportation of matter. It is nothing but a chain of causes and effects. In the space of variations, cause and effect are closely linked. One follows the other, and the sectors of your destiny form a life track. The scripts and decorations on a track are more or less the same. Your life flows evenly in one direction until an event takes place that changes the scripts and decorations. Destiny then takes a turn and you start moving along a different life track. Imagine that you've been watching a play. You go back to the theater the next day to see the same play, yet this time it is performed with different decorations. The two plays you've seen are life tracks close to each other in the space of variations. On a third day, you watch the same actors, but this time with a different script. This life track is farther from the one you saw in the first two plays. The same play could also run in a different theater, and you would therefore experience a new interpretation of the play on a life track farther from the first three. Reality manifests itself in all its multiplicity precisely because the number of variations is infinite. Any point of origin can flow into the chain of causes and effects. Based on the point of origin you choose, you get a corresponding manifestation of reality. In effect, reality unfolds along a life track depending on the selected point of origin. Everyone gets what he or she chooses. You have the right to choose just because the infinity of variations already exists. No one prevents you from selecting whichever destiny you want. Mastering your destiny comes down to one simple thing, making a choice. And Transurfing gives you the answer to the question of how to make that choice. Picture a water pipe. A frozen ring is slowly moving along the pipe so that water in the pipe freezes only at the location of the ring. As the freezing ring passes along a particular spot, water molecules inside the pipe freeze into ice crystals. Then the ice melts and the water molecules are released again. Of course, the ice crystals themselves aren't moving through the pipe. It is the structure of ice, the frozen state, that is moving. Metaphorically, the water in the pipe represents the space of variations, while the ice crystals in each location represents a material manifestation of variations. The water molecules represent people, and their position in the crystal structure manifests as a possible variation of destiny. There is no answer as to what the freezing ring represents. In other words, why and how can an informational structure be transformed into matter? In the micro world of quantum physics, matter can take the form of a bundle of energy. Microparticles are being born and destroyed repeatedly in vacuum space, 
So in a way, matter exists, but at the same time, matter doesn't have a material substance. The only thing that is clear is that everything tangible is based on intangible energy. Suppose that as a result of an earthquake, a wave forms out in the sea. It travels along the ocean's surface as a large hump, but the water itself remains in place. It is not the mass of water that is moving, but rather the manifestation of its energy potential. Only around the shore does the water splash onto the dry land. All other waves are acting the same way. In this analogy, the sea is the space of variations, while the wave is the material manifestation. So what's the point? On the one hand, material manifestations move in space and time. On the other hand, variations remain in place and exist forever. This means that everything was, is, and will be. That's because time is just as static as space. You feel the flow of time only while the film is running and the frames follow one another. But when you unfold the film and look at all of the frames at one glance, they all exist simultaneously. Where does time go? Time is static until we start looking at each sequential frame one after another. Only then does time exist in parts. This is exactly what happens in life. And that's why the idea that everything comes and goes is so embedded in our consciousness. The fact is that everything written in the information field has always been there and will always stay there. Life tracks exist like film reels. Everything that has happened does not appear. It continues to exist, and everything that is about to happen is happening now. The present is simply the material manifestation of a given sector in the space of variations on your particular life track. You may wonder, how can all possible variations of my destiny exist permanently? Who would need this information? God? Nature? And why would anyone need this information anyway? In school, we learn that a given point on a plane can have any X and Y coordinates. Any from negative to positive values of infinity. Why hasn't anyone ever asked the question, why can a point have any coordinates? Just imagine a point moving along a linear function, asking itself, why is the path that I've already traveled down always been here? And why will it continue to be here forever? And why are my future journey and its path already predetermined? But when you look at the point and its path from above, there is nothing amazing about its movement along the path. Those questions become irrelevant. The space of variations works as a template. It determines how things should manifest in reality. Imagine a dark forest and a man with a flashlight. The man walks through the forest, and wherever he points with his flashlight, it illuminates a small part of the forest. Realization manifests itself like a spot of light. The entire dark forest is the space of variations, while the illuminated part is the realization of a variation of a given sector. What then is this light? In other words, what lights up or materializes a variation in the template? To answer this question, we must pick another starting point. In the modern age, there's already no doubt that thoughts are material. Reality appears to us in two shapes. On the one hand, it is defined by our consciousness. On the other hand, there is plenty of indisputable evidence to the contrary. Our thoughts do not function only as a motivation to action. They also have a direct impact on our reality. For example, our worst fears tend to come true. Of course, you can argue that we are not really talking about materialization of our thoughts, but rather of an ominous premonition. Sure enough, most paranormal phenomena tend to be unexplained and ambiguous, but this doesn't mean that we can ignore this form of manifested reality. There is plenty of evidence to support the fact that thoughts can have a direct influence on reality. In one way or another, your consciousness forms your destiny. For example, let's make the following statement our starting point. Waves of thought energy materialize a potential variant. This is true because reality can manifest in any form defined by consciousness. In other words, a wave of thought energy highlights a sector on the space of variations. 
and the variation of that particular sector then materializes. In this way, consciousness literally defines reality. But this is only one way of manifesting reality. It's not possible to form your reality the way you want just by meditating. Rather, thoughts impact your destiny as specific actions. You get exactly what you choose. Each person travels along his own life track. At the same time, everyone lives in the same world. The material world is one for everybody, but each person has his own manifestation of reality. Suppose you are a tourist in a beautiful city. You are admiring the gardens, fountains, parks, and smiling faces of the wealthy townspeople. As you pass a garbage can, you see a homeless person. He is just like you, in the same world, in the same dimension. However, he does not see what you see. He sees an empty bottle, the dirty wall, the police looking suspiciously at him, and so on. You live on one life track, he lives on another. Your life tracks have crossed in the space of variations. Therefore, this world as a materialization of reality is one for both of you. All material manifestations have an energy basis. The field of energy is primary, whereas all other physical manifestations are secondary. And the energy of thought isn't locked in your head, circulating there aimlessly. It gets dispersed into space, where it interacts with the surrounding energy field. Whenever you are thinking about something, the frequency of your thought energy is tuned to a certain area in the space of variations. The energy falls within a sector, and that sector's variation starts to materialize. Energy has a complex structure and penetrates everything in this world. Passing through a man's body, energy is modified by his thoughts. As the energy exits, it is transformed into thought waves, which in turn convert a sector of the space of variations into a material manifestation. When you think of something, either good or bad, you radiate thought energy into the space of variations. Modified energy gets applied to a sector, which results in corresponding changes in your life. Situations in your life are formed not only by specific actions, but also by the nature of your thoughts. If you have a hostile attitude towards the world, it will treat you the same way. If you are always whining, expressing your dissatisfaction with the world, there will be more reasons for you to be dissatisfied. If your attitude towards the world is predominantly negative, then the world will be a terrible place to live. The opposite, of course, is also true. A positive attitude is the most natural way of changing your life for the future. You really do get what you choose, whether you like it or not. As long as your thoughts have more or less the same direction, you find yourself on the same life track. As soon as your attitude to reality changes, in one way or another, your thought waves acquire new characteristics, and the material manifestation of your world moves from one track to another. On that new track, events follow a completely different script, in agreement with the parameters of your radiation. If for some reason you don't like the script, you'll struggle trying to change the situation. Every person presented with obstacles reacts negatively, expressing dissatisfaction or becoming depressed. Their thought waves then transfer them to a track where they encounter even more obstacles. From there, life rolls faster and faster downhill. This process may seem beyond your control, but in fact you are the one responsible for directing your energy of manifestation into problematic areas of the space of variations. You believe that by doing what you are doing, you are effectively overcoming obstacles. But in reality, you get exactly what you chose. If you choose to fight obstacles, you will have more than enough of them to fight. If you are preoccupied with thinking about problems, they will always be there in your life. Even though you direct your actions to change the situation on your current life track, you can never change a script itself in the space of variations. You can only choose another script. Even as you try to change unpleasant events in a script, you are thinking precisely of things you don't like. That thought energy then causes those things to materialize, and you get exactly what you don't want. 
It's not possible to change anything on your current life track in the same way that it's not possible to change an art exhibition that you don't like. You're not in charge of the gallery. But no one is stopping you from turning around and walking into another room to look at something that you like better. Of course, crossing to another life track where everyone gets what he or she wants doesn't happen simply by wanting it. Not all thoughts can be manifested, and not all desires are fulfilled. This is not because of the content or thoughts, but because of their nature. Simply dreaming about or wishing for something does not mean choosing it. Dreams don't come true. It's necessary to fulfill certain conditions for your dreams to come true. For each person, there are an infinite number of life tracks, destinies, in the space of variations. We have no reason to resent our destiny because we have been given the right to choose. Our only problem is that we don't know how to choose. The world appears to us in its multitude of possibilities as if it was created to satisfy any possible need. Anyone can find everything they ever wanted in this world. Even in different areas of knowledge, the world appears to us the way we want to see it. For example, idealism claims that the world is an illusion, and the world agrees. Materialism claims the opposite, and the world again has nothing against that opinion. People argue among themselves, imposing their opinions on each other, while the world shows that they are all right. The principles of Islam state that the fate of a man is recorded in the book, which means that fate is predetermined and you can't run away from it. Similar statements can be found in other religions. It is true that fate is already predetermined. The religious claims are wrong only in the idea that there is only one variation of a person's fate, when in actuality there are an infinite number of variations. You can't hide from your destiny. And to some degree that's true because you can't change the script of a variation. Fighting the world around you so that you can change your destiny is a difficult and unrewarding task. So don't try to change the script. Simply choose the variation you like most. The space of variations, where is it located? It's difficult to answer this question. Given our three-dimensional perception, we could say that the space of variations is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Imagine an infinite plane that does not have a beginning or end, and on that plane live tiny two-dimensional people. They don't suspect that there is such a thing as a third dimension. It seems to them that this flat plane is the world, and they cannot understand how anything could ever exist beyond its boundaries. Yet we know that we need only to add a third dimension to this model, and suddenly an infinite number of flat planes can be created. It is actually trivial to argue about the advantages of any given model in infinite space. Try to picture the infinity of increasing distances, such as outer space. Far off in the distance, there are no boundaries. The infinity of decreasing distances, strange as it may sound, also has no limits. We can only observe a limited part of the visible universe. Both the telescope and the microscope have their limits. And infinity on a micro level is no different from infinity on a macro level. There is a theory that the visible universe was created by the Big Bang. Ever since, according to this theory, the universe has been constantly expanding in all directions. Bodies move through the cosmos at great speeds. But if we change our point of view and take into account the enormous distances involved in the process, it would seem to us that this expansion is happening very slowly over an extremely long period of time. It's also a known fact that in a vacuum, at any given moment, elementary particles appear out of nowhere and disappear as suddenly as they appeared. Considering the relativity of space and time, we can consider each particle as a separate universe, similar to our own. After all, we don't know anything about how elementary particles are being made. According to physicists, elementary particles can sometimes appear as waves and sometimes as particles. 
By moving further into the micro world, the relative distances become similar to those in outer space, and the passage of time for the inner observer slows down once again. To an external observer, our universe exists for one moment only, just like a particle that is born and extinguished into emptiness within seconds. Whereas to us, observing from the inside of our universe, it has existed for billions of years. When you are having your next sip of coffee, think about this. How many universes have you just swallowed? You've just swallowed an infinite number of them because infinity cannot be divided into parts. It's as far and takes just as much time to fly into the micro world as it takes to fly to the endless expanses of outer space. Time, like space, is infinite. This includes time that runs forward and time that runs backward. Fragments of time can be as infinitely tiny as they can be infinitely huge. Any point on a time fragment can be considered a point of origin, on both sides of which lies infinite time. Moving the point of origin along the fragment of time doesn't change anything that is ahead or behind that point. This infinity of worlds within worlds exists simultaneously. The center of the universe is located at any given point at any given moment because the same infinity surrounds each point from every possible side. And all possible events exist simultaneously for the same reason that the center of the universe is located at any given point. This is difficult to imagine because it is impossible to take one look at the universe and see it all. No matter how far you imagine yourself moving in the universe, the same infinite space will surround you. There are, of course, even more confusing theories in which our visible universe is transformed into a finite sphere in four-dimensional space. But this doesn't make things easier because, again, there can be an infinite number of dimensions. Being unable to imagine all of this, we are forced to be satisfied with our narrow point of view, pretending that we understand something. According to the model of variations, man creates his own destiny. But the idea of destiny in transurfing differs from the generally accepted view. It differs in that you can choose your own happiness without having to fight for it. You don't have to accept or reject this idea. Just ask yourself whether you have achieved anything by fighting the world for your happiness. Everyone has to decide for himself whether to continue acting in the same way or to try a different approach. After all, you can spend your whole life fighting and struggling and get absolutely nowhere. Wouldn't it be easier if the world came to you on its own, especially since all it ever does is manifest your choices? Whatever you decide to order from the menu, it is always delivered to you, no matter what. But making a choice is not the same as wishing something. Wishes are granted only in fairy tales. Summary Reality can manifest in an infinite number of ways. The diversity of variations is the foremost and fundamental quality of our world. Any world model represents but a fraction of the multiple ways in which reality can appear. Any branch of knowledge is based on a chosen aspect of the manifested reality. Your choice is always made into reality. What you choose is what you get. The space of variations is an information field of what was, what is, and what will be. The information field contains potential variations for any event. A variation consists of a script and decorations. The space of variations can be divided into sectors, each of which contains its own variation. The larger the distance between sectors, the greater the difference in variations. Sectors with roughly similar parameters align themselves to form one specific life track. Material realization moves in space like a dense mass. Waves of thought energy materialize potential variations. 
Each organism makes its own contribution to the formation of material realizations. When the parameters of thought energy change, an organism moves to another life track. You can't change the script of a variation, but you are able to choose another one. Don't fight for happiness. You can choose a variation that you like. Chapter 2. Pendulums Destructive Pendulums Since we were kids, we've been taught to submit ourselves to someone else's will, performing our duties, serving our country, our families, the political party, the company we work in, the government, and even ideas. Our own will has had the lowest priority. Everyone has more or less a sense of obligation, responsibility, and guilt. Everyone in one way or another serves various groups and organizations like family, society, educational institutions, the workplace, a political party, the government, and so on. All these structures are born and start to develop when a group of people start thinking and acting the same way. New people join the group and the structure grows, gaining strength and forcing its members to follow established rules until it reaches a point where the structure is able to subjugate large social groups to its will. On the level of material realization, Energy structure consists of people united by common goals and material objects such as buildings, constructions, furniture, equipment, technology, and so on. But what is the process that enables structures such as these to be formed? A structure is created when the thoughts of a group of people are focused in one direction. As a result, the parameters of their thought energy become identical. Thought energies of independent individuals merge into one flow. In the middle of this energy ocean, an independent information-based energy structure is created, a pendulum. This pendulum starts living its own life and makes those who took part in its creation obey its laws. Why are these structures called pendulums? Because the higher and faster a pendulum swings, the more people, the more adherents, give it energy. Each pendulum has a characteristic frequency of vibrations that make it swing. This frequency is called its resonance. If the number of a pendulum's adherents decrease, the pendulum's swinging slows down. When there are no more adherents to swing the pendulum, it stops, and as an entity, it dies. Examples of dead pendulums include ancient pagan religions, stone tools, primitive forms of weaponry, outdated trends, and vinyl records. In other words, everything that is no longer in use. You're probably wondering, can all these things really be pendulums? Yes, any structure whose features are shaped by thought energy is a pendulum. In general, all living beings that are able to radiate energy in one direction will eventually form a pendulum. Examples of pendulums in nature include colonies of bacteria, populations of living creatures, schools of fish, herds of animals, woodlands, prairies, and ant colonies. Any structure comprised of living organisms that are relatively homogeneous and well-ordered can form pendulums. And since every living organism represents an energy unit, it can also be considered a pendulum. So when these pendulum units group together and start swinging in unison, they create a group pendulum that stands over its adherents like a superstructure. It makes up rules for its adherents to keep them together and to attract new adherents. Such a structure is self-governing in the sense that it develops independently according to its own laws. Its adherents don't know that they are acting according to the laws of the pendulum and not of their free will. For example, a bureaucratic apparatus develops as a self-governing structure, independent of the will of its separate officials. Influential officials could, of course, make certain independent decisions, but these decisions cannot be in conflict with the laws of the system. Otherwise, the pendulum will reject them. Pendulums are destructive 
by nature because they take energy from their adherents and establish power over them. A pendulum doesn't care about the individual fates of its adherents. It only has one goal, to maintain a constant flow of energy from its adherents, regardless of whether it benefits or harms the individuals. If a person is under the influence of a pendulum, he has to live his life in accordance with the pendulum's laws. Otherwise, it will chew him up and spit him out. Being under the influence of a destructive pendulum can easily ruin your life. To break free from a pendulum and not suffer any losses as a result is usually very difficult to do. If a person is lucky, he finds his place in the system where he feels like a fish in the water. Being an adherent, he gives his energy to the pendulum and the pendulum in return provides him with a suitable environment. But as soon as he starts breaking the rules of a given structure, the frequency of his thought energy is no longer in sync with the resonant frequency of the pendulum. And because the pendulum is no longer getting energy from the adherents, it throws him out and can even destroy him. If a person is brought to a place far away from his most favorable tracks, then life in the structure of an alien pendulum turns into a living hell or a depressing existence. Such a pendulum is nothing but destructive to the adherent who falls under its influence and loses his freedom. He has to live by the laws forced upon him and serve as a cog in a huge machine whether he likes it or not. At the same time, an individual can be under the patronage of a pendulum and achieve outstanding results. Napoleon, Hitler, and Stalin, to name a few, were all favorites of destructive pendulums. Nevertheless, the pendulum doesn't care about the personal welfare of its adherents. It uses them solely for its purposes. When Napoleon was asked if he had ever been truly happy, he was able to number only a few days out of his entire life. Pendulums use refined methods to attract new adherents that fly to them like moths to a flame. How often do people, seduced by a pendulum's advertising tricks, wander away from their happiness that's right in front of them all the time. People join the army and perish. They enroll in educational institutions and in vain master professions that are not really theirs. They find jobs that feel alien but are supposedly prestigious. They find themselves swamped with problems. They bring strangers into their lives and end up suffering. In short, a pendulum's activity often leads to the destruction of the destinies of its adherents, all the while hiding its true motives and seeming to be virtuous. The most dangerous thing for a person who falls under the influence of a destructive pendulum is that the pendulum takes its victim away from life tracks where he would find true happiness. Here are some chief characteristics of a pendulum. A pendulum feeds on the energy of its adherents and thereby amplifies its swinging. A pendulum tries to attract as many supporters as possible so that it can receive as much energy as possible. A pendulum sets its group of adherents against all other groups. Look at us, we are better than they are. A pendulum aggressively blames those who don't want to become its adherents and tries to win them over, neutralize them, or remove them altogether. A pendulum puts on attractive masks, camouflages itself up with noble aims, and plays on people's emotions to justify its actions and win over as many adherents as possible. Imagine an athletic stadium where a dramatic game of soccer is taking place. The tension is building, fans are raging, and suddenly one player makes a mistake that causes his team to lose the game. A storm of anger descends from the fans upon the player. They're ready to tear him apart. Can you imagine what a huge mass of negative energy lands on this unfortunate player? You'd think that having suffered such a monstrous blow, he would die right there on the spot. But that doesn't happen. Instead, he's alive and healthy, although crushed by feelings of guilt. Then where did all the negative energy go? Well, the pendulum harvested it. If it had not done so, the person at whom the crowd aimed its anger would have died. It's hard to know whether the pendulum is an animated being or simply a form of energy. In either case, it's not important to transurfing. The important thing is being able to recognize a pendulum 
and to avoid participating in its games. It is easy to recognize a destructive pendulum because it has one defining feature. It is always competing with other energy structures like itself, fighting for control over people. A pendulum has one goal, to capture as many adherents as possible and to get as much energy as possible. The more aggressive a pendulum acts in its fight for adherence, the more destructive it is to the fates of the individual. You might object that there are, after all, charitable organizations, societies for preservation, and so on. What is so destructive about them? The fact is that no matter how you view them, they feed on your energy and do not care about individual happiness or welfare, which is destructive for you personally. They ask you to be merciful to others while they remain indifferent to your welfare. If this is okay with you and you feel happy doing charity work, for example, then this might be your calling and you have found your pendulum. But you have to be honest with yourself. Are you just wearing the mask of a charitable giver? Are you actually donating your energy and money for the welfare of others and doing it with all your hearts? Or are you just putting on a charity show to seem like a better person? Destructive pendulums have taught people not to choose their own destiny. After all, if a person was truly free in his choice, he would be independent. Then he wouldn't be attracted to pendulums and wouldn't become one of their adherents. Our mind is so used to the idea that our fate is unavoidable that it makes it hard for us to believe that we can choose the fate we would like to have. Of course, it is advantageous for pendulums to keep their adherents under control. So they come up with all sorts of ways to manipulate adherents. If we make a movement or a cult or a school out of transurfing, it would also become a pendulum. Pendulums vary in their degree of destructiveness, but transurfing, even in a worst case scenario, would be much less destructive than most. This is because it does not serve an external or general goal, but rather exists exclusively for the good of each individual. This kind of pendulum is unusual, like an individualist society with people who focus exclusively on their own individual destinies. The Battle of Pendulums Another feature of a destructive pendulum is that it aggressively seeks to destroy other pendulums so that it can drag people over to its side. To accomplish this, the pendulum will try to set its adherence against adherence of other pendulums. We are good, while they are not like us. They are bad. People who are drawn into this battle lose their way and start following false goals that they mistakenly believe to be their own. An extreme example of the battle for adherence is war. To convince its adherents to go to war, one pendulum puts forward arguments that correspond to the historical era. The most primitive method in history was simply to command citizens to forcefully take back what was rightfully theirs. As societies became more civilized, arguments became more refined. One nation declares itself the most progressive and developed, while others are declared backwards. A noble aim is then to bring these undeveloped people to a higher level, and if they object, we must apply force. It does not matter what kind of slogans are used to justify wars and revolutions. Their purpose is always the same, to serve the battle of pendulums for adherence. These battles can take different forms, but their sole purpose is to get as many adherents as possible. New energy is vital for a pendulum. Without it, the pendulum will cease to grow and eventually cease to exist. Other forms of battle may be less aggressive, but equally severe. For example, the struggle for market domination, the rivalry of political parties, economic competition, all forms of marketing, advertising campaigns, ideological propaganda, and so on. The living environment is made out of pendulums. There is competition everywhere on all levels, starting with political and governmental disputes and ending with competition between clubs and among individuals. The new, the unusual, the incomprehensible always paves its way with difficulty. Why is that? Is it simply because new concepts take time to settle in your head? 
No, the main reason is that old pendulums would be at a loss if a new pendulum and another rival enters the stage and starts dragging people towards it. For instance, internal combustion engines contribute significantly to pollution and could have been replaced a long time ago. After all, many alternative and pollution-free engines have been developed over the years. However, this would be a threat to the existing pendulums of oil corporations, which are still very strong. They won't allow some inventor to take them off the stage. It comes down to these monstrous pendulums, which represent large oil corporations literally buying up patents of alternative engines only to keep them secret. Meanwhile, they try to convince the world that these new inventions are not very efficient. When building their structure on the material plane, pendulums strengthen their position with financial means, buildings, equipment, and of course, with human resources. At the top of these human pyramids, pendulums place their favorites. These are leaders of all ranks and functions, anyone from junior managers to heads of government. These leaders do not have to possess any special qualities. Usually, they just have a combination of traits that fit perfectly in the pendulum structure. The chosen favorite may believe that he has achieved great things in life only because of these traits and only because the self-organizing structure of the pendulum promotes its favorites. And when a leader's traits no longer correspond to the needs of the system, the pendulum removes him with no regard for his welfare. The battle of pendulums is also destructive because its adherents believe they are serving a higher goal that they sincerely believe in. Such personal beliefs are usually in the tight grip of a pendulum. As soon as a person tunes into the pendulum's frequency, an interaction takes place on an energy level between him and the pendulum. The frequency of his thought energy is fixed and then maintained by the pendulum's energy. The person is now trapped in a feedback loop. He transmits thought energy along with the pendulum's frequency, and the pendulum in turn grants him a little bit of energy to maintain its influence over him. These interactions between individuals and pendulums can be seen in everyday life on the level of material realization. For example, the pendulum of a political party starts an election campaign catches on with an adherent and feeds him a little energy in the form of good feelings such as appreciation, satisfaction, dignity, and importance. The adherent believes that he has this situation under control and is making his own choices. But in truth, he was chosen by the pendulum that now has control over him. On the surface, it seems otherwise. The adherent believes he is doing what he wants to do. Meanwhile, the will of the pendulum has been invisibly and artificially forced upon him. The adherent is thus placed in the pendulum's information field where he spends time with others like himself, discussing hot topics and so on. In this way, the adherent establishes energy connections with the pendulum and fixes his own energy within its structure. Eventually, the adherent may realize that the pendulum's activity does not live up to his expectations, so he starts to resent it or doubt it, and his frequency slips out of the pendulum's grip. The tightness of the pendulum's grip depends on how powerful the pendulum is. In some cases, the pendulum will simply allow its adherent to leave. In other cases, the heretic will be deprived of his freedom or even his life. Puppet Strings So how do pendulums force their adherents to give up their energy? Powerful pendulums can, for example, force adherents to act according to specific rules. But how do weaker pendulums do this? When one person doesn't have the power to force another person to do something, he presents a valid argument and tries to persuade the other person by promising a desirable outcome. Pendulums also use these methods sometimes, but they have a weapon that is much more powerful because pendulums are energy-based information structures. For a person to give away his energy to a pendulum, his thought energy must be of the same frequency as the pendulum's resonant frequency. For this to happen, it's not necessary for a person to consciously direct his thoughts towards the pendulum. 
It can also happen subconsciously in the form of opposing a pendulum. And in fact, pendulums get energy not only from their adherents, but from their most adamant opponents. Imagine a group of elderly people sitting on a park bench, complaining and criticizing their government. They are not adherents of the government's pendulum because they hate the government for many reasons. But they are cursing the government, saying how incompetent, corrupt, cynical, and stupid it is, and in doing so, they are directing a lot of thought energy at the frequency of this pendulum. The pendulum does not care from which side you push it to make it swing. Both positive and negative energy will do as long as the frequency of a person's thought energy resonates with the pendulum's frequency. The methods of pendulums have become more refined with the development of mass media. Have you noticed how the media mention mostly negative things? And how people become addicted to this? That's because it gives rise to strong emotions like agitation, fear, irritation, anger, and envy. It is the media's job to attract your attention. And mass media, being pendulums themselves, serve pendulums that are even more powerful. On the surface, it looks like they are providing free access to information. But the real purpose is quite different. To tune in as many people as possible to the frequencies of specific pendulums. One of a pendulum's favorite ways of getting access to your energy is to throw you off balance. If you are off balance, you begin to swing on the frequency of the pendulum. For example, prices go up and you don't like it, so you react in a negative way. You feel annoyed and you complain and talk about it with your friends, which is a normal reaction. But this is exactly what the pendulum wants because you are now radiating negative energy at the pendulum's frequency. The pendulum harvests this energy, which makes the pendulum swing higher, resulting in the situation of prices getting increasingly worse. At this point, the pendulum is controlling you like a puppeteer controls its puppet. And the most effective string to pull is your fear, which is the most ancient and strongest feeling there is. It does not matter what you are afraid of. As long as your fear is connected to an aspect of the pendulum, the pendulum will get your energy. Anxiety and nervousness are somewhat weaker threads, but they are still strong enough to pull you. All these feelings align thought energy radiations with a pendulum's frequency. Just think how hard it is when something is bothering you for you to take your mind off of it and focus on something else. Feeling guilty is another way for a pendulum to pull energy out of you. Feelings of guilt are forced on us since childhood. It's a convenient method of manipulation. If you're guilty, then you have to do as I tell you. It is unpleasant to live with guilt and therefore people try to get rid of these feelings. But how? You redeem your fault either by accepting your punishment or by working off your debt. Both alternatives imply submission, obedience, and a specific way of thinking. The call of duty is a particular form of guilt. To have a duty means you are obligated to do something. As a result, the guilty walk around with their heads hanging, literally bringing pendulums their energy on a plate. Inducing feelings of guilt by suggestion is another favorite weapon of manipulators. Pendulums also pull energy through various psychological complexes. For example, the inferiority complex. I am not attractive. I don't have any abilities or talents. I am not particularly bright or clever. I don't know how to communicate with people or how to be around them. I'm not worthy, etc. Or the guilt complex. I'm guilty of something. Everyone is judging me and I have to bear my cross. Or the warrior complex. I have to be cool. I declare war on myself and on everybody else. I will fight for my place under the sun. I will take what is mine by force. Or the truth lover complex. I will show that I am right and everyone else is wrong, whatever it takes. These and other complexes, such as justice, pride, vanity, honor, love, hate, greed, and generosity are personal keys to the energy of individuals. 
A pendulum, by hitting on these vulnerable spots, zealously pumps energy out of people. As a rule, people have standard ways of reacting to negative sources of irritation. Negative news provokes discontents. Alarming news provokes a reaction of worry or fear. Having been offended provokes dislike. In a similar way, habits function as a switch that sets reactions in motion. For example, the habit of getting irritated or worrying with little cause is the same as reacting to a provocation or negative event. You can even know that negative thoughts and actions don't lead to anything good, but you still make the same mistakes out of habit. Habits create problems and forces to act inefficiently, yet they are difficult to get rid of. Habits are illusions of comfort. We trust them because they are familiar. Anything new causes worry and fear. The old and familiar has already proven to work, like an old armchair you sit in to relax after work. Maybe a new one would be better, but the old one is more comfortable. Comfort is characterized by such concepts as convenience, trust, positive experience, and predictability. New things possess these qualities to a lesser degree. Therefore, it takes a lot of time for a new habit to turn into an old one. The question, of course, is, can you escape from the influence of pendulums? Sometimes you confront the pendulum that has enslaved you and openly oppose it. But in most battles between man and pendulum, the man always suffers a defeat. That's because a pendulum can only be defeated by other pendulums. One man can't do anything. If a man is no longer obeying the pendulum and he gets into a fight with it, he will only lose energy. In the best case, he will be thrown out of the system. In the worst case, he will be crushed. When an adherent has the guts to break the rules set by the pendulum, he is proclaimed an outlaw. On the surface, he is convicted or condemned for his actions. In reality, though, it is not the man's actions that make him guilty but the fact that he has slipped out of the control of and is no longer a source of energy for the pendulum. But the power of the pendulum can return quickly in the form of guilt and remorse because the man who accepts feelings of guilt shows that he is ready to submit himself even more fully to the pendulum's rules. Of course, the pendulum doesn't care about remorse. All it wants is to regain control over you. That is all that matters. It imposes its moral principles and says that because you have shown remorse, you are not such an evil person after all. And it appears to be much nicer to you, but only because you have again given it the opportunity to control you. You always get what you don't want. Every person is from time to time confronted with negative information or undesirable events. In all these cases, however, it is just a provocation of pendulums. A man doesn't want unpleasant things in his life, but he always reacts in one of two ways. If the information doesn't affect him very much, he doesn't pay much attention to it and soon forgets about it. But if the provocation irritates or frightens him, especially in an area that feels personal to him, then his thought energy gets captured by the pendulum. He is caught in the pendulum's noose and tuned to the frequency of the pendulum's resonance. You probably know what happens next. The man starts feeling angry, outraged, worried, and afraid, and he vigorously expresses his dissatisfaction. In doing so, he actively radiates the energy of the frequency of the pendulum. The pendulum does not harvest all of the energy. Some of it goes to other sectors in the space of variations. In other words, the parameters of the man's thought energy are such that he is transported to a sector in the space of variations where everything he wants to avoid exists in abundance. This is because if a man's thought energy is fixed on a certain frequency, he gets transported to the corresponding life track. Let's say you turn a deaf ear to information about catastrophes and natural disasters. After all, if you are not affected by them, why the unnecessary stress? Usually in this case, a natural disaster will happen somewhere else, and you are personally on a life track where you are not a victim of the disaster, just an observer. 
the track where you would be a victim is left behind. And the opposite is also true. If you allow information about disasters and unfortunate events to affect you, you will moan and talk about it with your friends. In that case, it is very likely that you will soon be transferred to a life track where you will be a victim of a disaster yourself. It turns out that the stronger your desire to avoid something is, the greater are the odds that you will get it. Actively fighting against what you do not want is the same as doing your best to make that very thing a part of your life. You don't even have to do anything special to transport yourself to the undesirable life tracks. It is enough to think negative thoughts and add emotion to them. For example, you don't want bad weather, so you think about how you don't like the rain. Noisy neighbors are bothering you and you're constantly fighting with them or you quietly despise them in your heart. You are afraid of something and this makes you anxious. You're sick and tired of your job, so you savor the feeling of hatred towards your job. Things you actively don't want, that you are afraid of, that you hate or despise will follow you everywhere. There are, of course, other things you would like to avoid, but they don't bother you as much at the moment. In that case, those things won't crawl into your life. But as soon as you allow yourself to feel hatred and to cherish negative feelings, the unwanted will materialize in your life. The only way to remove the unwanted from your life is to free yourself from the influence of the pendulum that has trapped your thought energy. You have to learn to resist its provocations escape its grip, and not be a part of this game. The fall through of a pendulum. Fighting a pendulum is useless. Fighting it means feeding it your energy, whereas your goal is to let the pendulum fall through. The first and most important condition for this is refusal to fight with the pendulum. The more you try to fight off the annoying things in your life, the more actively they pursue you. You could forever keep saying, just leave me in peace. Everyone leave me alone. You think you are defending yourself against annoying pendulums, but you are actually feeding them your energy and they stick to you even more. You don't have the right to condemn or change anything in this world. You have to accept everything as you would accept the artwork at an exhibition, whether you like it or not. There may be pictures at the exhibition that do not appeal to you. However, it never occurs to you to demand that they be taken away. Once you've recognized the right of the pendulum to exist, you have the right to leave it alone, to resist falling under its influence. But the main thing is to avoid getting into a fight with it. Don't blame it. Don't get angry with it. Don't lose your temper, because all this means you are participating in the pendulum's game. Do the exact opposite. Quietly accept the pendulum as something given, as an unavoidable evil, and then leave. If you show aversion, you are giving your energy to the pendulum. Before exploring what it means to choose, you have to learn to say no. People in general have a vague idea of what they want, but everyone knows what they don't want. Striving to free themselves from undesirable things or events, many people act in a way that they get the opposite. To say no, it's necessary to accept. The word accept in this context does not mean that you should embrace it and make it a part of yourself, but rather that you should admit to yourself that everyone has the right to exist and then pass by indifferently. To accept and let go means to let things pass through you and wave goodbye to them as they leave. If you are pestered by thoughts about things you dislike, those very things will find their way into your life. Imagine that someone doesn't like apples. He simply hates them, they make him sick. This person could just ignore them, but he cannot come to terms with the thought that there are such disgusting things as apples in his world. They irritate him every time he lays eyes on them, and he actively talks about his aversion. This is what happens on the material plane. However, on the energy plane, the man is greedily pouncing on the apples, stuffing his mouth with them, chewing noisily, and trying to scream how much he hates them. He is stuffing his pockets full of apples, he is choking on them, and again starts complaining about how sick he is of them. 
It does not occur to him that he can simply throw the apples out of his life if he doesn't want them. Whether you love or hate something is irrelevant. The main thing is that if your thoughts are preoccupied with the object of your feelings, the energy of your thoughts will fix on a certain frequency and you will be captured by a pendulum and transported to a corresponding life track where the loved or hated object exists in abundance. If you don't want to have a certain thing in your life, then stop thinking about it. Pass this particular thing by indifferently and it will disappear from your life. To throw something out of your life does not mean you should avoid it, but simply ignore it. To avoid something means to allow it into your life and then struggle to free yourself from it. To ignore something means simply not to react to it in any way and consequently not have it in your life. It may seem that placing an iron curtain between you and the world will protect you from undesirable pendulums, but this is an illusion. When you were in an iron shell, you were telling yourself, I am a blank wall. I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. I don't know anything. And I don't speak to anyone. There is no access to me. To maintain such a protective field, you have to spend a lot of energy. A person who intentionally tries to shut himself off from the world is constantly on edge. Thinking he is protecting himself from a pendulum, the energy of his protective field is actually tuned into that frequency. And this is exactly what the pendulum wants. It does not care whether you give it your energy with pleasure or with anger, as long as you give it. What then can serve as protection against a pendulum? Emptiness. If I am empty, no pendulum can catch on to me. I am not joining the pendulum's game, but I am not trying to defend myself against it either. I simply ignore it. The energy of the pendulum flies past me without touching me and disappears into space. The pendulum's game doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me. In relation to the pendulum, I am empty. The pendulum's main objective is to attract as many adherents as possible to get their energy. If you ignore a pendulum, it will leave you alone and switch over to other people. This is because the pendulum can only affect someone who accepts its game. In other words, someone who starts radiating thought energy on its frequency. Take a simple example. A barking dog is chasing you. If you turn around to face it, the dog will bark even louder. If you take the dog seriously and start to wrangle with it, it will keep running after you. After all, it is the dog's aim to find someone to have a row with. But if you simply ignore the dog, it will look for another object. And notice that it never occurs to the dog to feel insulted because you don't pay attention to it. The dog is too absorbed with its goal of getting energy to think about something else. Substitute the dog with a troublemaker or bully and it works the same way. If someone is annoying you and you cannot quiet him, simply refrain from reacting to his provocations. Ignore him. He won't leave you alone until you stop giving him your energy. You can give energy directly to him by getting into a fight with him or indirectly by silently hating him. To stop giving away your energy means to stop thinking at all about the troublemaker. Just throw him out of your head. Simply tell yourself, oh, never mind him and he will be gone from your life. Of course, you can't always ignore a pendulum. For example, the boss calls you out. Refusing or trying to defend yourself both mean a loss of energy because in both situations, you would be fighting the pendulum. Instead, you can act as though you were taking part in the pendulum's game. But the main thing is to keep in mind that you were only pretending to play the pendulum's game. Imagine a burly fellow raising his sledgehammer at you and striking a blow. You have nothing against it, you are not defending yourself, and you are not attacking him. In this moment, you simply step aside and the big fellow, along with his sledgehammer, hits an empty spot. This means that the pendulum can't catch on to you and so it falls through empty space. The same principle lies at the heart of Aikido, a type of martial art. This is what happens in Aikido. The attacker is taken by the arm and brought along with the defender, as if the defender is casually seeing him off. 
The attacker is released without any force from the defender and is sent flying in the same direction in which he was aiming in the first place. The secret is that the defender has nothing against the attack. He agrees with the attacker's way, walks together with him for a while, and then lets go of him. The energy of the attacker falls into empty space because the defender is empty and there is nothing to catch on to. So how does this apply to pendulums? The idea is that you respond to the pendulum's first attack with agreement, then diplomatically step aside or unobtrusively direct the pendulum's movement where you want it. For example, your eager boss wants to load you with work and demand that you do it exactly the way he wants it to be done. You know that it needs to be done differently, or you believe this task is not your responsibility in the first place. If you start objecting, arguing, and defending yourself, your boss will just demand more obedience. After all, he has made a decision and you're defying him. So instead, do the opposite. Listen carefully to what your boss says, agree with him, let the pendulum exhaust its first impulse. Then gently start discussing the details of the job with him. At this moment, you have accepted the energy of your boss and are radiating at his frequency. His impulse has not met opposition and will therefore subside for the time being. Don't tell him you know better how this job should be done. Don't say no to the job. Don't argue with him. Just ask his advice. By doing this, you swing along with the pendulum, but you do it consciously, not participating in its game, but rather observing it from the outside. Meanwhile, the pendulum swings completely absorbed with the game. But the energy previously directed at you turns away from you and toward another solution or toward someone else who will do the job. For you personally, the pendulum falls through. Extinguishing a pendulum. There may also be situations where you cannot make a pendulum fall through by ignoring it or escaping it. I have a friend who is a good-hearted guy, but also incredibly strong. One night we were on a tram where a group of bullies were looking for trouble, a destructive pendulum. They were feeding each other with negative energy, convinced they were above the law. For their energy to multiply, they needed to bother other people who would react to their provocations and thus give them energy. This angry bunch started bothering my friend, probably because the kind and peaceful expression on his face suggested he wouldn't be too much trouble. They tried in every way to pick a fight with him insulting and taunting him, but he remained silent and didn't react to any of the provocations. In other words, he tried to let the pendulum fall through. Nor did I interfere because I knew that he had nothing to fear, that the bullies were out on a limb dealing with him. Finally, my friend couldn't stand it any longer, so he got up and headed for the exit where the most impudent bully blocked his way. My friend, who was now cornered, grabbed the bully by the scruff of the neck and delivered a hideous blow to his head. The victim's face was instantly a bloody mess. The remaining bullies were dumbfounded with amazement and fear. My friend turned and grabbed the next one, but that one started mumbling with a trembling voice, Th -th That's enough, man. Enough. Don't. The energy of the pendulum was instantly extinguished, and its adherents, still taken aback, slowly moved away and finally tumbled out of the tram. Lucky are those who can stand up for themselves, but if you are not one of them, what then? If you have nowhere to run, then you can stop a pendulum by doing something out of the ordinary, something that no one expects. For example, a pack of fearless street gang members once cornered a fellow and were about to beat him up. So he approached the leader of the gang, stared at him with an insane look in his eyes and said, So what should I break, your nose or your jaw? A question like that was clearly out of context, and it did not fit the script, and the gang leader was briefly taken aback. Then the fellow cried out with unhealthy enthusiasm, Or maybe I'll just tear your ear off, and grabbed him by the ear with his hand. The leader of the gang gave out an agonizing cry. The show of bravura that the gang was used to putting on was now ruined. 
The gang leader was not even thinking about beating anyone up. Only one thought tormented him. How to free his ear from the tight grip of this madman. The gang let the guy go, thinking he was a nutcase, and the guy escaped harm. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you cannot escape a pendulum, do something surprising, something unpredictable. The pendulum will be extinguished. The thing is, as long as you act according to a given scenario, you accept the pendulum's game and give away your energy on that frequency. But if your frequency is different from that of a pendulum, you and the pendulum will be in dissonance and you'll throw it off rhythm. At the same time, you shouldn't be asking for trouble if you were dealing with a pendulum that has nothing to lose. If you were attacked by someone who was trying to rob you, it's better to give him money right away. Some people carry a $10 bill for occasions such as this. If a robber is a drug addict or mentally ill, he could easily end your life, even if you are a master of the martial arts. Therefore, you are better off not dealing with people like that at all. Having a sense of humor and a creative imagination can also be helpful in extinguishing a pendulum. Turn your irritation into a game. For example, you are annoyed with a massive amount of people on the streets or on the bus, and everyone is in a hurry, making it difficult for you to make your way. So you imagine that you are at a bird bazaar in Antarctica. All these people around you are actually penguins, waddling, fussing, and puttering in a funny way. And who would you be? You are a penguin as well. By transforming your point of view this way, the people around you start to evoke your curiosity and compassion, rather than annoyance. Of course, it's hard to control yourself when you are mad with rage. In those moments, the hardest thing is to remember that it is just a pendulum trying to draw energy from you. But you have to find a way not to give in to its provocations. The pendulum is like a vampire that uses its own form of anesthesia, which is your habit of reacting negatively to a nuisance. If you make it your aim to develop the habit of remembering about pendulums, soon you will develop immunity against their provocations. Try to notice that when you react to annoying situations with irritation, dissatisfaction, and other negative emotions, the situation instantly gets worse and you are in for more trouble. This is how a pendulum swings higher and higher, and you are the one pushing it. So do the opposite. Either don't react at all or react in an inappropriate way. For example, you can meet annoyances with false enthusiasm or even with moronic delight. This is how you extinguish a pendulum. You'll see that the pendulum will not continue its provocations. Remember that your habit of reacting negatively to annoying situations is the lever that sets a pendulum's capture mechanism in motion so that the pendulum can get to your thought energy. Such a habit will fade away if you learn to deliberately make the following substitutions. Fear, competence, gloom, enthusiasm, resentment, indifference, irritation, joy. It might seem ridiculous, but if you play the game this way, the pendulum will not stand a chance. It only seems ridiculous because pendulums have trained us to play games that are of benefit only to them. Now try forcing the pendulum to play your game. You will enjoy the game and discover to your great surprise what a powerful technique it is. The working principle is this. When you radiate thought energy at a frequency different from the resonance frequency, you get in dissonance with the pendulum. Thus, for you personally, the pendulum is extinguished and leaves you in peace. There is another interesting method of gently extinguishing a pendulum. If someone is bothering you or making a problem for you, try to determine what that person needs. Then imagine this person having what he needs. It could be health, confidence, or peace of mind. If you think about it, these are the three main things we all need to feel satisfaction. So think, what does this person really need right now? Suppose your boss shouts at you. Maybe he's tired or is having problems at home. He needs some peace of mind. Imagine him relaxing in an armchair in front of the TV or by a fireplace or fishing on the river or having a beer with his friends. Do you know what he likes to do? 
Perhaps his superiors have been pressing him and he is afraid of taking on more responsibility. Then he needs some confidence. Imagine him skiing like a pro, driving in a sports car, or being at a party where he is the center of attention. Or perhaps he is ill and in pain. Then imagine him being happy and healthy, swimming in the ocean, riding a bicycle, playing football. Of course, it's better to imagine him doing what he likes to do. But you don't have to guess, don't worry. It's quite enough to imagine him in a situation where he is satisfied. Whether it is your boss suddenly throwing problems at you, or a robber, or anyone else that means trouble, learn to distract yourself from whatever trouble they are bringing. From the beginning, refrain from putting your head into the noose of their frequency. Then imagine them getting exactly what they want. What does a robber want? To eat? To drink? To get high? Visualize an image where this person gets his satisfaction. If you're successful, you can consider your troubles gone. Here's why. The pendulum didn't just start swinging on its own. Something threw it off of balance and it is looking for something that will restore its balance. And suddenly, the energy of your thoughts on a certain frequency restores that balance. When this happens, the pendulum instantly substitutes its aggression with goodwill. You may find this hard to believe, but it's true. This technique extinguishes the pendulum. A pendulum man approaches you with a problem and you solve the problem, not in an obvious way, but on the energy plane. You give the pendulum your energy, but only a tiny piece in comparison to what you could have lost. You've also done a good deed. You've helped someone in need. The interesting thing is that this person will later have a different, friendlier attitude towards you. He will never be able to guess why he is feeling comfortable in your company. Let that be your secret. This technique can be successfully used in situations when you need to get something from someone who is busy with his own problems and isn't keen on giving you whatever it is you want. You need a signature from the local official? First, feed him a little of your nice visualization and he'll do anything for you. One last thing. Where do you think the energy of an extinguished pendulum goes? It is actually transported back to you. Having overcome your problem, you get stronger. And the next time something like this happens, it will be easier for you to find the solution to the problem. But if you try to fight the problem, you will only give your energy to the pendulum that created the problem in the first place. These two techniques, making a pendulum fall through or extinguishing it, are well known by psychologists and psychiatrists, so they are nothing new. What is new is your understanding of how to use them. Simple Solutions to Complicated Problems If you were able to extinguish a pendulum or make it fall through, you can solve all kinds of problems. A complicated life situation, a conflict, an unfavorable circumstance, a difficulty, or simply a task. There are simple solutions to all problems. The key is always somewhere on the surface. The question is how to spot it. And the thing to be aware of is that the pendulum which created the problem will get in the way of you seeing the solution. The goal of a destructive pendulum is to get energy from you. To accomplish this, it has to fix the frequency of your radiating thoughts on the problem. This is easy if you are convinced that the problem is difficult. If you accept these rules of the game, the pendulum takes you by the hand and leads you into its labyrinth. Only later do you realize that the answer was right there in front of you the whole time. If you scare a person, worry him, confuse him, or play on his fears, saying how difficult the problem is, then he will easily agree to things being complicated and he'll be hooked. But you don't have to scare people to achieve the same effect. Public opinion is already such that many problems are considered difficult and without solutions. Throughout life, each of us is confronted with difficulties of some kind, especially new and unfamiliar things. As a result, we have a strong habit of facing problems with anxiety, even with reverential fear. In addition, we always weigh our abilities to handle a problem on the scales of doubts. As a result, our tendency to face problems with fear turns into a puppet string. 
A pendulum fixes the radiation of your thought energy on a certain frequency and is busy sucking the energy while you are preoccupied with the problem. You would think that fixing the frequency on the subject would help your concentration, but instead it interferes with it and prevents you from solving the problem. This is because the pendulum fixes your thoughts on a narrow sector in the information field, while the solution may lie outside this sector. You think and act within these narrow limits without seeing the bigger picture. Unusual and intuitive solutions appear to you only when you free yourself from the pendulum and think in another direction. The whole secret of being a genius is being free from the influence of pendulums. While pendulums capture ordinary people's frequencies of thoughts, the frequency of geniuses' thoughts can reorganize themselves independently and enter unexplored areas of the information field. So, how should you avoid getting caught in a pendulum's noose? By not getting absorbed in the problem and not allowing the pendulum to ensnare you in its game. Rent yourself out. That is, act as you normally would in such situations, not as a participant in the game, but as an external observer. Look at the situation as if it doesn't concern you at all. Remember that pendulums want to take you by the hand and lead you into their labyrinth. Don't let the problem scare you, grab hold of you, worry or confuse you. Remember that there is a simple solution to any problem. Do not accept the interpretation of difficult that is being imposed on you by the pendulum. If you are confronted by a problem or a tricky situation, catch your attitude towards it. The problem may give rise to confusion, fear, resentment, despair, and so on. You then need to change your usual attitude to the opposite, and the problem will either disappear by itself or you will quickly find a solution to it. In spite of your stereotypes and habits, see problems not as obstacles you have to overcome, but as part of the road you have to walk on. Don't leave any space in yourself for problems. Be empty to problems. If you have to solve a problem that requires thinking, don't rush into logical reasoning. Your subconscious is directly linked to the field of information. The solution to any possible problem is already there. Therefore, first relax, then cast away any fear or anxiety that you may have about the solution. Let go of yourself, stop the train of thoughts, and try to contemplate the emptiness. It is likely that the solution will come to you instantly, and it will probably be a simple one. If that doesn't work, don't get upset and turn on your thinking device. It will work next time. This exercise is useful for developing the ability to access intuitive knowledge. The only important thing is to make it your habit. The Suspended State When you free yourself from the influence of pendulums, you acquire freedom. Previous conflicts diminish, annoying concerns recede, arguments occur less often, anxiety and worry disappear. The storm slowly quiets down. But this freedom, without a goal, is a suspended state. As you make pendulums fall through and extinguish them, you run the risk of finding yourself in a vacuum. Events that were happening to you now seem to be happening somewhere else. To the people around you, you are no longer of the same importance as you used to be, and they pay less and less attention to you. You have fewer and fewer concerns, but you have no desires either. The pressure from the external world weakens, but that doesn't bring you any advantage. You have fewer problems, but no new achievements. What is happening here? The entire world of man is built on pendulums. Therefore, if you isolate yourself from pendulums completely, you find yourself in a desert where the suspended state is not much better than being dependent on the pendulum. For example, children who have everything pine away because there's nothing more to want. They suffer and pester everyone around them with their whining. Humankind is made in such a way that we always need something to strive for. Although your freedom is being free from the pendulums of others, there are pendulums that are of use to you personally. These are your pendulums. 
And as you move away from the tracks of life that have made you unhappy, you need to choose life tracks where true success and happiness await you. Pendulums are not an absolute evil if you are aware of the situation and of your actions. The issue is how not to put yourself under the controlled influence of pendulums and how to consciously use them for your purposes. Because in the end, it is by means of pendulums that you can turn your dreams into reality, which is what transurfing is about. Summary. A pendulum is created by the energy of people who are thinking in the same direction. A pendulum is an energy-based information structure. A pendulum fixes thought energy of an adherent onto its own frequency. A battle for adherence is going on between pendulums. A destructive pendulum forces goals onto its adherence. A pendulum plays on people's feelings, drawing them into its net. If you actively do not want something, it will be in your life. To free yourself from a pendulum means to throw it out of your life. To throw something out of your life means not to avoid it, but to ignore it. To stop a pendulum, it's necessary to violate the script of the game. In personal conflicts, positive visualization can gently extinguish a pendulum. The energy of an extinguished pendulum is transferred to you. Problems are solved by the fall through or extinguishing of pendulums that created the problems in the first place. To solve problems, rent yourself out. To avoid a suspended state, you must find your own pendulums. You must develop the habit of remembering all of this. Chapter 3. The Wave of Success The Antipode of a Pendulum So are there any pendulums that can be considered constructive? The answer is no. More accurately, a pendulum can be constructive only to itself, never to you, because the only goal of any pendulum is to get energy from its adherence. If it can't get any energy, it will stop. Let's look at a simple example. It's hard to imagine that a beach volleyball club could ruin your life. However, the pendulum of the volleyball club is also feeding on energy from its adherents, and if they get bored with beach volleyball, the club will die. But this is nothing compared to being a gang member where your freedom or even your life can be taken away. You might think, if I go to a fitness club where I am focusing only on myself, how am I giving away energy to the pendulum? It doesn't matter if you are focused just on yourself or not, you are still required to follow certain rules in the club. You can do whatever you want at home, but at the fitness club, all members act the same way by following the rules established by that system, and thus they collectively give energy to the pendulum. If all members of the club run away, the pendulum no longer receives any energy and it stops. You might also be thinking, are there any energy structures that don't need my energy? Actually, there are. One of them is the wave of success, or a coincidence that is fortunate for you personally. Each person has his own waves of success. It is often the case that you have a little luck, and then comes an entire wave of other pleasant and unexpected events. As if you're having a run of good luck in your life. Waves such as this don't appear every day. Only if you were pleasantly surprised and got into a good mood the first time. The wheel of fortune and the bluebird of happiness are not just abstract metaphors. A wave of success is basically an accumulation of life tracks. Everything can be found in the space of variations, including these veins of gold. If you found the outer line of such a gold vein and caught some luck, you can automatically glide on to other lines of accumulated fortune, where new lucky circumstances await you. But if, after your first success, bad luck rears its ugly head again, it means a destructive pendulum has led you away from the gold vein. 
A wave of success brings happiness without taking your energy. It can be compared to an ocean wave that carries an exhausted swimmer to shore. A wave of success transfers you to your happy life tracks. The wave, just like a pendulum, doesn't care about your fate, but it doesn't need your energy either. If you want to, get on the wave and swim with it. If you don't want to, the wave will pass you by without feeling sorry for you. A wave of success is a temporary structure because it doesn't feed on the energy of others. Therefore, it eventually fades out like ocean waves that crash on shore. A wave of success can appear, for example, in the form of good news. It carries information from other life tracks. These echoes are interpreted on the current life track as good news. Your task is to grab on to this fine thread and pull yourself up to the life track where the good news came from. That life track will now not only have good news for you, but fortunate circumstances as well. It may seem that the wave of success comes and goes. In fact, this wave doesn't move at all. It doesn't gather any energy, and it doesn't get weaker. The term wave just makes it easier to understand. But the wave of success is static in the space of variations, as an accumulation of favorable tracks. You are the one moving from one life track to another. So to you, this vein appears as a wave because you grab it by letting it into your life, or you move farther from it, carried away by pendulums. Because the wave is not interested in you personally, you can easily miss it, in which case it will pass you by and not come back. This has given rise to the belief that the bluebird of happiness is difficult to catch. In reality, you don't have to make any effort to surf this wave, it's only a matter of choice. If you welcome the wave into your life, it will be with you. If you give in to the influence of destructive pendulums and get imbued with their negative energy, you move away from the wave of success. The Boomerang Most people have thoughts running around constantly in their head. And if the thinking process is not controlled, negative thoughts and worries prevail. The things we are most worried about are the things that we fear. Things we find irritating or upsetting and things that make us feel depressed or dissatisfied. This is how destructive pendulums have been influencing the shape of the human psyche over thousands of years. These pendulums maintain fear in man to successfully manipulate him. This is why people are vaguely aware of what they want, yet know exactly what they do not want. When you allow the negative thought mixer to take over, that is, when you are mulling over everything that is bad, complaining, and having pessimistic thoughts, you unwittingly join the game of a destructive pendulum and radiate energy at its frequency. It is a terrible habit and you would do well to replace it with the habit of having conscious control of your thoughts. Whenever your mind is not occupied with anything in particular, for example, when you were on a train or a bus, or when you were out taking a walk, or doing something that doesn't require special concentration or attention, put positive thoughts in your head. Don't think about what you were not able to get. Think about what you want to get, and you will get it. Suppose you don't like the house you live in. You keep telling yourself, I'm fed up with this place. Everything about this place irritates me. But once I move to a new home, then I'll be happy. Meanwhile, I just can't help myself. Oh, how I hate this place. With thoughts like this, it's impossible to get what you want. Even if you were about to move to a new and better place, your new house will bring you many disappointments. Fair enough, you say, but I'm leaving this dump and moving to a luxurious villa. What disappointments could be waiting for me there? You don't have to worry about that. The more contempt you feel towards the house that has given you shelter these many years, the more unpleasant surprises will await you in your new quarters. And those unpleasant surprises will be of the most varied kind. The taps won't work. The paint will start to peel. Walls will start caving in. The neighbors will annoy you. In short, everything will happen that needs to happen to maintain the parameters of your negative radiation. There will always be life tracks that contain all possible conveniences, but where you will be just as dissatisfied as before. The space of variations has many luxurious houses where you nonetheless feel like you are in hell. And if you don't have anywhere to move yet, you will remain in this hated situation for sure. 
After all, you're not tuned to the frequency of the life track where the house of your dreams awaits you. At the moment, you're thinking about what you don't like, so you're giving off negative energy. And this energy fits perfectly with the life track you are on now. And you're stuck there until the frequency of your radiations changes. To change them, you first have to accept your present situation as it is and get rid of your dissatisfaction and resentment. You can always find something good in any situation. Even the smallest things in life can be a source of joy. If you don't like the house you're living in, you can at least be grateful to it. After all, it has sheltered you. It is rainy and windy outside and the house is keeping you safe and warm. Doesn't this deserve some kind of recognition? If you are grateful for what you have now, if you experience love towards all those things surrounding you, the things that make your life easier, you will give off positive energy. Then if you want to, you can count on an improvement in your living conditions. And when you are moving away, be sure to thank everything that surrounded you in your old house. Even things that you throw away deserve your gratitude. In these moments, you are transmitting positive vibrations to the surrounding world and these vibrations will definitely come back to you. You also need to start thinking about the house that you would like to have. This is more difficult than being irritated with things around you, but it's also more useful. Look at real estate advertisements that feature photographs and prospects of potential homes. Visit interior design stores and look for furniture that you would like to have in your house. In other words, let all your thoughts be preoccupied with what you wish to have. We always possess things and encounter situations that have a powerful grip on our thoughts. Our thoughts always return to us like a boomerang. There are so many examples that illustrate how a negative attitude can ruin your life. Let's say you were planning a vacation in a warm country, but where you live now, the weather is terrible. You're walking the streets, the cold wind is making you shiver, and the rain is soaking your clothes. It is, of course, hard to be overly joyous in such weather, so at least try to be neutral, ignoring this destructive pendulum. If you are actively expressing your dissatisfaction with the weather, then you are accepting the pendulum and causing it to swing higher. You were telling yourself, well, soon I'll be going to a warm country and I'll be so happy in the sun and in the warm sea. But as for now, damn this swamp. With such an attitude, you're not tuned to the life track where heavenly relaxation is waiting for you. You won't get there. You already have your plane ticket, you say? Well, so what? You'll get to your destination, but either bad weather or some other misfortune will be waiting for you. On the other hand, everything will be great if you can tune in to a positive frequency. It is obviously not enough to prevent negative energy from getting to you. You need to avoid radiating such energy. For example, you are very annoyed and yell at someone. You can be sure that as a result, some sort of problem will follow. In the present situation, the parameters of your radiation match the life track where you were annoyed and that's exactly where you will be transported to. On these tracks, the density of unpleasant situations is higher than normal. Don't try to calm yourself with the justification that this unpleasant situation was unavoidable. Just watch how new unfortunate events seem to follow any negative reaction that you have. The conclusion from all of this is clear. You always find yourself on the life tracks that correspond to your energy radiation. If you let negative energy in, unpleasant things will happen in your life. If you radiate negative energy, it will return to you like a boomerang in the form of problems. The Transmission Instead of accepting a game with destructive pendulums, look for pendulums where the game will be of use to you. This means acquiring the habit of paying attention to everything that is good and positive. As soon as you see, read, or hear something good, pleasant, or reassuring, attach this to your thoughts and feel happy. Don't let bad news consume you. Instead, bring everything positive into your life and soon you'll have more and more good news and nice opportunities. If you have been inspired by something and felt joy, 
but then life drags you down once again, how can you keep the positive feeling? First, remember it. Out of habit, we plunge into colorless everyday life, forgetting about the nice things in life. It then stops bringing us pleasure. This is a bad habit. Pendulums make us forget. We need to maintain the little flame of celebration in ourselves and to cherish that feeling. Simply observe how life changes for the better. Grasp for the tiniest straw of joy. Look for good signs everywhere and in everything. This is at least not a boring thing to do. You need to remember that every minute you spend with transurfing, you are consciously moving closer towards your dream, and that means you are controlling your destiny. This notion alone will instill you with serenity, confidence, and joy, and thus you'll always be on holiday. Once the feeling of being on holiday has become a habit, you will always find yourself on top of the wave of success. Be happy with everything you have in the present moment. Of course, circumstances are such that it can be difficult to feel satisfied with life. But from a practical point of view, expressing your dissatisfaction with something is unconstructive. After all, don't you really want to be on the life tracks where everything is working out perfectly? How will you ever get there if your radiation is full of discontent? The frequency of such radiation corresponds exactly to the life tracks that are bad for you. So the situation will be the opposite of what you want. Good tracks are characterized by the fact that when you are on them, you feel good and your thoughts are filled with joy and satisfaction. Good news is not too exciting and is soon forgotten. Bad news, on the other hand, stirs up a response because it informs about a potential threat. Don't let bad news into your heart and into your life. Shut yourself off to bad news and open yourself to good news. Any positive change should be recognized and cherished. These are the forerunners of the wave of success. As soon as you hear even the smallest piece of encouraging news, don't forget about it immediately as you used to do, but do the opposite. Savor it. Talk about it. Pursue it. Think over this piece of news from all possible angles. Take joy in it build hypotheses on it, and expect a positive development. In this way, you will be thinking on the frequency of the wave of success, tuning into its parameters. As a result, more and more good news will come and life will get better. This is not mysticism, this is reality. You are moving to the life track that corresponds to the parameters of your thoughts. When you are on good terms with yourself and the surrounding world, you transmit harmonious emanations to the surrounding world. You create around yourself an area of harmonious vibrations where everything is turning out successfully. A positive attitude always leads to success and creation. Negativism, on the other hand, is always destructive and always aimed at devastation. For example, there's a category of people who are looking for problems, but not their solutions. They are always ready to discuss difficulties in a lively manner and find all kinds of new problems. Such people usually have trouble suggesting a real way out, because from the beginning they are tuned not to the solution, but to the search for more difficulties. Their fixation on problems brings them in abundance, but the situation remains unsolved. The readiness to look for and criticize the bad sides of things always brings corresponding fruits. A great deal of harm, but no benefit. Look around and you'll find people like this. They're not especially good people or especially bad people. They are simply sitting firmly on the hook of destructive pendulums. Most people treat any unwanted event in their lives with hostility. Usually an unwanted event is something that is not part of our original script. The opposite is also true. We only believe something to be successful if it corresponds to our expectations. Let's say a man misses his plane and is upset about it. Little does he know that the plane is going to crash. But it can also be the other way around, when a man misses out on a fantastic opportunity because it was not part of his plan or it was inconceivable. The worse you think about the surrounding world, the worse your world gets for you. The more you get upset over your lack of success, the more failures will come your way. 
As a man sows, so shall he reap. If you choose to live your life with a pessimistic view on things, then every day you'll be practicing transurfing in reverse, sliding along the life track where real hell is waiting for you. So assume the opposite position. Rejoice in your misfortunes. Try to find something useful in your problems. This is always possible. A glass is not half empty, it is half full. There is a trivial saying, it's all for the best, and it works like a charm, if that is what you truly believe. You have to be stubborn in maintaining your positive attitude, refusing old habits of getting upset and depressed for any reason. Every misfortune is, at the least, a lesson that makes you stronger and more experienced. Take joy in everything good that is happening in your world, and it will turn into paradise. Of course, this is an unusual way of behaving. But your goal is also unusual, to become a genie who grants wishes. You cannot achieve this using ordinary methods. Reacting positively is difficult to do at first because the old habit of reacting negatively to undesired things is strongly rooted in us. The main thing is to learn to remember that whenever an unfortunate event happens, it is a pendulum trying to hook you. As soon as you remember that, you can make a conscious choice to give away your energy to the pendulum by giving it your negative emotions or leave it empty-handed and thereby gain victory. If you do remember, it will be easy to let the pendulum fall through or extinguish. We always unconsciously give our energies to the pendulum. They pull us by the strings of our feelings and our habits act as levers that set in motion the mechanism that captures our thoughts. Even after having read this chapter and having set the goal to remember the tricky game of the pendulum, you may again react negatively to the unwanted. Later, of course, you'll realize that in that moment you simply forgot and were acting unconsciously, out of habit. Nonetheless, as soon as you remember in time, the situation will be under your control. You'll think, ah, it's you, the pendulum. Well, it's not going to be so easy for you to hook me this time. At that point, you're no longer a puppet on a string. You are free to make the conscious decision of either accepting or rejecting the pendulum. If you use this method with persistence and determination, eventually the new habit will replace the old. Meanwhile, pendulums will try to get to you in every possible way. You'll notice how, as if on purpose, a lot of annoying little nuisances will start popping up in your life. Don't despair because the problems will be mostly petty. If you don't give up, and if you learn to remember, your victory will be very impressive, you'll see. What's more is that next time you encounter the wave of success, a pendulum won't be able to carry you away from it. The bird of happiness will stay in your hands, and to lure it in, you must give off positive energy all around you. That is, you must not only be an exclusively positive receiver, but a positive transmitter as well. As a result, the world around you will change quickly for the better. You will be able to easily glide onto more and more successful life tracks. In the end, the wave of success will come to you, sweeping you along with it and bringing you directly to success. But don't think that transurfing is limited to gliding on the wave of success. These are only the first steps. Even more extraordinary discoveries are waiting for you. Magic Rituals To conclude this chapter, let's look at a particular example of tuning into the frequency of the wave of success. Sometimes people unknowingly try to tune into the frequency of a wave of success. For instance, in the beginning of the day, sellers are prepared to give the first customer a significant discount. They intuitively feel that the first customer is important that it's necessary to get things going to initiate the sale and that once the first sale has been made, more will follow. In the language of transurfing, this means tuning into the frequency of a track for successful selling. It is difficult simply to focus your thoughts on the frequency itself, but the first customer gives hope and faith and the tuning then happens on its own. The seller gets on the wave of successful selling and emanates thought energy with corresponding parameters. 
He starts to believe that his goods will sell out quickly and that he only needs to mention this to a customer who will immediately get caught by this radiation and obediently make the purchase, himself convinced that he got lucky today. Let's take another example. Merchants often perform a peculiar magic ritual. They touch their merchandise with money. Of course, this action on its own is absolutely deprived of power and there is no magic taking place. However, if the seller believes in the power of the ritual, his belief alone helps him tune in to the frequency of successful selling. The actual tuning occurs on a subconscious level. The seller's mind is aware only of what is happening on the outside. The ritual works, but for some unknown reason. And it does work not by itself, but as a stage prop. The main part is played by the actor's thought energy. Almost every profession has a similar magic ritual for different situations. People believe in these rituals and use them successfully to tune into the frequency of successful life tracks and to get on top of the wave of success. Actually, it's not important what people believe in, whether it is in the magic quality of the ritual or in the tuning process. The important thing is the practical result. Summary. The wave of success is an accumulation of favorable tracks in the space of variations. The flow of fortunate events follows only if you have been inspired by the first success. Destructive pendulums take you away from the wave of success. Having freed yourself from pendulums, you get the freedom of choice. Receiving and transmitting negative energy, you create your own hell. Receiving and transmitting positive energy, you create your own heaven. Your thoughts always return to you like a boomerang. Pendulums won't throw you off the wave if you have the habit of remembering. The habit of remembering is formed through regular practice. Chapter 4 The Balance People create their own problems and obstacles, and then waste time and energy trying to overcome them. Contrary to popular belief, transurfing shows that the reason for all of our problems lie on a different plane. How can we eliminate problems from our lives? Care about it. Don't worry about it. Excess Potential Everything in nature strives towards a state of balance. Drops in atmospheric pressure are balanced by the wind. Differences in temperatures are compensated with heat exchange. Anywhere that there can be an excess potential of any energy, balancing forces appear to eliminate the imbalance. We're so used to this being the normal state of affairs that we don't even ask ourselves, why is it this way? Why does the law of balance work? There's no answer to this question. Overall, laws do not explain anything. They only state the obvious. All laws of nature are secondary to the law of balance, which is the primary law, at least it seems so. Therefore, it is not possible to explain why balance should exist in nature. To be more precise, it is impossible to explain where balancing forces come from and why they exist. After all, just because we are used to some phenomenon doesn't mean that it is exactly how things happen. We can only guess what the world would be like without the law of balance. Would it turn into some kind of formless jelly or into scorching heat? The fact is we don't really know. We simply have to accept the law of balance and stare in amazement at how perfect the space around us is. We're used to having good and bad luck in life. We are also used to the idea that success is always followed by failure. These are manifestations of the law of balance. After all, success and failure both upset the balance. The world is full of constant fluctuations, day and night, high and low tide, birth and death. Even in a vacuum, elementary particles are continuously dying and being reborn. In the end, everything strives towards balance and is controlled by the law of balance, including the complex system of pendulums. In fact, the entire world can be viewed as a collection of pendulums where some are swinging higher, 
others are dampening, and all are interacting with each other. Each pendulum receives impulses from its neighbors and gives them its impulses in return. You yourself are also a kind of pendulum. If one day you decide to upset the balance and make a sudden swing in direction, you will create annoyance in neighboring pendulums which will then turn against you. The balance can be upset not only by actions, but by thoughts, and not just because thoughts usually precede actions. As you know, thoughts radiate energy. Even in the material world, everything is based on energy, and everything that happens on the invisible energy level is reflected in the world of visible material objects. A simple way to think of it is this. If an excess of energy potential appears, balancing forces arise to eliminate this potential. Thought energy gives rise to excess potential when you give an object too much significance. For instance, in one situation, you're standing on the floor in your room, and in the other, you're standing on the edge of a cliff. The first alternative doesn't bother you at all, but the second situation is very significant to you. Take one wrong step, and something irreversible will happen. On the energy level, the fact that you are simply standing has the same significance in both cases. But because you are on the edge of a cliff, fear arouses tension in you, causing you to create an irregularity in the energy field. Balancing forces appear immediately to eliminate this excess potential. You might even be able to feel their effect. On one side, a mysterious force pulls you down, while on the other side, a different force pulls you away from the edge. For the excess potential of your fear to be eliminated, balancing forces have to either pull you away from the edge or throw you off the cliff. On the energy level, all material objects have the same significance. We are the ones that give them specific qualities, good or bad, happy or sad, attractive or repulsive, simple or difficult. Everything in this world is subject to our evaluation. By itself, evaluation does not create any irregularity in the energy field. When you are sitting in an armchair, you evaluate the situation. Sitting here is safe, but standing on the edge of a cliff is dangerous. In that moment, however, the cliff does not concern you. You simply evaluate the situation, and the balance is not upset in any way. This is because an excess potential only arises if you give unreasonably great significance to an evaluation. The magnitude of excess potential grows if your evaluation of significance greatly distorts reality. In general, if the subject is important to you, you cannot evaluate it objectively. For example, an object of worship is always full of virtues, whereas an object of hate is always full of flaws, and an object of fear is always full of terrifying qualities. But in actuality, thought energy is artificially trying to create a quality that was never there in the first place. Excess potential is being created, which stirs up the wind of balancing forces. Attributing too much importance to things distorts realities in two ways. By giving the object excessively negative or excessively positive characteristics. By itself, a mistaken evaluation plays no role whatsoever. A displaced, incorrect evaluation creates excess potential only if your evaluation is of great significance to you. Only things and situations that are important to you personally can provide your evaluation with energy. Although excess potential is invisible and intangible, it plays a large and even treacherous role in our lives. The action of balancing forces and eliminating this potential gives rise to most of our problems. The treachery lies in the fact that we often get a result that is the opposite of what we intended. In fact, we usually don't understand what is actually happening. Why is this? Why do the things we wish for always slip away? There is an erroneous opinion that if we devote ourselves completely to something, we can achieve outstanding results. 
From the point of view of balanced forces, it's apparent that to be immersed in your work means putting this same work on a scale and weighing it against everything else. The balance is disturbed, and you don't have to wait long for a result that is the opposite of what you expected. If working harder to you means making more money or becoming more qualified, then of course you have to make an effort and nothing terrible will happen as a result. But you've got to know when to stop. If you are constantly exhausted and work becomes a nightmare for you, then you need to slow down or change your job. Excessive efforts definitely have a negative outcome. Let's take a look at how this happens. Besides work, you have other things that you value. Your house, your family, entertainment, your spare time, and so on. If you put your job above everything else, then you create strong excess potential. And because everything in nature strives towards balance, forces will manifest to balance out the excess potential, regardless of your will. These forces can act in varied ways. For example, you get sick, so there can be no talk about work until you get better. Maybe you get depressed. After all, you are forcing yourself to do something that has become a burden to you. Your mind keeps telling you, come on, you have to get up, go to work, and earn some money. But your soul, the subconscious, is wondering, is that really why I came into this world to suffer and endure all kinds of pain? What do I need all this for? You eventually end up with chronic fatigue syndrome, which puts an end to the possibility of doing a job. It's like pulling the devil by the tail. Meanwhile, you notice other people around you who are achieving greater results with less effort. It turns out that having reached a certain level, the significance you attribute to your job starts maxing out. The more weight your work has for you, the more problems you get. It seems to you that having all these problems is just the normal order of things. The truth is that you will have fewer problems if you simply lower your bar of importance. There is only one conclusion to draw from all of this. To eliminate excess potential, you need to consciously review your attitude to work. It is necessary for you to have some time off from your job to do what you like. Those who don't know how to relax don't know how to work either. When you are at work, rent yourself out. Give your job your head and your hands, but not your heart. The pendulum of work wants and needs all your energy. But you came into this world not just to work. You can be much more productive at work if you eliminate your excess potential and free yourself from pendulums. While renting yourself out, make sure to act impeccably. Don't let yourself make even the smallest blunders that may allow others to accuse you of recklessness. Renting yourself out does not mean being slack and taking no responsibility for your actions. It means being detached, not creating excess potential, but at the same time doing everything that is asked of you down to the smallest detail. Otherwise, you may be in for a bumpy ride. For example, there are always people around you who bury themselves in their work. They will sense subconsciously that you are renting yourself out, that you are no longer working hard even though you are still managing to get a lot of things done. These diligent folks will intuitively start looking for an opportunity to catch you making a mistake. As soon as you make a mistake, they will throw themselves on you. Whatever mistake you make, it will probably be insignificant and therefore humiliating when your colleagues point it out. Something like you being late for work, forgetting something, or having missed something. When you were engrossed in your work, they overlooked your mistakes, but now they accuse you of not caring enough about your job. Similar situations arise in your family or among friends. Therefore, when you are renting yourself out, whatever situation it may be, it's necessary to perform your duties flawlessly. Let your inner observer, the overseer, come to your aid. Otherwise, you will plunge into the game again. Your inner observer doesn't mean a split personality. You're simply noting to yourself in the background what you were doing and how you were doing it. You might object to the idea of renting yourself out, wondering if you should instead work excessively and in that way avoid excess potential. Well, this idea of putting your heart and soul into something depends on the task at hand. Burying yourself in your work can be justified in only one situation. 
when the work itself is your goal. But there is a difference between a goal and having your goal. But there is a difference between a goal and having your goal. When you are simply working for someone else, work takes your energy. But when the work is your goal, it serves as a tunnel leading to success. It pumps you with energy and fills you with inspiration and satisfaction. If you're among those rare happy souls who work is like this, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Dissatisfaction and Judgment Many people are dissatisfied with themselves and their achievements. If your flaws take on great significance for you, then excess potential gets created and balancing forces try to eliminate this potential by having you struggle to develop your virtues or to overcome your weaknesses. Depending on your nature, you get pulled in one of these two directions. Most people choose to struggle with their weaknesses, and it inevitably turns against them because eliminating your weaknesses is difficult to do. Consequently, you get the opposite result and the situation becomes worse. For example, you try to hide your timidity and only become either more timid or unduly familiar with strangers. If you were dissatisfied with your achievements only to a point that it pushes you towards self-perfection, this does not disturb the balance of forces. The world around you is not seriously affected and the inner change in balance is compensated for by positive actions. But if you start wallowing in self-reproach and resentment towards yourself, or even worse, if you start punishing yourself for whatever it is you don't like in yourself, then a dangerous situation happens where soul and mind come into conflict. But your soul never deserves this kind of treatment because it is perfect and self-sufficient. All flaws and weaknesses that you have acquired are the flaws and weaknesses of mind, not of soul. When you are in conflict with yourself, reason prevails and the soul withdraws into itself, which can devastate your life. Therefore, it is important to let yourself go and forgive yourself for your flaws and weaknesses. If you cannot love yourself, then at least stop fighting with yourself. Accept yourself as you are. This is the only way your soul will be an ally to your mind, and it is a powerful ally indeed. As long as you fight a war against your weaknesses, you waste energy by giving it to a harmful excess potential. But when you turn away from this struggle, that energy is released and can be redirected at developing your virtues. Even though this sounds simple, many people waste an enormous amount of energy struggling with themselves, trying to cover up their imperfections. They are like titans who have doomed themselves to bear this burden all their life. If only they would allow themselves to get rid of this heavy burden and just be the way they are, their life would get much simpler and easier. Their energy would be redirected away from the struggle with flaws and weaknesses to the development of virtues. If they did this, the parameters of their radiation would correspond to life tracks where virtues triumph over flaws and weaknesses. Think about it. How can you ever move to the life track where you are in good physical shape if all your thoughts are focused on your physical flaws? You can't because your negative thoughts inevitably lead you to what you don't want. When you are unhappy with yourself, you get into a conflict with only your soul. But when you are unhappy with the world, you get into a conflict with a large number of pendulums and there is nothing good in being under their spell. Nothing useful in trying to wage war against them. Dissatisfaction is a material radiation. Its frequency corresponds with life tracks that pronounce your weaknesses even more. When you feel yourself being pulled towards these tracks, you become more dissatisfied and this continues until you get to the track where you are old, sick, and incapable of changing anything. The only thing left is to try to find comfort with other people like you who spend their time and energy either whining about the world or reliving memories of how good everything was in the old days. Every generation is convinced that life is worse now. But no, life is worse only for those who are used to wallowing in their dissatisfaction with this world. It is a depressing picture, isn't it? There is also another aspect to this habit of showing dissatisfaction which is that it upsets the balance of forces. 
Whether your dissatisfaction is justified or not, it creates an excess potential in the energy space around you. This potential gives rise to balancing forces that strive to restore the balance. It would be great if these forces worked to make things better, but unfortunately, things usually happen the other way around. Balancing forces try to besiege you so that your complaints about this world will be of as little weight as possible. This is much easier for them to do than to change everything you were displeased with. Imagine what would happen if a ruler started actively expressing his dissatisfaction with everything that was happening in his state. It's not even important whether his motives were good or bad. Such a ruler would be removed or even physically destroyed. The entire history of humankind confirms this. The action of balancing forces is directed at decreasing the influence you have on the world around you. This is extremely easy to do using all sorts of methods. For instance, by relieving you of your obligations, your job, your salary, your home, your family, and your health. It is no accident that older generations end up with a life that is worse than it was in the past. You might argue that since balancing forces act to diminish the excess potential of dissatisfaction, which is a negative feeling, then the opposite should also be true. In other words, it would seem that if you were happy with the world around you, then balancing forces would do whatever it takes to ruin your party. But this only happens if your joy turns into wide-eyed enthusiasm. According to the law of transurfing, you transmit creative energy that transports you to positive life tracks. This energy does not create destructive excess potential, which balancing forces strive to eliminate. It's not by accident that different philosophical and religious interpretations of life have all come to the same conclusion that love, in its general sense, is the creative power responsible for the existence of our world. Well, balancing forces were created by this same power and they strive to support order in this world. They cannot turn against the very energy that also created them. The habit of expressing dissatisfaction with things stops you from getting what you want. The opposite is also true. The habit of constantly experiencing little joys for the most varied and insignificant reasons will get you what you want. This can mean only one thing, that you must substitute your old habit with the new one. How can you do this? Well, it is very simple. First, as trivial as it may sound, any misfortune is a blessing in disguise. If you make it your goal to find something good in things that appear negative, you will reach your goal without further effort. Turn it into a game. If you play this game constantly, your old habit will quickly be replaced by a new one. This habit is of great use to you and a nightmare for destructive pendulums. Secondly, if something terrible happens and the idea of feeling joyful about it seems unnatural and inappropriate, do as King Solomon did. He wore a ring with an inscription on the inside that was not visible to others. When something bad happened or when Solomon found himself in serious trouble, he would read the inscription inside which read, This too shall pass. The habit of expressing dissatisfaction has been developed by mankind due to the influence of destructive pendulums. With new habits, you'll generate positive energy that will carry you on a powerful stream to positive life tracks. Suppose that you now get inspired by your possibilities and start practicing the technique of substituting habits. Here's what will happen. Soon you'll notice that you're practicing less and less often and that you simply forget all about wanting to change your habits. This is unavoidable because old habits are deeply rooted in you. As soon as you start slacking off, a pendulum will immediately find a way to upset you and you won't even notice that you've just fed it your energy. Don't despair. If your intention is strong, you'll achieve whatever you want and the destructive pendulum will, in the end, leave you in peace. You just need to remind yourself about your intention more often. We are all guests in this world. Nobody has the right to be the judge of what he himself didn't create. This affirmation should also be applied to your relationship with pendulums. If you start acting against destructive pendulums that made you dissatisfied in the first place, you only make things worse for yourself. 
You don't have to be a meek little sheep, but you don't have to openly confront the world either. If a pendulum is acting against you personally, you can try to let it fall through or try to extinguish it. Whatever happens, don't let it get you into a battle with other pendulums. Like the man in the gallery who doesn't like the entire exhibition, don't judge, don't complain, don't argue. Just walk into another room that you do like. Dependent Relationships The other side of being dissatisfied with the world is to idealize it. Looking at the world through rose-colored glasses makes many things seem better than they really are, but when you think something exists when it does not, you create excess potential. To idealize means to overrate, to put on a pedestal, to worship. Love is the force that creates and directs the world, and it is different from idealizing because it remains passionless. Unconditional love is a feeling of endearment without ownership, of admiration without worship. In other words, it does not create a dependent relationship between you and the object of your affection. This simple formula can help you determine where feeling ends and idealizing begins. Imagine you are walking in a mountain valley that is overflowing with green plants, lustrous trees, and flowers. You admire the wonderful landscape, take in the fresh aroma, and feel that your soul is completely happy and peaceful. This is love. Then you start picking the flowers. You tear them out from their beds and crush them with your hands without thinking that they are alive. Then the flowers slowly die. Later on, it occurs to you that you can make perfume and cosmetics out of flowers, or that you can sell them, or maybe you decide to create a cult of flowers and worship them as idols. This is idealizing. A dependent relationship is created between you and the object of your former love, the flowers. Nothing is left from the love that you felt when you were simply enjoying the scenery in the mountain valley. Love generates positive energy that carries you to a corresponding life track, while idealizing creates excess potential, giving rise to balancing forces that strive to eliminate the excess potential. The action of balancing forces is different in each case, but the result is the same. Basically, it can be characterized as removing the halo. This always happens if you idealize something or someone. And depending on the object and the level of idealization and whether it produces a strong or weak result, it is always a negative force that requires the balance to be restored. If love turns into a dependent relationship, excess potential is unavoidable. Your desire to have what you do not have creates a change of energy pressure. Dependent relationships are identified by set conditions, such as, if you do this, then I will do this. You can find plenty of similar examples. If you love me, then you'll abandon everything and come away with me to the end of the world. If you won't marry me, then it means you don't love me. If you praise me, then I'll be friends with you. If you won't give me your toy shovel, then I'll kick you out of the sandbox. The balance is also disturbed when you compare or contrast something to something else. We are this way and they are different. For example, national pride, comparing one nation with others. Or the feeling of inferiority, comparing yourself to others. When something is set in contrast to something else, balancing forces start eliminating the potential. Positive or negative doesn't matter because you are the one creating the potential and the action of balancing forces will either pull apart the contradictory parts or unite them in confrontation. All conflicts are based on comparisons and contradictions. At first, fundamental declarations are made such as, they're not like us. It then develops into, they have more than us, we need to take it away from them. They have less than us, we must give it to them. They are worse than us, we must change them. They are better than us, we must wrestle with ourselves. They act differently than we do, we need to do something about that. All these comparisons lead one way or another to conflict, beginning with personal, emotional discomfort and ending with wars and revolutions. Balancing forces then try to eliminate the conflict through reconciliation or confrontation 
And because they get more energy from confrontation, pendulums will always try to manipulate events in that direction. Idealizing and Overestimation Overestimation means attributing personal qualities to someone who does not have those qualities. On a mental level, this may seem harmless, but on the energy level, it creates excess potential. Potential is created wherever there is an overflow of quantity or quality, and overestimating is exactly that. It is the creation of mental models of qualities that do not exist. This can happen in two ways. One way is when you attribute qualities to someone that are not his own. To eliminate this discrepancy, balancing forces must produce a counterweight. For example, a romantic young man imagines his beloved to be an angel of pure beauty. But in reality, she is quite the material girl, likes partying, and is not at all interested in sharing the young man's dreams of love. He idealizes her and puts her on a pedestal. But eventually, the halo will come off and his heart, his dream, will be broken. The other way is when there is no object to attribute the illusions to. In other words, you are just dreaming about an imaginary ideal person. You have your head in the clouds trying to escape a reality that seems unattractive. In the process, you create excess potential. In this case, balancing forces confront your romantic notions with harsh reality. Here's another example of overestimation. Suppose a woman draws a picture in her mind of the ideal husband. The more she convinces herself that he must be exactly this way or that, the more excess potential she creates. And only a guy with the opposite qualities to those of her perfect husband can destroy this excess potential. Without understanding why, she gets exactly what she doesn't want. The opposite can also happen. If a woman actively hates drunkards and rude people, it is as if she puts herself in a trap of getting together with an alcoholic or rude fellow. She gets what she cannot stand because she is radiating thought energy on the frequency of the things she dislikes, which in turn creates excess potential. Life often brings together completely different people who are unsuitable for each other, simply because balancing forces are trying to extinguish the excess potential by having opposites of excess potential attract each other. The action of balancing forces is especially evident in children because they are more sensitive than adults to changes on the energy level. As a result, they act naturally. If a child is given too much praise, he immediately starts acting up out of spite. And if you ingratiate yourself to him, he starts despising you, or at least not respecting you. If you use all your strength to raise a toddler to be well-behaved and obedient, he is likely to end up hanging out with a dodgy street gang. If you try to make some kind of genius out of him, he'll probably lose interest in school. And the more you drag your child to all kinds of after-school activities and societies, the more likely it is that he'll grow up to be a dull person. The best way not to create excess potential when raising or relating to children is to treat them like guests. In other words, you be attentive to them, show them respect, and give them freedom of choice without allowing them to walk all over you. As much as you are a guest in this world, so you should treat children as guests. Having a positive attitude towards others is almost as widespread as having a negative attitude. There is some balance in this case. There is love, and there is hate. A smooth, positive attitude does not result in excess potential. Potential forms only when there is a displacement relative to the nominal value. Unconditional love can be considered a zero on the scale of displacement because unconditional love doesn't give rise to dependent relationships and doesn't create excess potential. But that type of love in its purest form is rare. Generally, a dash of possession, dependence, and overestimation get added to love. It's hard to refuse the right of possession because possessing your object of love is completely natural as long as it doesn't lead to one of two extremes. The first extreme is the desire to have someone who doesn't belong to you at all and who doesn't even suspect your desire. This is the classic case of unrequited love, which has always given rise to suffering. 
However, the mechanism behind this is not as simple as it seems. If you love and admire flowers, it never occurs to you whether or not they love you. Why should they love you? Meanwhile, if you're burning with desire to hold them, but you cannot because that's forbidden in the park, it is clearly no longer love. What remains is a dependent relationship with negative emotions that are creeping up on you. In this case, the object of your love is in one place, you are in another, and you want to possess the object of your love. As a result, you create excess energy potential. You might assume that this potential would pull the desired object towards you, just like air masses that move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. But no, balancing forces don't care which way a balance is achieved. They will do whatever it takes to restore the balance. For example, they may move the object of your love farther away and neutralize you, that is, break your heart. Over time, you will be more and more prone to dramatizing the situation. He or she doesn't love me, and such thoughts will drag you on to a life track where mutual love becomes almost impossible. The stronger the desire to possess someone you love, or for your feelings to be reciprocated, the stronger are the balancing forces. Of course, if they choose an option that brings you closer to your loved one, then the story will have a happy ending. It is easy to determine the direction of balancing forces when you start to realize that you are in love. If you are really worried about whether your love will be reciprocated or not, and if something isn't right from the beginning of the relationship, then you need to radically change your tactics. More precisely, you need to start loving without demanding a reward in return. Only then will the fluctuations of balancing forces be pulled over to your side and start working for you. Otherwise, the situation will spin out of control like an avalanche, and then it will be almost impossible to change anything. It seems contradictory, but if you want your feelings to be reciprocated, then you need to love and not try to be loved. In this way, no excess potential is created, which means you do not have to worry about the 50% chance that balancing forces will work against you. Secondly, if you don't strive for reciprocating love, you won't have uncontrollable dramatic thoughts about unrequited love, and your radiation won't drag you to the corresponding life tracks. On the contrary, if you simply love without the right of possession, then the parameters of your radiation will fit those life tracks where reciprocation exists. This is because there are no dependent relationships in reciprocated love. If you already possess something, there is no point in getting upset about the right of possession. Just imagine how much your chances of reciprocated love will increase simply because you have refused the right of possession. Besides, unconditional love is extremely rare, and that alone is already intriguing and attractive. Wouldn't it be nice if someone loved you without demanding anything in return? The second extreme of the right of possession is, of course, jealousy. In that case, balancing forces have two ways of acting. If the object of love already belongs to you, the first way is to bring you even closer. In fact, some people like it when their partner is jealous, to a degree, of course. However, balancing forces have another option, which is to ruin that which gave rise to jealousy in the first place, namely love. The stronger the jealousy, the deeper will be the grave of your love. Contempt and Vanity Judging other people is one of the most effective ways to upset the balance of forces particularly if, in your judgment, you despise other people. On the energy plane, there are no good or bad people. There are only those who obey the laws of nature and those who upset the status quo. In the end, the latter always fall under the influence of forces that strive to restore the disturbed balance. Never despise people, no matter what, because due to the action of balancing forces, you may find yourself in the place of the despised person. To balancing forces, it is an easy, direct way to restore a lost harmony. Do you despise bums and poor people? You could lose your home and your money, and then the balance would be restored. Do you despise people who have a physical disability? No problem. An accident can be arranged for you. Do you despise alcoholics and drug addicts? You could easily find yourself in their place. After all, these people are not born that way. 
Circumstances in life have forced them into becoming who they are now. Why should you be exempt from similar circumstances? Never condemn your colleagues at work. In the best case, you'll make the same mistakes. In the worst case, a conflict may spring up that won't bring you anything good. Even if you were right, you could be fired. If you condemn another person just because you don't like him or the way he is dressed, you find yourself on the ladder of good and bad, except that you will be one step below the person you are condemning because you were emanating negative energy. There is nothing wrong with priding yourself on your successes or being in love with yourself. A general love for oneself is self-sufficient and doesn't disturb the balance. The balance is disturbed only when your inflated self-esteem adopts a scornful attitude toward the weaknesses, flaws, or achievements of others. Your love and pride then turn into vanity, which draws the attention of balancing forces. Contempt and vanity are human vices that animals don't have. They are guided by expedient intention and thus fulfill the will of perfect nature. Wild nature is more perfect than thinking man. A wolf, like all predators, does not feel hatred or contempt towards its prey. Try to feel hatred or contempt about a hamburger. But people build relationships with one another mainly on excess potential. The greatness of plants and animals is their lack of awareness of their greatness. Consciousness gives man many useful advantages, but it also provides for destructive elements such as vanity, contempt, and the complexes of guilt and inferiority. Superiority and Inferiority Feelings of superiority or inferiority are both dependent relationships. When you compare your qualities to the qualities of others, you inevitably create excess potential. On the energy level, it's not important whether you express your superiority publicly or simply congratulate yourself in secret. When you compare yourself to others to your advantage, you artificially assert yourself at the expense of others. This always creates excess potential that balancing forces have to react to. We usually perceive nuisances, problems, and obstacles as integral parts of the world, as necessary companions in this life, but the fact is that having trouble is an anomaly, an abnormal phenomenon. It turns out that most troubles are brought on by balancing forces working to eliminate the excess potential that we or people around us create. We don't realize that we create this excess potential, that we have to accept the problems it causes, and that this is simply the nature of balancing forces. But you can free yourself from most of your problems if you free yourself from the energy you spend supporting excess potential. A huge amount of energy is not only spent in vain, it is spent turning balancing forces so that results are the opposite of what you intend. A good example is when you compare yourself to other people and worry about your position on the ladder of superiority. When you free yourself from this preoccupation with your own importance, then you avoid a battle with the influence of balancing forces. As a result, you have fewer problems and become more confident in your own abilities. The same thing applies to your efforts to control or manipulate the world around you. This is another area that you have to keep your thought energy away from. This is because attempts to change your surrounding world not only disturb the balance of forces, but also affect other people to some degree. And that is not what you were trying to do. In fact, a central aspect of transurfing is that it allows you to choose a destiny without disturbing or interfering with other people's destinies. Fate truly is in your hands, but only in the sense that you were given the ability to choose it, not to change it. And when you think about it, this is much more effective than forging ahead, trying to overcome all obstacles in your path. Many people make the mistake of acting as if they can create their fate in the literal sense, but there is no place for battles in transurfing, which is a big relief. Of course, the opposite of the superiority complex is dwelling on your faults and belittling your virtues. But balancing forces don't care whether you create excess potential in a positive or negative form. 
The degree of balancing forces that your excess potential brings into play is simply proportional to how much your evaluation of yourself and the world differs, positively or negatively, from reality. Balancing forces will also cause you to behave unnaturally, and surprisingly, in a way that highlights the weakness you are trying to hide. For example, teenagers can be defiant and disrespectful. In doing so, they are simply trying to make up for their adolescent insecurity. On the other hand, shy people may act as though they are outgoing or impudent, but it is not natural. They do it only to hide their shyness. But all these attempts to fight your weaknesses and flaws are in vain. It's hopeless trying to fight low self-esteem. The only way to avoid its consequences is to eliminate the hang-up itself, which is difficult to do. Trying to persuade yourself that everything is great is also pointless. You can't really fool yourself. Preoccupation with your flaws, especially in comparison to other people's virtues, works the same as trying to display your superiority. And the result will again be the opposite of what you intend. Don't imagine that everyone is attributing the same significance to your deficiencies as you are yourself. Actually, everyone is preoccupied with themselves. Therefore, you can easily throw this giant weight off your back. Excess potential will then disappear. Balancing forces will stop aggravating the situation and energy will be released. Instead of fighting your flaws or trying to hide them, learn to compensate for them with other qualities. For example, lack of beauty can be compensated with charm. There are people who are physically unattractive, but as soon as they start talking, their listeners become enthralled. Physical flaws can be compensated with self-confidence. Just remember how many great confident people in history were physically unattractive. The inability to communicate with others can be replaced with the ability to listen. Everyone just like you, is preoccupied with themselves and their own problems, and a good, sincere listener is rare. And here's a special piece of advice if you are shy. Protect this quality of yours as you would protect a treasure. Shyness has a hidden charm to it, and once you decide to stop finding it and changing it, it will no longer be a clumsy quality. You will even notice that people start to like you. Here's another example of compensating for your flaws. The imagined need to be cool often pushes people to imitate others who have achieved the status of a cool guy. Yet mindless imitation of somebody else's script creates nothing more than a parody. Everyone has his or her own script. You just need to choose your credo and live by it. The leader in a group is simply the one who lives according to his credo. He becomes a leader because he is free from the obligation of having to ask others how he should act. He doesn't need to imitate anyone. He simply has a worthy opinion of himself, he knows what he is doing, and he doesn't need to prove anything to anybody. Hence, he is free from excess potential. In any group, the individuals that become leaders are those who live according to their own credo. If a person frees himself from the weight of excess potential, he has nothing more to defend. He is internally free, self-sufficient, and has more energy than those around him. These advantages, in comparison to other members of the group, make him a leader. The desire to have and not to have. The more you want, the less you'll get. When you want something so much that you are ready to risk everything you have to get it, you create an enormous amount of excess potential. In response, balancing forces throw you onto a life track where your desired object doesn't exist at all. The energy behind the behavior of a man who is obsessed with desire is like a wild boar trying to catch a bluebird. He wants the bird so badly that he's drooling just thinking about it, snorting and rooting about impatiently. Naturally, the bird flies away. If the boar had simply been strolling near the bird, not paying any attention to it, he would have had a pretty good chance of grabbing it by the tail. There are three forms of desire. The first is when a strong desire turns into a determination to have what is desired and to act accordingly. Then the desire is fulfilled. Moreover, the potential of the desire disperses into space because its energy is spent on performing the action. 
The second form is inactive, tormenting desire, which represents excess potential in its purest form. It hangs there in the energy field, and in the best case, it simply wastes the energy of the sufferer. In the worst case, it attracts all kinds of problems. The third form of desire, when a strong desire turns into dependence on the object of desire, is the most insidious. This is because attaching great significance to a desired object automatically creates a dependent relationship which gives rise to strong excess potential. And strong excess potential automatically summons balancing forces to extinguish it. Usually people make up conditions in their minds such as, if I achieve this, my situation will improve dramatically. If I don't achieve this, my life will lose all meaning. If I do this, I'll show myself and everybody else what I'm worth. If I don't do this, I'm worthless. If I could get this, it would be great. If I don't get this, it will be very bad, and so on. Once you become dependent on the object of your desire, you are drawn into such a violent whirlpool that you get exhausted trying to possess the object. In the end, you do not achieve anything and you just abandon your desire. The balance gets restored and balancing forces remain indifferent to your suffering. And all of this happens because of your strong need to have that desire fulfilled. The desire remains on one side of the scales while everything else is on the other. Your wish can be granted only if it takes the first form. That is when the desire is transformed into pure intention, free from excess potential. We are used to paying for everything in this world. Nothing is free. But in reality, we only pay off debts from the excess potential that we create ourselves. Everything is free in the space of variations. The absence of importance and dependent relationships is a kind of payment. You can only buy fulfilled wishes using this payment. To transfer to a life track where the desired object is transformed into reality, the only thing necessary is the energy of pure intention. Pure intention combines desire and action without any excess importance. For example, your unconditional intention to go down to the local newspaper stand for a magazine is pure intention. The more you value an event, the more likely it is that things will fail or go wrong. If you attribute great importance to what you have and cherish it dearly, then balancing forces will probably take it away. If what you want is way too important for you, then don't hope to get it. You first have to lower the bar of significance, the bar of importance. For example, you've got a brand new car that you're absolutely crazy about. You blow off little specks of dust and protect it carefully. You're terrified of any little scratch. Basically, you adore and worship your car. As a result, you create excess potential. After all, you are the one attributing such great importance to your car. But in fact, its importance on the energy plane is equal to zero. And as a result, balancing forces soon find some schmuck to smash up your car. Or being overly careful yourself, you bump into something. Once you stop worshiping your car and start treating it like an ordinary object, then the risk of something happening to it is significantly minimized. Treating something like an ordinary object doesn't mean neglecting it or being careless. It means taking perfect care of your car without idolizing it. The desire to have something has another aspect to it. There is the notion that you can get whatever you want if you want it badly enough. That a strong desire will bring you onto a life track where it will be fulfilled. But that is not the case. If your desire transforms into dependence, into some kind of psychosis, or if you hysterically strive to get something regardless of the cost, then somewhere deep inside you, you don't believe in the fulfillment of your desire. Consequently, you transmit thought energy with strong interference. When you don't believe in the fulfillment of your desire, you try as hard as you can to convince yourself that the opposite is true. Hence, you push the excess potential even higher. There is even a risk of spending your entire existence on your life work. The only thing to be done in this case is to reduce the significance of your aim. Go for it the same way you go to a newspaper stand for a magazine. The strong desire to avoid something is a continuation of being dissatisfied with the surrounding world or with yourself. 
The stronger the need, the more powerful the excess potential will be. The more you don't want something, the more likely it is that you will confront it. Balancing forces are indifferent to the way balance is achieved, and there are two ways of achieving it. One is to get you away from whatever it is you are trying to avoid. The other is to force you into contact with it. It's better to consciously stop trying to avoid it so that no excess potential is created. But that's not all there is to it. When you think about what you don't want, you emanate energy on the track where it will definitely happen. You always get what you actively don't want. Here is an example. A man attends a grand reception at the embassy where everything is pompous, refined, and delicate. Suddenly, he starts waving his hands wildly, stamping his feet, and screaming that he does not want to be taken out of the reception immediately. Naturally, security guards appear and grab the weird fellow who resists and cries as he is escorted away. Of course, this is an exaggerated example, but on the energy level, this is exactly what happens. Here is another example. Suppose you are awakened up in the middle of the night by a noise your neighbors are making. You really want to sleep, you have to go to work tomorrow, but it seems like your neighbor's party is just getting started. The more you want them to shut up, the more likely it is that the party will go on. The angrier you get, the more violent and noisy the party becomes. If you start hating them to a certain degree, it's guaranteed that such nights will become more frequent. To solve this problem, you can apply the method of making the pendulum fall through or extinguishing it. You can extinguish the pendulum if you see the situation as ironic. You can also just ignore the situation without displaying any emotion or interest in it. Then the pendulum will fall through and no excess potential will be created. You simply take comfort in the awareness that you have a choice and know how to use it. Soon the neighbors will settle down. The key is to analyze the situation and determine whether you are overestimating the significance of it and what problems that is causing. If things are terrible, never mind the overestimated significance for now. Shake off your dependent attitude and start persistently transmitting some positive energy. The worse it is, the better. For example, if you feel that you've suffered a great defeat, be happy. In this case, balancing forces are on your side because their job is to compensate bad with good. It can't be bad all the time, just as it can't be good all the time. No one can spend their whole life flying on the wave of happiness. Feeling guilty. Feeling guilty is excess potential in pure form. To balancing forces, good and bad deeds are equivalent to each other. The balance is restored in every case whenever excess potential is created. You've done something bad. You become aware of the nature of your deed. You then feel guilty. I should be punished. Excess potential is created. Or you've done something good. You become aware of the nature of your deed and then you feel proud of yourself. I should be rewarded. Excess potential is also created. Balancing forces don't have an idea of why someone has to be punished or rewarded. They simply eliminate the imbalance in the energy field. The payment for feeling guilty is always punishment of one kind or another. If you don't feel guilty, then the punishment may not come. Being proud of yourself when you have done something good also leads to punishment, not reward. This is because balancing forces have to eliminate the excess potential of pride whereas a reward would only reinforce it. When other people make you feel guilty, the excess potential is squared. It is enough that your conscience bothers you, but now you must also bear the wrath of the righteous ones. But the biggest excess potential that comes from feeling guilty is the innate tendency to imagine that you are always the one to be blamed for everything. Having a guilty conscience like this ruins your life because even though you are inventing your guilt, you are constantly under the influence of balancing forces that must constantly punish you for your imagined wrongdoings. On the other hand, balancing forces don't do anything to people who don't feel guilty about their bad deeds. It seems that justice should prevail and punish them, but nature doesn't have a sense of justice. 
On the contrary, decent people with an inherent feeling of guilt are the ones who always face misfortune, while shameless, cynical scoundrels get away with almost anything without being punished, and sometimes by even being rewarded for their efforts. So don't torture yourself with a guilty conscience. It won't help. It's better to act in such a way that you won't feel guilty later. The feeling of guilt also serves as a string by which you can be pulled by pendulums, and in particular by manipulators. Manipulators are people who act according to the formula. You should do what I say because you're guilty, or I'm better than you are because you are wrong. Such people try to impose a feeling of guilt onto their charges to gain power over them or for their own self-assurance. On the outside, manipulators appear proper. Their concepts of good and bad were established long ago. They always speak true words, thus they are always right, and their actions seem flawless and entirely proper. Of course, not all proper people have a tendency to manipulate. So where do manipulators get their need to lecture and control? It is conditioned by the doubts and uncertainties that are constantly tormenting their hearts. They skillfully hide this inner struggle from the world as well as from themselves. Their lack of an inner core of strength, which truly proper people possess, forces manipulators to seek self-assurance at the expense of others. The need to lecture and to direct others stems from their desire to strengthen their own position, which they do by belittling their charges. Thus, dependent relationships are created. It would be wonderful if balancing forces gave the manipulators what they deserve. However, excess potential only arises where there is tension. When a charge gives his energy to a manipulator by doing what he is told, there is no excess potential and the manipulator is free to act as he wants and get away with it. As soon as someone indicates that he is ready to take on the feeling of guilt, the manipulator will immediately stick to this person and start sucking his energy. To avoid this influence, you simply have to refuse feeling guilty. You're not obliged to justify yourself to anyone, and you don't owe anything to anybody. If you are at fault, you can bear the punishment as long as you don't remain the guilty one. If you are prone to justifying yourself out of a feeling of guilt, you have to stop doing that. If you do, the manipulators will know that there is no way they can hook into you, and soon they will leave you in peace. By the way, the feeling of guilt is the primary cause of the inferiority complex. If you feel inferior in something, it means this inferiority is created when you compare yourself with others. From the beginning, you are predisposed to take the blame regardless of the situation. Basically, you agree to be the guilty one. And if that is the case, you are agreeing to the fact that you can be found guilty and punished. When you compare yourself to others, you give them the right to be superior to you. You hand them this right and allow them to think that they are better than you. They probably aren't even thinking so in the first place, but you are. In effect, you are judging yourself for them. It is only natural, then, that people start judging you because you are putting yourself on trial. Instead, take back your right to be yourself and get up from the chair of the defendant. No one will dare judge you if you don't consider yourself guilty. Only you can give them the privilege of being your judge and jury. If for only a second you consider yourself guilty of being worse than others, they will feel it simply because you create excess potential when you feel guilty. The opposite is also true. If you are free from feelings of guilt, no one will think of self-asserting themselves at your expense because there will be no excess potential. There are two other interesting aspects to feeling guilty. Power and courage. People who feel guilty always subject their will to the will of people who don't feel guilty. If you are potentially ready to admit to being guilty of something, subconsciously, you're ready to endure punishment, and thus, you're ready for subordination. On the other hand, if you never feel guilty, but you have the need to assert yourself at other people's expense, you're ready to become a manipulator. Everyone decides for himself or herself what to do with their conscience. For example, rulers and leaders have the least developed sense of guilt. And feeling guilty is a foreign concept to cynics and other people deprived of conscience. Their method is to wade through, walk over, and slaughter other people. 
It's not surprising that unscrupulous individuals often come to power. Although this doesn't mean that power is bad or that all people in power are bad. The other aspect of feeling guilty is boldness, which is a sign of an absence of any feeling of guilt. The essence of fear lies in the subconscious. Fear is caused not only by the frightening unknown, but by the dread of punishment. If you are guilty, you theoretically agree to bear punishment, and therefore you are afraid. Indeed, brave people are not tormented by their conscience. They don't suffer from the least sense of guilt. They have nothing to be afraid of because their inner judge has declared that they are right. The opposite is true for timid victims who subconsciously think, I'm not sure I've acted correctly. I could be considered guilty and everyone has the right to punish me. Even the tiniest, weakest, most deeply hidden feeling of guilt opens the subconscious gates for punishment. If you feel guilty, it means you agree, in theory, that all sorts of thieves and robbers have the right to attack you, and therefore you are afraid. People have come up with an interesting way to dissolve the excess potential of guilt, namely by asking forgiveness. And it actually works. If you carry the feeling of guilt inside, you are trying to retain negative energy and are thus pumping up the excess potential. When you ask for forgiveness, you release the potential and the energy dissipates. Asking for forgiveness, admitting your mistakes, confessing your sins, all these are methods of getting rid of the excess potential of guilt. It is important, however, to make sure that your remorse doesn't turn into a dependence on manipulators. They are just waiting for this to happen. In asking for forgiveness, you admit your mistake in order to release the excess potential. Nevertheless, manipulators will remind you of your mistake later to provoke you back into feelings of guilt. Don't give in to their provocations, otherwise the excess potential that you released through forgiveness will come back again. Refusing to feel guilty is also an effective way to survive in an aggressive environment, in jail, in a gang, in the army, on the street. It's no accident that the criminal world has the unspoken rule of trust no one, fear nothing, don't ask for anything. This rule urges them to avoid creating excess potential. You might think that the best way to protect yourself is by demonstrating your strength, but this is a general method of dealing with things. A more effective way is to avoid feeling any sense of potential punishment from your subconscious. Here's an interesting example. In the former Soviet Union, political prisoners were intentionally jailed with common criminals as a way to break their spirits. But what happened was that many of the political prisoners, because they were remarkable individuals, did not allow themselves to become victims of the harassment and persecution. Not only that, they earned respect and authority among the criminals. Their personal independence and dignity were valued more than their physical strength. Many people have physical strength, but strength of character is a rare phenomenon, and the key to personal dignity lies in the absence of any feelings of guilt. Anton Chekhov, the renowned Russian writer, once said, Drop by drop, I am squeezing the slave out of me. In other words, he was struggling to get rid of his feelings of guilt. He was fighting against guilt in himself. In transurfing, however, there is no place for struggling or forcing yourself to do something. It is simply a matter of learning to say no, that is, to choose. You don't have to squeeze guilt out of yourself, you just have to live in accordance with your own credo. No one has the right to judge you, you have the right to be yourself. If you allow yourself to be you, the need to justify yourself will no longer be relevant and the fear of being punished will fade away. And then something remarkable will happen. No one will ever again dare to offend you. In prison, in the army, in a gang, at work, on the streets, in a bar, nowhere. You will never again end up in a situation where someone threatens you with violence because you've thrown out the feeling of guilt from your subconscious. On that life track, Scripts for violence simply don't exist. Money. It's hard to love money without trying to possess it and without forming a dependent relationship to it. 
Be happy if you have money, but don't ever kill yourself for not having enough money or for overspending it. Otherwise, you will have less and less of it. If you don't earn much money, your typical mistake will be moaning about how there is never enough money. The parameters of such a radiation correspond to financially poor life tracks. It is especially dangerous to give in to the anxiety that you will have less and less money. Fear appears to be one of the most energetically rich emotions. By being afraid of losing money or being afraid of not earning enough, you transfer to a track where there actually is less and less money for you. Once you fall into this trap, it's not easy to get out, although it's possible. To escape the money trap, you have to eliminate the cause of excess potential which you yourself created. And what causes this excess potential is usually an extreme desire to have money or to rely on money, that is, to be dependent on it. For starters, accept what you have and be satisfied with it. Remember that it could always be a lot worse. You don't have to reject the desire to have money. You just have to accept the fact that money is not flowing to you like a river. Look at your situation like someone who can at any moment become incredibly rich or lose everything he has. Many pendulums use money to attract adherence. In particular, it is pendulums that have led to the widespread fetish about having and needing money. Pendulums have created the myth that to get something, you need the means of money. In this way, your aim gets substituted for and superseded by money. Instead of thinking about your aim, you think about money and thus fall under the influence of an interest, a pendulum, that is alien to you. You no longer understand what you personally want from your life and instead join the useless race for money. It is profitable for pendulums when things go this way. You work for an alien pendulum and never get much money because you're serving somebody else's goal. Many people find themselves in this situation which strengthens the myth that wealth is a privilege of the few. The truth is that anyone could get rich as long as he is pursuing his own goal. Money is never the goal and is not a means for reaching your goal. It is only an accompanying attribute. The goal is what you want out of life, such as to live in your own house and grow roses, to travel around the world, to catch trout in Alaska, to go skiing in the Alps, to raise horses on your own farm, to enjoy life on your own island, to become a movie star or an artist. It's obvious that certain goals can be achieved only if you have a bag of money. So the majority of people do exactly that. They try to get this bag. They think about money and leave the goal itself in the background. In terms of transurfing, they try to transfer to a life track where the bag of money awaits them. But when you're working for somebody else's pendulum, it's hard to get the bag of money. In fact, it is impossible. So what happens is that you don't get any money and you never reach your own goal. It cannot be any other way because your thought energy is directed at an artificial replacement and not at your true goal. If you believe your goal can be achieved only if you are rich, send that requirement to hell. Suppose you want to travel around the world. It's obvious that to do that you need a lot of money. But to get what you want, you need to think about the goal itself and not about money. Money will come by itself because it is a complementary attribute. It sounds too simple, too impossible, but it's true. Pendulums pursuing their own benefit turn everything upside down. The goal is not achieved with the help of money. Rather, money comes to you on your way to your goal. The strong influence of pendulums has given birth to all manner of deceptions and myths. For example, the notion that a man has to become a major industrialist or banker or movie star, and only then can he become a millionaire. However, only those people become millionaires who have their goal, not wealth, on their mind. Most people act the opposite way. They serve someone else's goal, or they replace their goal with an artificial substitute, or they reject their goal because they don't have the money and therefore believe that they do not fulfill the condition of being wealthy. In reality, there are no limitations to wealth and riches. You can want absolutely anything and get it. 
On the other hand, if the goal of having something has been imposed on you by a pendulum, you will get nothing. The important thing to understand is that money is nothing but a complementary attribute on the way to your goal. Don't worry about the money. It will come to you automatically. The main thing is to lower the importance of money so that no excess potential is created. Don't think about the money. Think only about what you want to get. At the same time, you should not ignore money. You should treat it carefully. If you see a minor coin on the street and you are too lazy to pick it up, then you don't value money at all. The money pendulum will not be predisposed towards you if you treat its attributes carelessly. Also, don't worry when you are spending money. Money is fulfilling its mission when you buy something. If you have made the decision to spend some money, don't regret it later. Trying to save up a sum of money and spending as little as possible only produces a strong potential. The money is accumulating in one place and doesn't go anywhere. In that case, it's likely that you will lose everything. Money should be spent sensibly so that there is some movement in the energy field. In a place where there is no movement, excess potential will appear. It is no coincidence that wealthy people get involved in charitable organizations. That is how they reduce the excess potential from their accumulated wealth. Perfection From childhood, we are taught to do everything thoroughly, carefully, doing our best. Children are taught to be responsible and to distinguish between right and wrong, good and bad. Without a doubt, this is the way it should be. But all these notions become so deeply rooted in the hearts of zealous pendulum adherents that they become an obsession and a constant struggle. Guess what you are struggling with? Balancing forces, of course. By always having the aim for everything to be perfect, you create complications on the energy level. You live in a world of extreme evaluations, which in turn create excess potential. There is nothing bad about trying to do your best in everything, but if you make it overly important, then balancing forces will be right there. They will simply ruin everything. In addition, this will create a backward loop and you will get more and more obsessed with perfection. You want perfection, but get the opposite. So you desperately try to fix everything, but then everything gets even worse. In the end, striving for perfection turns into a habit and in some cases, a mania. The life of a perfectionist turns into a constant struggle and this automatically poisons the life of those around him because a perfectionist is demanding not only of himself, but of others. If you are not involved in the situation yourself, you can see the absurdity of someone trying to be perfect in everything, terrorizing everyone around him. But the perfectionist grows so much into his role that he thinks he is the one without sin, flawless and right in everything he does. This feeling of being right about everything is deeply rooted in his subconscious. Of course, such a perfectionist is easily tempted to act as the supreme judge of humanity, deciding how and what all the lost souls should be doing. After all, the feeling that he is always right justifies his judgments, and his righteous desire to set everyone else on the correct path gives him motivation to embark on his crusade. In short, he gives himself the right to judge and condemn other people. In reality, of course, such a trial doesn't go beyond common preaching and accusation making. On the energy level, however, powerful excess potential develops. The judge takes on a mission, deciding how other foolish people should act, what they should think, what they should value, and what they should strive for. And if one of them decides he has his own opinion on the subject, then he needs to be put in his place. And if he shows any resistance, then he has to be put on trial, sentenced and labeled so that everyone knows where he stands. Of course, the truth is that we are all guests in this world, that everyone is free to choose his own path, and that no one has the right to condemn or judge others. The idea of striving for perfection seems innocent in the beginning, but ends with someone claiming the privileges of a master. In that case, the resistance of balancing forces, even in the form of minor problems, grows stronger. If the disturber of balances is under the protection of a pendulum, he may for a limited time get away with his perfectionism. But eventually, the time will come to pay the bills. When a guest forgets that he is only a guest and pretends to be the host, 
he can be thrown out. Importance. All of these things, guilt, money, perfection, stem from excess potential that comes from attributing too much importance to things. Importance represents excess potential in its pure form, and to eliminate this potential, balancing forces must create problems for the person who created it. There are two forms of importance, inner and outer. Your inner or individual importance can be the overestimation of your virtues or flaws. The formula of inner importance takes the form of attitudes like, I am an important person, or I do important work. When the arrow of your persona's importance goes off the scale, balancing forces get to work. Inner importance can also take the form of belittling your virtues and flaws, that is, guilt, guilt. But whether your inner importance is overly positive or negative, doesn't matter. The amount of excess potential is the same in both cases. Outer importance happens when you attribute too much value to an object or to an event. It takes the form of, to me such and such is of great importance, or it is very important to me to do this and that. Excess potential is thus created. Virtually everything is a variation of inner or outer importance. Indignation, irritation, anxiety, worry, depression, panic, despair, Fear, self-pity, guilt, attachment, admiration, exaggerated affection, idealization, disappointment, pride, arrogance, contempt, disgust, resentment, and so on. In all these cases, whenever you attribute excessive importance to a quality, object, or event inside or outside yourself, you create excess potential. You summon the wind of balancing forces and put yourself in a position to become a puppet of pendulums. To be in harmony with the rest of the world and to relieve yourself of pendulums, it's necessary to reduce excessive importance. You always have to keep watch over how much importance you attribute to yourself or to the world around you. Your inner overseer shouldn't be sleeping. When you reduce importance, you immediately enter the state of balance and pendulums aren't able to establish control over you. After all, they can't hook on to emptiness. This doesn't mean that you should become a lifeless statue and refuse all emotions. In the long run, it's useless and unnecessary to fight emotions. If you were always trying to stay calm on the outside while your inner world is boiling over, the excess potential grows bigger. Emotions stem from attitudes, therefore you should change your attitude first. Feelings and emotions are nothing but consequences that are caused by one thing, importance. In the animal and plant worlds, there is no such thing as self-importance. There is only expediency from the point of view of balancing forces. Domestic pets are probably the only animals that experience a sense of their own importance. Yes, they too can be influenced by society. Other animals are guided only by their instincts. Importance is a human invention, and one that is a great pleasure to pendulums. Reducing your sense of inner and outer importance doesn't just decrease the number of problems in your life, it gives you freedom of choice. Yes, according to Transurfing, we already have the right to choose, but as long as we are under the influence of pendulums, we cannot use that freedom. Balancing forces and pendulums stand in our way. And because of excessive importance, we spend our entire lives struggling with balancing forces. There's simply not enough energy left for choosing, let alone for thinking about what we personally want from life. Meanwhile, pendulums are constantly trying to establish control over us and impose someone else's goals on us. Where is the freedom in that? Any form of importance, either inner or outer, is simply imaginary. None of us is of any importance in this world. But at the same time, we have access to all the riches in the world. Consider how children, when they are on the beach, splash, play, and have fun in the water. Suppose none of them imagines himself as either good or bad, the water as good or bad, or the other children as good or bad. As long as the situation remains this way, the children are happy. They're in harmony with nature. Similarly, each of us comes into this world as a child of nature. 
If we don't disturb the balance, we can have the best there is. But as soon as we start making up importance, problems appear. But because we do not see the causal link between our importance and our problems, it seems that the world is a hostile environment where it's not that easy to get what we want. The fact is, however, that artificially created importance is the single obstacle on the path to fulfilling your desires. From struggle to balance. Is there any way of resisting balancing forces? Actually, that's exactly what we do every day. Our entire life is a struggle with balancing forces. All difficulties, nuisances, and problems are connected to the actions of balancing forces. And in all these cases, trying to resist them is meaningless because they keep doing their thing no matter what. The only remedy against balancing forces is to eliminate the reason for their actions, namely to reduce the excess potential of importance. The one thing that everyone is busy doing is building a wall on the foundation of his importance and then trying to climb over it or get through it by beating his head against the wall. Instead of overcoming obstacles, wouldn't it be better to take a brick out of the foundation and collapse the wall? We clearly see the obstacles in our way, but to see the foundation they are all built on is not so easy. If you've encountered a problematic situation, try to determine where you've gone too far, what you've become attached to, and what you have attributed excessive significance to. Identify any excessive importance and then reject it. The wall will come crashing down, the obstacle will be eliminated, and the problem will be solved without your help. In short, don't try to overcome obstacles. Reduce importance instead. Reducing importance doesn't mean fighting your feelings and suppressing them. Excessive emotions and feelings are the result of importance. If you eliminate the cause, which is your attitude to a certain event or object, you eliminate the result. It's really a matter of realizing that importance doesn't bring you anything except trouble. When you understand this, it becomes easier to reduce your inner and outer sense of importance. Reducing outer importance doesn't mean neglecting things or underestimating situations. In fact, neglect is simply importance with a minus sign. You need to have a simpler attitude towards life. Don't be careless, but don't exaggerate either. Don't think so much about whether people are good or bad. Accept the world as it is every day. Reducing inner importance doesn't mean just resigning yourselves to circumstances or enduring self-humiliation. To repent your mistakes and sins is the same as showing off your virtues and accomplishments. One is importance with a minus sign, the other with a plus sign. Remember that your remorse is useful only to pendulums that want to establish control over you. Accept yourself as you are. Allow yourself the luxury of being you. Do not exalt your virtues and do not belittle your flaws. You are not important, nor are you worthless. Strive toward inner peace. One thing that doesn't create any excess potential is a sense of humor, being able to laugh at yourself and at others without offending either yourself or them. Humor is the same as denying importance. It is actually a caricature of importance. The one golden rule you need to follow is this. Before trying to solve your problems, reduce their importance. Then balancing forces will not bother you and the problem can be solved quickly and easily. To reduce importance, it's necessary first to remember and realize that the problem exists as a consequence of excessive importance which is putting you in the grip of a pendulum. Stop, shake off your delusions of importance and change your attitude to the object in question. This is not difficult to do. You already know that the only thing in your way is excessive significance. The only difficulty is to remember in time that you are wallowing in inner and outer importance. To help you remember, you need to activate your overseer, your inner observer, to keep track of all your inner values. Your thoughts get captured by importance exactly the same way that muscles are involuntarily strained. For example, when something bothers you, the muscles of your back and shoulders tighten up. You don't notice the tension until you start feeling the pain associated with it. 
But if you remember in time and pay attention to your muscles, you can release the tension before it causes pain. In the same way, you have to catch yourself attributing excess importance as you get ready for an event. If whatever you are about to do is really important to you, don't blow it up even further. The best recipe for success is spontaneity, improvisation, and a light attitude. If you are preparing for something, do not prepare too seriously or carefully. This only boosts your sense of importance. If you worry about something without doing anything about it, this also boosts your sense of importance. But in this case, action can evaporate the potential of importance. So don't just think, act. And if you can't act, then don't think. Instead, turn your attention to something else and let go of the situation. In this way, you let go of the sense of importance. You'll be most effective in everything you do if you take the focus of attention off yourself as the person executing the action and off the end goal and move your focus onto the process of performing the action. When you have the attitude that I am not doing important work and the work is not important, excess potential is eliminated, balancing forces do not interfere, and the action gets completed without problems. Why does it happen sometimes that you worry about an event, fear it, constantly think about it, and imagine all kinds of difficulties and problems that can happen because of that event, but in the end, everything turns out okay? Or the opposite situation, where you don't care much about a future event, but as a result, you encounter unforeseen trouble. In the first case, your evaluation of the event goes off the scale in a negative direction, while in the second, it goes off the scale in a positive direction. In both cases, what you receive in the end is the accumulated action of the forces which have to balance the excess potential that you created. You might think that if you intentionally imagine the worst possible scenario of what might happen before an exam, then balancing forces will enter and give you the highest grade. But it doesn't work that way because your intention of assuming the worst is artificial. It is a product of only your mind and therefore has no energy basis. Only the intention coming from your soul can have an energy basis, which is why you can't achieve a desired result simply by visualizing it. Being in harmony. Never ever, under any circumstances, boast about what you have even if you've earned it fair and square. And never brag about what you haven't achieved yet. This is extremely unprofitable because balancing forces will always act against you. Make yourself at home, but don't forget that you are a guest. If you are in harmony with surrounding pendulums, that is, if you are swinging in unison with them, then your life will unfold with ease and pleasure. Because you are in resonance with the world, you will get energy from it and achieve your goal without further effort. If you've gotten yourself into a situation where it's impossible to live in balance with the world around you, for example, your husband is beating you, then you should think about how to take that crucial step and change your surroundings to something different. Maybe you feel you have nowhere to go. That notion is coming from a pendulum that is trying to keep you under its control so that it can suck your energy. Remember, there is always a way out, and not only one. Just avoid any abrupt actions without carefully thinking them through. The perfect solution will come to you as soon as you reduce excessive importance and free yourself from the influence of the destructive pendulum that is bothering you. Then you can make the pendulum fall through, or you can extinguish it. Summary Excess potential is created only if you attribute significance to an evaluation. Excess potential grows if your evaluation is distorting reality. The action of balancing forces is directed at eliminating excess potential. The action of balancing forces is often the opposite of the intention that created the potential. When giving yourself out for rent, Activate your inner overseer to look after you, so that you do everything impeccably. Discontent and condemnation always turn balancing forces against you. 
it is necessary to replace habitual negative reactions with a positive transmission. Unconditional love is admiration without the right to possess or worship. Setting terms and comparison produces dependent relationships. Dependent relationships create excess potential. For love to be reciprocated, you have to abandon the right of possession. You will definitely have to pay for contempt and vanity. Free yourself from the need to confirm your superiority. Striving to hide your flaws creates the opposite effect. Any inferiority is compensated for by your virtues. The more importance you attribute to a goal, the less likely it is that you will reach it. Desires that are free from potentials of importance and potentials of dependence will be fulfilled. Say no to feelings of guilt and to the need to justify yourself. To refuse the feeling of guilt, it is enough to allow yourself to be you. No one has the right to judge you. You have the right to be yourself. Money comes on its own as an accompanying attribute on the way to your goal. Greet money with love and attention and part with it without regret or worry. Having said no to inner and outer importance, you get freedom of choice. Importance is the only obstacle on the path to fulfilling your desire. Do not overcome obstacles, reduce their importance. Care without worrying. Chapter 5 An Induced Transition The Shift of Generations Each generation thinks those were the good old days. They remember being younger when colors were vivid, dreams were attainable, the music was better, the climate was more favorable, people were more friendly. Life was full of hope and brought joy and satisfaction. Later in life, however, the same events do not make a man as happy as before. For example, a picnic, a party, a concert, going to the movies, a celebration, a holiday by the sea. Of course, if we look at it objectively, everything has more or less the same quality when you get older. The party is fun, movies are interesting, and the sea is warm, yet something is missing. The colors fade, experiences become dull, and your interest wanes. So why was everything so great in your youth? Is it that your perceptions get more dull as you grow older? Or is the world really going down the drain? Actually, the world on its own is not degrading. It gets worse only for you individually. Parallel to the negative life track you are on now, there are life tracks which you left at some point in your life where everything is fine, just as it was in the good old days. But by expressing dissatisfaction, you tune yourself into life tracks that are worse, and you get drawn into them more and more. According to Transurfing, the space of variations has everything for everybody. For example, there is a sector where, for a given individual, the colors of life have completely faded, while for others, life remains as it was. One man radiating negative thought energy enters a sector where the decorations of his space have changed. The world remains the same for everyone else, but for him, things gradually get worse. This is when he starts remembering how vivid and fresh everything was in his past. When you were growing up, you accept the world as it is. A child doesn't know whether things could get worse or better. Young people are not picky and haven't been spoiled yet. They are simply discovering the world and taking joy in life. They have more hopes than complaints. They believe that everything here and now is not too shabby and will get even better. But then come misfortunes and failures. A man begins to understand that not all his dreams will come true that other people are better off and that he has to fight for his place under the sun. As time goes by, he has more complaints than hopes. Discontent and whining become the moving forces, pushing him towards unsuccessful life tracks. 
In transurfing terms, he starts radiating negative energy that transfers him onto life tracks that correspond to those negative parameters. The worse you think of the world, the worse it gets. In childhood, no one particularly contemplates whether childhood is good or not. As children, we take everything for granted. The greatest resentment we feel is toward relatives who, for example, don't buy us a toy. Later, however, we start to resent the world around us as it satisfies us less and less. The more we complain about it, the worse it becomes. As a result, everyone who experiences youth and lives to maturity believes that a lot of things seemed better in the past. It's a harmful paradox. You are confronted with annoying circumstances, you express your discontent, and as a result, the situation gets worse. Your discontent comes back to you threefold. First, the excess potential of your discontent turns balancing forces against you. Secondly, your discontent serves as a channel through which a pendulum is able to suck your energy. And thirdly, as you radiate negative energy, you move to negative life tracks. The habit of reacting negatively is so deep-seated that people have lost the advantage they have the lower creatures inhabiting this planet. That advantage is consciousness. An oyster reacts negatively to an external irritant, but unlike the oyster, a man is able to consciously manipulate his relationship to the external world. Yet he doesn't make use of this advantage and instead responds to the slightest inconvenience with aggression. He thinks his aggression is strength, when in fact it throws him helplessly into the pendulum's spider web. How should we understand the paradoxical statement that the world is not the same for everyone? We all live in the same world of material manifestations of variations, but the variations are different for each person. On the surface, you can see clear differences in destinies. Rich, poor, successful, unsuccessful, happy, unhappy. They all live in one world, but it is different for each of them. However, not only do the scripts of destinies and roles differ, the individual decorations differ too. This difference is not as obvious. One man looks out on the world from the window of his luxurious automobile, another from a garbage can. One is having fun at a party, while another is troubled with his problems. One sees a cheerful group of young people, while another sees a gang of troublemakers. Everyone is looking at the same thing, but the picture is drastically different. Each person is tuned to his sector in the space of variations, thus everyone is living in his own world. All of these worlds are placed on top of each other, in layers, forming what we understand to be the space we live in. This may seem hard to understand. It's impossible to separate one layer from another. Each person forms his own reality with his own thoughts, and at the same time, this reality intersects and interacts with the surrounding world. Imagine Earth without a single living creature on it. Winds blow, rain falls, volcanoes erupt, rivers flow. Then suddenly a man is born and starts observing all of this. The energy of his thoughts produce a material manifestation in a certain sector in the space of variations creating the life of this given man in this given world. His life represents a new layer of this world. Then another man is born and another layer appears. A man dies and a layer disappears. Throughout his life, each person moves from one sector of the space of variations to another, and in doing so transforms the layer of his world. Because he more readily expresses discontent and radiates more negative than positive energy, there is a tendency for the quality of life to get worse. Even though he may acquire material prosperity with age, he isn't any happier because of that. The colors of his decorations still fade and life becomes less and less enjoyable. Sometimes it happens the other way. A man starts to develop a positive taste for life as he gets older and transfers himself to more positive life tracks. Or a young man who was extremely successful at an early age starts rolling downhill, hitting rock bottom. But generations in general agree that life gets worse as you get older. What they don't understand, of course, is that they are choosing their layer of life, positive or negative, for themselves. 
Which raises the question, how do you use transurfing to return to that world of your youth, to the tracks where life was full of color and hope? Before we answer that question, you have to understand how you got off those tracks in the first place. The Funnel of the Pendulum The psyche of man reacts more to negative irritants, be it undesirable information, negative energy, danger, or hostile actions. Of course, positive influences also stir up strong emotions, but fear and rage by far excel joy and happiness and strength. Have you ever heard, for example, of a person suffering from too much joy? Yet many people suffer from stress and depression. Pendulums, and in particular the mass media, actively make use of this human tendency. You rarely hear anything good in the news. Usually, in a news program, it works something like this. You get hold of a negative fact, you follow up on the story with extra coverage, new details emerge, and everything is thoroughly savored and dramatized in a variety of ways. The same pattern develops for catastrophes, natural disasters, terrorist acts, armed conflicts, and so on. In the beginning, there is a plot, then the story unravels. Further details are exposed, the tension rises, there is a culmination. Emotions flare to their maximum, and finally, the story comes to a conclusion. All of the energy dissolves into space, and a temporary calm descends upon the viewers. The endless numbers of TV series follow the same pattern. All the drama is literally created out of thin air. Nevertheless, all you have to do is watch two or three episodes, and you're hooked. Nothing particularly interesting ever happens in these soap operas, but you're hooked because your frequency of thought radiation is caught by the pendulum of the TV series. Your attention becomes fixed on a given sector. Let's look at a specific example of this pattern unfolding. You hear about something that could theoretically upset you, such as news about a violent event that took place in another country. This is the first push of the destructive pendulum. If the news somehow affects you, you start responding to the stimulus by expressing your attitude to it, by living through it. You radiate energy of the same order and on the same frequency as the first push of the pendulum. Along with thousands of other people, you respond to the pendulum with interest and participation. Your radiation resonates with the pendulum, whose energy then increases. The mass media continues its campaign. You follow further developments with interest, and the pendulum keeps getting nourished. At first glance, nothing extraordinary has happened. It's an everyday matter. So what if you give a little of your energy to a destructive pendulum? It doesn't affect your health. In reality, however, as you radiate energy at the frequency of negative events, you move yourself to life tracks where similar events will take place closer and closer to you. Your interaction with the pendulum becomes tighter and tighter, and you already accept such events as an unavoidable part of your life. Your attention becomes more selective, and everywhere new facts about similar events in different countries start popping up. You discuss this news with close friends and relatives, and they react with interest and compassion. The frequency of your radiation heightens, and the pendulum grows as you get closer to the tracks where you are no longer an observer, but a direct participant in the event. This phenomenon of being drawn into the funnel is an induced transition to a life track where the negative event gets included in the layer of your world and you become a victim of the destructive pendulum. Disaster Many people would agree that there is a theoretical possibility for them to be in a disaster, but not all of them allow this possibility to enter the layer of their world. For example, some people don't watch TV series, they aren't interested in the news, they aren't bothered by every little event that happens somewhere and to someone. They live in their own layers and are adherents of other pendulums. They don't worry when they hear that an airplane crashed somewhere in the world. They have enough of their own problems. People are more vulnerable to an induced transition if they are interested in disasters, if they get concerned and worry about disasters that happen elsewhere to other people. 
If your life is not too full of problems and worries, then you try to fill this void by turning your attention to events in the layers of other people. As a result, you regularly read the tabloids or watch TV series or wait for new information about catastrophes and natural disasters. The tabloids and TV series may seem to represent small and harmless pendulums, but your clinging to them makes up for your own deficiency of information, emotions, and experience. Meanwhile, getting interested in pendulums of catastrophes and natural disasters poses a real threat to you because they are strong and very aggressive. If you pay attention to negative events, the frequency of your thought radiation will attract more negative information and disasters will eventually become a part of your life. And how could it be otherwise? After all, you yourself are letting them into your layer of the world and indirectly accepting the destiny of a victim. Of course, you don't want to be a victim, but that's not important. Once you accept the game of the pendulum, the roles are defined by the pendulum and not by you. And the probability of you being in the wrong place at the wrong time starts to increase. On the other hand, if you ignore the prompts of destructive pendulums, the probability of you being in a disaster will be close to zero. You might be thinking, but why do thousands of people die in catastrophes and natural disasters? Does this mean that they are all thinking about catastrophes at the same time? The thing is that you are not the only one living in this world. You are surrounded by lots of people who are actively working on destructive pendulums and radiating thought energy on the frequency of these pendulums. No one can isolate himself completely from this radiation. A field of radiation can capture you and cause you to start radiating energy on the same frequency without you even being aware of it. That is how the energy field of induced transition grows, reaching a snowballing effect and drawing you into it as into a funnel. Your objective is to stay as far away as possible from the center of the funnel by not letting information about catastrophes and disasters get to you, by not becoming interested in them, by not living through them emotionally as if they have happened to you, and by not discussing them. You should just let any information about disasters pass you by. This does not mean avoiding them, it means not letting the information get to you. Trying to actively avoid encounters with a pendulum is the same as looking for encounters with it. When you oppose something or resist it or express aversion to it, you actively radiate energy on that frequency. Not letting something get to you means ignoring it by not reacting to any negative information on the subject and instead shifting your attention to harmless television programs and books. If you can't refrain from reacting, then you can at least rely on the intuition of your overseer, your inner observer. For example, if you are afraid of flying on airplanes, don't fly. If there is fear in the first place, then it means that in the range of your radiation, there is a frequency that resonates with the life track on which an air disaster is marked out. It does not mean that you will certainly get on that track, but nonetheless, there is a probability of it happening. If you have no thoughts about any danger on an airplane, then there is nothing to be afraid of. On the other hand, if you experience unusual anxiety before getting on a plane, it would be wise to skip that flight. War War breaks out basically the same way as a simple fight. At first, one side tells the other its opinion on something, the other side holds an opposite view, and so the first opinion serves as the push of a destructive pendulum. The second party then responds with greater amplitude, in reply to which the first party responds with aggression. The pendulum swings higher and higher with more and more tension until it reaches the point of physical conflict. Meanwhile, the people taking part in this game of pendulums find themselves transferred to a life track of mounting tension. You can only change a situation like this at the beginning because once the conflict begins, the situation is already out of control. When the spiral is just starting to coil, you could respond to the first push of the pendulum amicably or by simply stepping aside, in which case the pendulum falls through or is extinguished. Consequently, you are not transferred to a new life track. 
However, if you engage in the pendulum swings, your frequency of radiation approaches the parameters of the spiral's new life track. Unfortunately, if you as an individual do not react to the pendulum, this does not guarantee that you will not be drawn into a war or a revolution. If you've stepped into a powerful whirlpool, no matter how much you try, it is almost impossible to get out of it. However, if you don't accept the pendulum's game, you will at least get additional chances to stay alive and come out of the conflict with the smallest possible losses. Also, whether you are for or against war, it's all the same to the pendulum. It gets energy from both sides. As long as your energy radiates at the frequency of war, a transfer takes place onto the corresponding track. Acknowledge the war and participate in it, and you are on the field of battle. Oppose the war and fight against it, it nevertheless draws you into its funnel and consumes you. To not accept the pendulum means to ignore it. Of course, you can't always ignore it. That is the danger of an induced transition. The best thing is not to take a position as either an advocate or an opponent of war. Throughout history, neutral governments have existed that have stood aside from war, watching entire nations destroy one another. Meanwhile, the people furiously protesting against war have fed the pendulum with the same intensity as those supporting the conflict. Their position seems different, but for the pendulum, it is the same. It gets their energy just the same. War War breaks out basically the same way as a simple fight. At first, one side tells the other its opinion on something, the other side holds an opposite view, and so the first opinion serves as the push of a destructive pendulum. The second party then responds with greater amplitude, in reply to which the first party responds with aggression. The pendulum swings higher and higher with more and more tension until it reaches the point of physical conflict. Meanwhile, the people taking part in this game of pendulums find themselves transferred to a life track of mounting tension. You can only change a situation like this at the beginning because once the conflict begins, the situation is already out of control. When the spiral is just starting to coil, you could respond to the first push of the pendulum amicably or by simply stepping aside, in which case the pendulum falls through or is extinguished. Consequently, you are not transferred to a new life track. However, if you engage in the pendulum swings, your frequency of radiation approaches the parameters of the spiral's new life track. Unfortunately, if you as an individual do not react to the pendulum, this does not guarantee that you will not be drawn into a war or a revolution. If you've stepped into a powerful whirlpool, no matter how much you try, it is almost impossible to get out of it. However, if you don't accept the pendulum's game, you will at least get additional chances to stay alive and come out of the conflict with the smallest possible losses. Also, whether you are for or against war, it's all the same to the pendulum. It gets energy from both sides. As long as your energy radiates at the frequency of war, a transfer takes place onto the corresponding track. Acknowledge the war and participate in it, and you are on the field of battle. Oppose the war and fight against it, it nevertheless draws you into its funnel and consumes you. To not accept the pendulum means to ignore it. Of course, you can't always ignore it. That is the danger of an induced transition. The best thing is not to take a position as either an advocate or an opponent of war. Throughout history, neutral governments have existed that have stood aside from war, watching entire nations destroy one another. Meanwhile, the people furiously protesting against war have fed the pendulum with the same intensity as those supporting the conflict. Their position seems different, but for the pendulum, it is the same. It gets their energy just the same. Unemployment Almost everyone nowadays is afraid of losing their jobs. It begins with the smallest, most harmless thing. For example, you overhear that your company is not doing as well as it did before. Someone you know has lost his job, or there are rumors circulating about downsizing and so on. On a subconscious level, invisible to you, a red light goes off. Shortly thereafter, another signal comes. Perhaps inflation is on the rise. This puts you and other people on guard. Everyone starts talking about it, and the pendulum of unemployment gets fed with energy. 
Then comes the news about a dip in the stock market and your tension mounts higher. Worry is replaced with anxiety, then by fear. You're now vigorously radiating energy on the frequency of a life track where you see yourself without a job. When you carry around the fear of becoming unemployed, you can count on it being as obvious as wearing a sign around your neck that says, I can be fired. If you think that you can hide this fear, you are mistaken. Small gesticulations, intonations, and inflections in your voice tell more than words. Having lost confidence in yourself, you are already less effective as a worker than you were before. Things that were a piece of cake before are not going too well. There is more tension in your interactions with coworkers who are in the same position. You bring your nervousness home to your family, and instead of supporting you, they start to accuse and criticize you. Your stress just increases. Your fear of being fired is caused by a feeling of guilt. This feeling is either smoldering or burning with a bright flame in your subconscious. Who do they usually fire first? That's right, the worst ones. If you allow yourself to think that you could be worse than others, then that assumption by itself puts you on the blacklist. Turn away from the feeling of guilt. Allow yourself the luxury of being you. And if you're not successful, start looking for another job. Why? Because the excess potential of emotional worry dissipates and dissolves through action. That's why some people start looking for a new job as soon as they are employed. They don't do this because they intend to change jobs immediately. They do it because insurance brings confidence, just in case there is an option. If you are calm about your future, the action of balancing forces won't touch you. Epidemic you are probably thinking that we can't talk about life tracks when it comes to contagious diseases. After all, you get ill simply because you've been infected. That's true, but only in that you allow yourself to get infected. This doesn't mean you should walk around with a mask on. That won't save you anyway. The reason you get ill is because you voluntarily agree to take part in the game called Epidemic. It begins with hearing that there is an epidemic. Let's say the flu is going around. Everyone knows the flu is transmitted through the respiratory system. So you allow the possibility that this could happen to anyone. Immediately, your mind starts playing the being sick movie. You have a fever. You're sneezing and coughing. From that moment on, you are in the game because you are radiating thought energy at the frequency of a destructive pendulum. Now you are subconsciously looking for confirmation that an epidemic is happening and your attention becomes more selective. Sneezing people are all around you. They were always there, but now you notice them. At work and at home, from time to time, someone mentions the subject of the flu. This confirms your assumption that an epidemic is happening. Even if you're not particularly looking for confirmation and the subject doesn't especially worry you, Somehow, confirmation takes place by itself. If from the beginning of the game, you tune yourself to the frequency of the destructive pendulum, your bonds to it become stronger and stronger, regardless of your conscious participation. And if you don't mind getting sick, or if you feel that you're destined to get sick, it means you are already an active adherence of the pendulum. Or perhaps you decide not to get sick, and you keep telling yourself that you are absolutely healthy and will not get sick. Well, this won't work because you are thinking about the illness, so you are radiating energy on the frequency of the illness. Once again, the direction of your thoughts, for or against, is not important. In either case, you are giving the pendulum your energy. Belief is a powerful energy, even if it is not expressed in words. You cannot save yourself even if you run and get vaccinated. It doesn't matter because you are going to be ill for a period of time one way or another. The first symptom of your illness gives you a choice. Will you, after all, be sick or not? You make weak attempts to resist and finally face the fact that you were getting ill. This brings the final adjustment in your radiation and you move to a life track where illness assumes full control. The induced transition starts from the moment you accept the pendulum. If you truly don't care about this epidemic, the transition won't take place. Or if you are on vacation, haven't been talking to anyone, haven't heard any news, and know nothing about the epidemic, the pendulum won't touch you. It will simply fall through as if into empty space. 
Have you ever wondered why doctors don't become infected? Many are even bold enough to work without protective masks. It's not because they give themselves vaccines. You can't vaccinate yourself against all illnesses. The reason is that doctors are also actively playing the game of the illness pendulum, but they have an entirely different role. Like airline stewardesses who consistently recommend passengers to fasten their seatbelts while they themselves fly about the cabin as if they are invulnerable. Panic Panic is perhaps the most intense and quickly induced type of transition. A pendulum spiral coils very fast when people panic because a signal of real danger always seems convincing and immediately draws people into the game of a destructive pendulum. For the same reason, the swinging of the pendulum increases much faster, like an avalanche. At the same time, when you panic, you lose almost complete control of yourself, which means that you turn into both a highly sensitive receiver and an active retransmitter of the pendulum swings. When this happens, the pendulum has an ideal way to materialize itself, in the form of a crowd. Unfortunately, all these factors make it extremely difficult for you to have a pendulum fall through or extinguish. In moments of panic, it doesn't occur to most people to think about how they might neutralize the pendulum. However, if you can get a grip on yourself and not give in to panic, you have a good chance of saving your own life and the lives of those close to you. For example, on a sinking ship, there's always a scuffle around one of the ship's rescue boats, while the boats nearby are empty. If you only take a moment to look around, you notice the empty boats. But the insidious nature of an induced transition is precisely that it works like a funnel, sucking everything around into itself and making you lose sight of possible alternatives. Poverty Thinking logically, how can a simple man who was born in the slums get rich? Well, when you think and act logically, you get corresponding results. The man who was born in poverty finds himself in poor surroundings. Thus, he gets accustomed to it and stays tuned to the frequency of radiation of his miserable life. It is virtually impossible to move onto a track of prosperity as long as you feel hatred toward your poverty, envy toward those who are wealthy, and a strong desire to become well off. One of the first discoveries children make is that they can't get free of something just because they don't want it. Even as an adult, you cry out in despair and indignation. But I don't want this. I hate it. Why won't it leave me in peace? Why is this always happening to me? It's difficult to accept the fact that if you don't want something, it will happen to you anyway. And if you hate it, then it will follow you wherever you go. You can hate your poverty, your work, your physical flaws, your neighbors, the bums on the streets, alcoholics, drug addicts, dogs, thieves, criminals, the impudent young, the government. But whatever it is, the more you hate it, the more you will encounter it in your life. This is because it gets to you, you think about it and you radiate thought energy on the frequency of a life track where the thing you don't want exists in abundance. In fact, really not liking something radiates more energy than really liking it because the emotions are stronger. The intensity of your emotional suffering swings the pendulum higher. Also, if you actively hate something, you create excess potential which causes balancing forces to direct themselves against you. The man born in poverty has a dream to get rich, but his desire alone won't change anything. He is just a poor person dreaming about getting rich. If he is not ready to act to get what he wants, he won't get it. And he doesn't act because he is convinced that it doesn't matter, that nothing good will come of it. It's a vicious circle because desire itself doesn't have any power. It can't lift a finger. Only your intention your readiness to act can lift the finger. Your intention also includes your readiness to have. But it's not as simple as saying to yourself, I'm really ready to have some riches. It is so simple after all, I do want to become rich. This is because there is a large gap between wanting and being ready to have. 
For example, a poor person feels like a fish out of water in a rich environment or in an expensive shop, even if he tries with all his might to convince himself and others of the opposite. In the depths of his soul, he feels that he is not worthy of it. Riches don't enter the poor fellow's zone of comfort, not because being rich is uncomfortable, but because he is too far away from it. A new armchair is better, but the old one is more comfortable. A poor person sees only the external side of wealth, luxurious houses, expensive cars, fine clothes, clubs, and so on. If you put a poor person in those environments, he feels uncomfortable. And if you give him a suitcase full of money, he will start doing all sorts of stupid things and in the end lose everything. The frequency of energy he transmits is in sharp contrast to a wealthy life. Not until he puts the attributes of wealth in his comfort zone, not until he radiates thought energy on that frequency, will he feel that he is the deserving owner of expensive things. Without that, he will remain poor even if he finds a buried treasure. Another obstacle on the way to wealth is envy, because envy has a strong destructive element. When you envy something, you try to devalue it in every possible way. The logic of envy is, I want what he has. I don't have it, and I'll probably never have it, but I am not worse than him. Therefore, the thing he has is actually lousy, and I don't really need it. In short, the desire to have something becomes a psychological defense that turns into rejection. This takes place on a subtle level because the subconscious understands everything literally. You consciously devalue the object of envy just for show, to calm yourself, but the subconscious takes it seriously and does everything in its power to prevent you from getting the thing you envy. Events unfold even more dramatically when a prosperous person induces a transition to a life track of poverty. The spiral begins to unwind slowly and then faster and faster until it is impossible to stop. For example, it starts with temporary financial difficulties, which can happen at any moment to anybody and which is actually as ordinary and unavoidable as rain on the day you want to have a picnic. But if you don't fall into rage, depression, agitation, or indignation because of a financial difficulty, the swing of the destructive pendulum will dissipate because you do not give your energy to it. An induced transition begins only when you grab onto the end of the spiral and give the pendulum your response, the response it needs to survive. Typically, the first reaction to the push of the destructive financial pendulum is discontent, which mildly supports the pendulum. If your emotions stop there, the pendulum dies out. A more intense reaction is the emotion of indignation. This quickly boosts the pendulum, which responds in turn with another push, such as sending you information that someone is to blame for your financial difficulties. To this second push, you respond with negative comments or actions towards the guilty party. At that point, the destructive pendulum becomes fully animated and a new branch of the spiral appears. For example, your next salary is smaller, prices shoot up, or someone suddenly demands that you repay a debt. Initially, you don't realize that a process is going on. It just seems like an unfortunate event. But you induced this process. You are responsible for the swings of the pendulum. The frequency of your energy radiation has radiated away from the track where you are prosperous to the track where you are deprived and annoyed. As a result, you move to the tracks corresponding to these new parameters. And so your situation gets more and more serious. Bad news starts pouring in on you from everywhere. Prices go up. Your company is no longer doing as well. You begin actively discussing this negative news with friends and relatives. These discussions are usually destructive. They include discontentment, complaints, and thoughts of aggression towards the supposed guilty parties. This is especially pronounced in companies where business is indeed bad, where the day begins with the postulate that there is no money, as if it were a morning prayer. At this point, you are fully captured by the spiral and your radiation is tuned to the frequency of the destructive pendulum. 
As things keep getting worse, you get ridden by anxiety, which feeds the pendulum and causes you to create excess potential all around you in the form of more discontent, aggression, depression, apathy, resentment, and so on. It is only a matter of time before the destructive pendulum is joined by balancing forces. The situation spirals out of control and you get overwhelmed by fear. It's as if someone takes you by the hand and starts spinning you round and round, only to suddenly let you go. You fly off to the side, fall down, and remain lying in shock. It's a terrifying picture that started with small financial difficulties. And of course, the pendulum doesn't need your money. It is only interested in the negative energy that you radiate when your money is melting away. Once you lose most or all of it, you are no longer of interest to the pendulum simply because there is no more energy to take from you. This kind of induced transition happens to individuals as well as to large groups. In the latter case, the spiral is not a spiral anymore, but a powerful whirlpool from which it is very difficult to extract yourself. The only way to avoid an induced transition is not to grab onto the end of the spiral, not to get involved in the game of the destructive pendulum. It's not enough to simply know how this mechanism works. You need to constantly keep it in mind. Your overseer must not sleep. You have to pull yourself together whenever you find yourself habitually accepting a pendulum's game. That is, whenever you show discontent, indignation, or anxiety, or whenever you take part in destructive discussions and complaints. Remember, Everything that provokes a negative reaction in you has been prompted by the action of a destructive pendulum. The exact same thing happens in dreams. Until you realize it is a dream, you are a puppet in someone else's hands and can be tormented by nightmares. As soon as you wake up, shake off your delusions and realize the true nature of the game, you are the master of the situation and no longer a victim of circumstances. Summary Each man creates a separate layer of the world where he lives. The world of people as a whole consists of individual layers placed on top of each other. When emanating negative energy, you make the layer of your world worse. Aggression is mistakenly taken to be a sign of strength and dissatisfaction is seen as a normal reaction. Responding to negative events induces the transfer to negative life tracks. An induced transition includes a negative event in a person's layer. Don't allow any negative information into your layer. Don't allow means not to avoid, but to intentionally ignore and not become interested in certain kinds of information. Fundamental scientific discoveries do not come as a result of logical reasoning, but as flashes of inspiration, like knowledge taken out of nowhere. The same is true for great inventions. Good music is not just composed from a collection of notes, but comes as if on its own. Great works of art are created not as a result of mastering a technique, but out of inspiration. A work of art that has been painted by someone who has mastered a particular technique will not necessarily become a masterpiece. It becomes a masterpiece because of what lies outside the boundaries of excellent technical performance. Poetry that moves the soul is not a result of the logical sorting of rhymes, but because it comes from the same place, from the depths of the soul. Art that is based on inspiration and enlightenment has nothing to do with the mind. It is only later that the mind makes the products of such creation as its own. For example, the mind can make a perfect copy of an old masterpiece, but it is not capable of creating a new one. The mind analyzes data that the subconscious receives from the field of information and wraps this data in symbolic interpretation in the form of a melody, a picture, a poem, a formula, a diagram, etc. We usually do not understand how the subconscious gets access to the field of information. We only witness the manifestation of this access. 
An example is clairvoyance, the ability to perceive events that have either happened before, are about to happen, or are happening beyond the limits of visual perception. We don't understand the mechanism of these phenomena, so we call them paranormal. Pendulums of fundamental science, not wanting to admit their own powerlessness, don't take paranormal phenomena seriously. However, the fact that we can't explain things doesn't mean they are not true, and we can't just wave them away. There are people who see events in the information field as clearly as if they were happening before them in the material world. Such people have the ability to tune themselves to a specific sector in the space of variations that has already been manifested. For example, to tune into the sector of a missing person, a clairvoyant must look at his photograph or touch an object that belongs to him. Even the police sometimes use the services of clairvoyance. Not everyone can see so clearly, and so mistakes are made. There are two reasons for these mistakes. The first is when a clairvoyant gets tuned to a sector that has not been and will not be realized. Different sectors, depending on their relative distances from each other, can differ either greatly or barely at all in scripts and decorations. The second reason why a clairvoyant can make a mistake is that he can easily misinterpret the data he sees. For example, ancient foretellers and prophets, when looking at unfamiliar and strange scenes from the future, interpreted them in their own way, according to their level of knowledge. Consequently, their prophecies were imprecise. Whether you believe this or not is your choice, not is it important. Transurfing is just a model that allows us to use the laws of the world for our own interests. It is not meant to be the description of the world's structure. Transurfing is also not a stone monument with an inscription that reads, here is exactly where the heart of the problem is. Nevertheless, the fact remains that information from the space of variations somehow reaches us in the form of hints, visions, enlightenment, and signs. And if possible, we must try to grasp their meaning. Knowledge out of nowhere. Only a small select number of people can clearly read data from the field of information. Everyone else gets only echoes in the form of passing premonitions and vague knowledge. When the search for new solutions in realized sectors yields no results, the subconscious can sometimes slip into an unrealized sector where data is not enveloped in symbolic interpretation. When this happens, consciousness perceives it as vague and unclear information. But if the brain is able to grasp the essence of this information, you get enlightened and a clear understanding comes to you. There are many ambiguities and contradictions in the workings of consciousness, the mind, and the subconscious, the soul. If our mind understood everything that the soul wanted to tell it, humankind would have received direct access to the field of information a long time ago. It's hard to imagine the heights that civilization might have reached if this was the case. But it's not only that the mind doesn't know how to listen, it's that it doesn't even want to. Man's attention is ordinarily preoccupied either with objects in the external world or with inner thoughts and emotional feelings about those objects. The inner monologue almost never stops, even though it is under the mind's control. The mind doesn't listen to the weak signals of the soul. Instead, it authoritatively repeats over and over whatever it is preoccupied with. When the mind thinks, it operates in categories. It classifies qualities of visible objects in the materialized sectors. In other words, it thinks with the help of well-established labels, symbols, words, concepts, diagrams, rules, and so on. It then tries to place all information into those appropriately labeled files. There are labels for everything that exists in the world. The sky is blue, water is wet, birds fly, tigers are dangerous, winter is cold. Because information in unrealized sectors doesn't have any labels, the mind perceives it as incomprehensible knowledge. But if a new label can be put on a piece of knowledge, or if the perception can be explained in the framework of an existing explanation, a discovery is made. It's always difficult to come up with an explanation for something entirely new. 
Imagine a man who hears music for the first time. Music is also information in the form of sounds. When the mind receives this information, it knows but doesn't understand. There is no name or label for it. Understanding comes later, after the mind has heard music many times and is familiar with all the designations and objects associated with music. Notes, songs, instruments, musicians, and so on. But when man heard music for the first time, it was very real knowledge and at the same time an incomprehensible mystery. In other words, his mind knew it was experiencing something but could not identify exactly what it was experiencing. Try to explain the following definition to a small child. Milk is white. The child is only just starting to use abstract categories, thus he'll ask you a bunch of questions. Yes, he knows what milk is, but what is white? It's a color. And what is a color? It's a property of objects. And what's a property? And what's an object? And so on forever and ever. It would be easier not to explain what color is, but to show objects of different colors. Then the child's mind can use the abstract category of color to label the parameter where the objects differ. This is how he puts labels and definitions on everything around him and then learns to think using those definitions. In contrast to the mind, however, the soul doesn't use labels. How then can the soul explain to the mind that milk is white? From the time when the mind begins to think using abstract categories, its connection to the soul slowly begins to atrophy. The soul doesn't use categories. It doesn't think and doesn't talk. It feels and knows. It cannot express what it knows with words or symbols. Therefore, the mind can never agree with the soul. Suppose the soul is tuned to an unrealized sector and discovers something that does not yet exist in the material world. How can it bring this information to the mind? Moreover, the mind is constantly busy with its chatter. It thinks that everything can be intelligently explained and it is constantly keeping all information under control. The mind receives only vague signals from the soul, signals it cannot always identify with the help of its categories. The soul's ambiguous feelings and knowledge are drowned out by the loud thoughts of the mind. But if the mind's control weakens a little, intuitive feelings and knowledge can break through into consciousness. This breakthrough can appear in the form of a vague premonition. The mind gets distracted and in that moment you sense a feeling or some knowledge of the soul. This is called the rustling of the morning stars, the voice without words, thoughtfulness without thoughts, sound without volume. You understand something, but vaguely, you are not thinking, you feel it intuitively. Everyone has at some point in their life experienced this kind of intuition. For example, you feel that someone's coming right now or something is about to happen. Or you simply know something without being able to explain it. The mind is constantly busy generating thoughts, and the intuitions of the soul are literally drowned out by this thought mixer. As a result, intuitive knowledge is hard to access. If we could stop the constant churning of our thoughts and simply contemplate emptiness, we would hear the rustling of the morning stars, the wordless inner voice. The soul can find answers to many questions if we can only listen to its silent voice. Teaching the soul to purposefully tune itself to unrealized sectors and forcing the mind to listen to what the soul wants to tell it is not easy. You have to start with something simple. For example, the soul has two distinct feelings, a sense of inner peace and a sense of inner discomfort. The mind interprets these feelings as, I feel good and I feel bad. I'm confident and I'm worried. I like and I don't like. With every step you take in life, decisions must be made to do something or to do something else. Material manifestation is moving through the space of variations, and as a result, you get what you call your life. Depending on your thoughts and actions, particular sectors are being realized. The soul has access to the field of information. 
Somehow it sees what lays ahead in the approaching but not yet realized sectors. If the soul tunes into a sector that has not yet become reality, it knows what is waiting there, something nice or something bad. These feelings of the soul are perceived by the mind as vague sensations of inner peace or inner discomfort. The soul often knows what is awaiting it and tries with the weak voice of intuition to inform the mind. However, the mind almost never listens to the soul or at least doesn't attach significance to these vague gut feelings. The mind is trapped by pendulums. It is too busy solving problems, convinced that its rational actions are correct. The mind makes resolute decisions, governed by logical reasoning and common sense. However, it's well known that sensible reasoning in no way guarantees a right solution. The soul, in contrast to the mind, doesn't think. It feels and knows. Therefore, it doesn't make mistakes. How often do you hear people suddenly say, but I knew that nothing good would come of it. The task is to learn to determine what your soul is telling your mind in the moment of decision making. It is not that difficult to do. You just have to tell your overseer to pay attention to the state of your soul. Suppose you are making some kind of decision. Your mind is completely trapped by the pendulum or preoccupied with solving a problem. To hear the rustling of the morning stars, you only have to remember that you need to pay attention to your soul's condition. It seems too simple, but the only problem is in paying attention to your own feelings. Unfortunately, we are prone to trust reasonable arguments more than our own feelings. We have forgotten how to pay attention to the state of our soul. Here's something that may help. The next time you mentally review the possible solutions to a situation, Notice that the mind is being guided, not by feelings, but by reasoning. Try then to remember and notice what you are feeling. Does something about the situation put you on alerts or upset you? Is there something that feels dangerous or something that you don't like? After you make a decision, order your mind to be quiet for a moment and ask yourself, do I feel good or bad about this? Then pick a different solution and again ask yourself, do I feel good or bad about this? If you don't have an explicit feeling, it means that your mind is still a poor listener. Let your overseer force you to pay attention to the state your soul is in more often. However, it is also possible that the answer to your question is ambiguous. In that case, you shouldn't rely on such imprecise data. The only thing remaining is to act according to the suggestions your mind is making or to simplify the question. If you are able to get an explicit answer, yes, this is good for me, or no, this is bad for me, it means you have listened to the rustling of the morning stars. Now you know the answer. It doesn't mean that you will act according to the dictates of the soul, because we are not always free to act the way we wish, but at least you will know what you can expect in the unrealized sector. The Asker, the Offended, and the Warrior In most situations, there are two extremes of human behavior. Going with the flow, like a little paper boat with no will of your own, or rowing against the flow, stubbornly insisting on your own way. If you were just sitting around, not taking any initiative or striving to achieve anything, then life directs you. You become a puppet of pendulums and they determine your fate at their discretion. In this case, you refuse to choose your own destiny. Your choice is to have a predetermined destiny. Let it be whatever it is. What will be, will be. According to such a condition, you claim that you can't escape your fate. And you are correct because there happens to be a destiny like that in the space of variations. Having made this choice, you can only complain helplessly about your fate and place your hope on higher powers. Having put your destiny in others' hands, you submit to asking for charity for living your life or you appeal to pendulums or to some higher power. Pendulums force you to work, and you spend your whole life cringing before them, getting only a few crumbs to live on in return. You naively appeal to higher powers, but they don't care about you. In effect, you give away any responsibility for your own destiny, saying, everything is in God's hands. And if that is the case, all you need to do is ask nicely, and as God is merciful, 
he will give it to you. Mountains and valleys, rivers and oceans, oh the sky, oh the earth, I bow before your power. I am filled with reverence and belief. I believe that you will help me buy my morning newspaper. You probably think a morning newspaper is too exaggerated of an example. Not at all, because to great higher powers, there is no difference between a morning newspaper and a grand palace. Anything is possible for them. There is a Russian joke about a man lying on his couch praying, Oh God, help me get rich. I know you can do it. I believe in your greatness. I put my hopes in you and your mercy. The Lord replies in vexation, Listen, dude, you could at least buy a lottery ticket. It is very comfortable to decline all responsibility for your life and at the same time to wallow in your inner importance. Yes, importance, because you are imagining yourself to be such an important person to whom God devotes all his majesty and mercy. But God has already given man too much. He has already given him freedom of choice. But man, due to his infantile nature, doesn't accept this gift and is constantly dissatisfied. Infantile man finds justification in the fact that the way towards the goal is strewn with obstacles. In fact, there is always something in the way of a man's goal, and that something is pendulums and balancing forces which come as a result of creating the excess potential of importance. The alternative to asking for charity or appealing to higher powers is to feel offended, to express dissatisfaction with your life, and to demand things that you feel are your right. But by expressing your demands, you bring even more harm to your destiny. As an example, a man comes to a picture gallery. He doesn't like the exhibition, and he considers it his right to express dissatisfaction. He stamps his feet, makes threats, demands that the exhibition be taken down, and starts destroying the objects around him. Naturally, there is some kind of reprisal for his actions. He then gets more offended and actively rants and raves. He thinks other people and situations should accommodate his every whim. It doesn't occur to him that he is only a guest in this world. There is also a third category of person who, instead of appealing for help or feeling offended, decides to struggle against all odds to get what he wants. He makes the choice that my destiny is in my hands. Such a person becomes a warrior and begins to struggle for his place in the world. Taking a hard stand, he engages in war with pendulums, gets drawn into ongoing competition, and elbows his way forward. His entire life becomes a continuous struggle for existence. He has chosen to struggle, and this alternative also exists in the space of variations. False humility and dissatisfaction both make you dependent on pendulums. Therefore, when you submit to asking for help and appealing to higher powers, you create excess potential through guilt and voluntarily give yourself away to the hands of manipulators. By virtue of submitting, you believe that you are condemned to ask and wait and hope that someone will give you something. On the other hand, when you feel offended, you create excess potential in the form of dissatisfaction, which turns balancing forces against you. In this way, you indirectly ruin your fate. Having chosen the battle, the warrior takes a more productive stand, but his life is hard and consumes a lot of his energy. No matter how much he resists, he gets himself more and more enveloped in the spider web. It seems to him that he is struggling for his destiny, while in fact he is spending his energy in vain. Sometimes he gains a victory, but at what price? His victory is there for all to see and everyone sees how incredibly difficult it is to win the crown of victory. And once more, society's notion that to achieve something, you have to be courageous and persistent and work hard for it gets reinforced. This social opinion is actually formed by pendulums which feed off the excess potential of inner and outer importance. When a goal seems difficult to reach, this is outer importance talking. When it seems reachable only by someone who possesses outstanding qualities, it is inner importance talking. In both cases, the warrior may even be allowed to get to the finish line and feel satisfied, but he will be fleeced without understanding that he has spent his energy more on fulfilling the demands of pendulums than on reaching his goal. 
To free yourself from pendulums, you have to abandon inner and outer importance. If you do this, obstacles on the way to your goal will simply self-destruct, leaving you able not to ask, not to demand, and not to struggle, but simply to go and take, which is the subject of the rest of this book. Going with the flow. Those who appeal for help and those who feel offended by their circumstances unwillingly go with the flow of life. The warrior, on the other hand, tries to fight against the flow and everyone to a degree takes on each of these roles from time to time. Yet in none of these cases is anyone free. Try to imagine yourself not resisting the flow and not causing any extra turbulence, but simply going along with the flow without will, like a little paper boat. Instead, you are intentionally moving in agreement with the flow, adjusting to things as they happen, keeping your chosen direction. You are behind the steering wheel. Information in the space of variations is stationary, like a matrix, but at the same time, the information structure is organized into chains of cause and effect. These chains give birth to the flow of variations. First, you must correctly choose the general direction of this flow, and the direction is determined by your goal and the means for attaining it. After choosing the direction, you must rely on the flow as much as possible and make good decisions so as not to deviate from it. Of course, the mind is easily prevented from making efficient decisions because it is constantly under the pressure of artificially created importance. Internal and external importance are, in essence, the main sources of our problems. To the extent that we allow importance to enter, balancing forces appear like rapids and whirlpools on the way through the flow. If we can throw off importance, the flow turns into a much calmer river. The question of whether you should surrender yourself to the flow is also a question of importance. External importance forces the mind to look for complicated solutions to simple problems, whereas inner importance convinces the mind that it is reasoning soundly and making the only possible correct decision. When you throw importance away, the mind breathes freely because it gets released from artificially created problems and the influence of pendulums. It is then able to make better, more objective decisions. The beauty of this lies in the fact that the mind doesn't need great intellect to operate once it frees itself from the burden of importance. The flow of variations already contains the solutions to all your problems. More importantly, however, the majority of all your problems are artificially created by the mind. A restless mind is continuously experiencing the pull and push of pendulums and trying to solve all its problems at the same time. But its strong-willed decisions are in most cases futile. Most problems, especially small ones, automatically solve themselves if you don't disturb the flow of variations. If the solution already exists in space, you don't even need a great intellect to find it. As long as you don't interfere with the flow of variations, a solution will come by itself, and it will be the optimal solution, which already lies in the structure of the information field. This is because cause and effect chains create separate streams in the flow of variations. These streams are the optimal ways in which causes and effects happen. Everything exists in the space of variations, but only the optimal or the least energy consuming variations are likely to be realized. Nature does not waste energy. All its processes move by the way of least energy expenditure and streams of variations are organized the same way. This is where optimal solutions lie. But because the mind is usually trapped by pendulums and acts in their interests, it is constantly getting out of the optimal streams by creating confusion and looking for complicated solutions to simple problems. Knowing about these streams in the flow of variations is a luxury, a gift for the mind, because each problem contains coded keys to its solution. The first key is to move along the path of least resistance. We usually look for complicated solutions because they present obstacles, and obstacles, of course, must be overcome with great effort. 
We have to turn this around and cultivate the habit of choosing the simplest solution for whatever problem comes up. In general, the solution is simply this. In accordance with the principle of going with the flow, try to do everything in the easiest and simplest way possible. The optimal variations of any actions are organized in streams that are formed as chains of cause and effect. When you make the decision to take the next step in your action, you choose the next link in the chain, and you need to determine the best link. In most cases, you will think that you are making a logical decision based on common sense and everyday experience. The mind, however, is strong-willed and thinks it can calculate and explain everything. But this is not the case. The problem is that the mind cannot always choose the optimal variation because the cause and effect chains of the flow don't always match its logical constructions. No matter how hard you try, you will rarely choose the optimal action if you use only logical conclusions. The mind is usually under the pressure of stress, troubles, depression, or increased activity, and because of this, pendulums are constantly pulling at it. In response, the mind is always reacting forcefully and mounting a frontal attack on the external world. To correctly choose the next chain of the flow, you need only to free yourself from the strings of the pendulum and follow the stream. Take a balanced position, minimize the level of importance that you are giving to the situation, and do not create excess potential. When you are in a state of balance with the surrounding world, you simply go with the flow. You can then see a multitude of signs that will guide you. Instead of participating in events, you let them go and become an observant bystander. Not a slave, not a master. Simply someone who performs actions. When your mind tries to make reasonable, strong-willed decisions, pull yourself back. Rent yourself out and observe events from the sidelines. Everything is a lot easier than it seems. Yield to this simplicity. It is the mind that brings you to the precipice of a waterfall, not the flow of variations. For example, you have to find something you really need in a shop. But you don't know exactly where this thing is. The mind suggests the most reasonable, but often the most complicated option. You go around half the city, but in the end, you find the item in a shop close to your house. If the importance of the problem had been lower, the mind would not have looked for a complicated solution. Here is another example. There is an entire to-do list in your hands. What should you choose to do first and what later? You don't have to think about it. Simply do the things you feel like doing. Move together with the flow. Untie your mind from the influence of pendulums. This doesn't mean turning into a helpless little paper boat on the waves. It means paddling gently and smoothly. Each time you need to find a solution, ask yourself, what's the simplest way of looking for the solution? For instance, if you have a long to-do list, don't attribute too much importance to how you will get it done. Just start with the things you feel like doing and go on from there. When someone or something distracts you or leads you astray, don't be in a hurry to resist or avoid it. Instead, rent yourself out and watch what happens next. Again, just ask yourself, what is the simplest way to do this? Allow things to happen in the simplest way. If someone suggests something or imposes their point of view, don't be in a hurry to reject them or enter an argument. Let your mind remain flexible and open to alternatives. Observe first, then act. Let the game develop as much as possible on its own, under your observation. Let your life go with the flow and you will see how much easier it gets. Guiding Signs But how do you know where the flow is going? And how can you distinguish a normal turn in the flow from something harmful? One way is with the help of tangible signs that the world is constantly giving us. The most familiar type of signs is omens good omens and bad omens. If you see a rainbow, it's a good omen. If you see a black cat, misfortune awaits. 
These are examples of established superstitions, but they don't always come true. Why? Because they depend on what you believe. If you expect something to come, your thoughts bring corresponding changes to the parameters of thought radiation, and you are put onto a life track that corresponds to those parameters. You get exactly what you want or what you are afraid of. You yourself allow the possibility in your script. Omens by themselves cannot serve as laws or rules. Why is it that a black cat is a standard bad sign for everybody? Put another way, how in the world can a black cat have an influence on your life? The influence is not the cat, but your attitude to the omen. If you believe in omens, they shape the events of your life. If you sort of believe in omens, their influence is less, but still there nonetheless. If you don't believe in them at all, and don't pay any attention to them, they do not have any influence whatsoever on your life. It's all very simple. You get what you allow into your script. Although omens may not affect the events in your life, they can serve as guiding signs. For example, a black cat itself cannot have any direct influence, but it can serve as a sign, a warning of something that will take place on your way in the flow of variations. The question then is, what signs can be considered guiding signs? After all, when you make up your mind to monitor everything around you, you see the signs everywhere. How do you interpret them? The only thing you can really do is take the sign into account, increase your level of awareness, and be more careful. Guiding signs indicate a possible turn in the flow of variations. They herald an event that will bring substantial changes into the flow of life. If you expect some sort of turn, even an insignificant one, then a sign can appear that signals it's coming. A sign may also appear if an unexpected turn is coming in the near future. Changes that happen may seem insignificant, but you nonetheless feel that something is different. There is a qualitative difference that you notice, either consciously or unconsciously, as if something is not quite the same as it was a minute ago. Guiding signs appear only when a transfer onto another life track is initiated. You can ignore a separate phenomenon. For example, a crow croaks, but that doesn't put you on alert. You don't feel any qualitative difference, which means you were on the same life track as before. But if you pay attention to the phenomenon and feel something unusual, something odd about the episode, then it could be a sign. Guiding signs are characterized by the fact that they signal your movement onto a substantially different life track. The ones that usually put you on alert happen right after you complete the transfer onto a different track. This is because life tracks are qualitatively different from each other. The difference is hard to put into words. You just have a feeling that something is not quite right. When the transfer has been completed, you feel it intuitively and sometimes even notice obvious changes in how the signs look. As if from the corner of your eye you see or suspect that something new has appeared in your flow of life. Signs act as pointers. They say to you, something has changed, something has happened. A phenomenon that takes place on a current life track usually doesn't put you on alert because it has the same quality as other phenomena on that given track. However, if you ignore everything that happens around you, you won't be able to notice obvious signs either. The transfer to a substantially different track usually happens gradually through intermediate tracks. Signs on intermediate tracks may appear as warnings of varying degrees of severity. Sometimes you ignore the first warning, the transfer continues, then a second warning appears, then a third. And if after that you don't stop, then you find yourself on the final track where something happens. It's difficult to interpret signs precisely and even to know whether something that attracts your attention is a sign or not. All you can do is consider that the world is trying to tell you something. Sometimes it is nice to at least get a hint of what is waiting ahead especially if it is unpleasant or dangerous. In most cases, you can question a possible sign in terms of a possible yes or no answer. For example, will it work out or not? Will you be successful or not? Will you be able to do it or not? Will it be good or bad? Will it be dangerous or safe? 
In other words, reduce your interpretation of signs down to one question, the answer to which is either positive or negative. Trying to be more specific than that is not helpful and often just leads to confusion. A sign carries in itself a hint about the quality of an upcoming turn to a different track. If you associate the sign with unpleasant sensations and it fills you with misgivings, distrust, unease, or worry, then it is signaling a negative turn of events. But on the other hand, if your reaction is ambiguous, then there's no point trying to interpret the sign. Your evaluation will be unreliable. So you shouldn't worry about that sign or attribute too much significance to it. However, if you have already paid attention to the sign, then you shouldn't disregard it either. Maybe the sign is a warning that you need to be more careful or that you ought to change your behavior or stop doing something or choose another direction for your actions. Signs can take varied forms, but in each case, you only need to distinguish whether the meaning behind them is positive or negative. For example, you are in a hurry, but an old lady with a crutch is blocking your way and there's no way you can go around her. What does this mean? More than likely, you will be late. Or there goes your bus, which ordinarily doesn't go very fast, but today, for some reason, it is speeding like crazy. Apparently, you've gone too far in some situation and should be more careful. Another example could be that you were trying to do something that is not really going too well no matter what you do. There is always something in the way and the whole thing is simply not running as smoothly as it should. Maybe this means that it's a dead end and you don't need to go that way at all. The good thing about signs is that they can wake you up before it's too late. For example, they make you realize that you are possibly acting in the interests of a destructive pendulum to your disadvantage. People often make fatal mistakes when under a pendulum spell and only later remember that they had not been aware of their actions at the time, that they could have been more on guard. It's never wrong to maintain a sense of caution, to be aware of what is going on, and to have a sensible view of things. It's also important not to let cautiousness turn into anxiety and suspicion. You have to care about things without worrying about them. You have to rent yourself out and be impeccable in everything you do. Strange as it may seem, some of the clearest and most precise guiding signs are phrases spontaneously uttered by other people. Things they mention in passing without putting much thought into what they are saying. If someone is obviously trying to impose their opinion on you, don't pay much attention to it. But if someone spontaneously mentions something about what you could do in a specific situation, Take it very seriously. You can probably recall times where you said something to someone almost automatically without thinking, as though the answer was already there deep inside your consciousness and just fell from your lips, bypassing the analytical mechanism of your mind. Sometimes in these cases, the soul speaks from a realm that is not directly connected to the information field. For example, someone says to you in passing, take a scarf with you or you'll catch a cold. If you don't take their advice, you'll regret it later for sure. Or suppose you're concerned with a problem and someone incidentally recommends something that seems unimportant or unrelated. Don't be in a hurry to wave them off. Instead, consider their opinion. Or if you're convinced you're right, but someone accidentally shows you that in this case you are wrong, don't be stubborn. Take a look. Maybe you are futilely going about things the wrong way. Inner discomfort is also a clear sign, a sign from the soul. Yet it is something we often don't pay much attention to, which is ironic because when you have to make a decision, no one knows better than your own soul how to make it. Yes, it's difficult to understand what exactly the soul wants to tell you, but you can learn to distinguish whether the soul likes your mind's decision or not. If you have to make some kind of decision, stop and listen to the rustling of the morning stars. If your mind has already made a decision before you remember about the rustling, try to recall what you were feeling when you made the decision. Simply look back and ask yourself, I felt good or I didn't feel good. If you made the decision reluctantly, if it didn't feel right, then you clearly didn't feel good about it. In that case, if the decision can be altered, 
Go ahead and change it. Determining the level of your inner discomfort is actually not difficult. The difficult thing is to remember in time to listen to your feelings. This is because the mind believes that its reasoning holds authority. It doesn't want to listen to anyone but itself, and its loud roar drowns out the whisper of the soul. The mind also tries to oversubstantiate its case, to find proofs for everything. You stand before a simple choice of yes or no, where the soul tries timidly to say no. The mind is aware of this no, but pretends not to hear it. It then presents persuading arguments based on sensible reasoning to support its yes. To get around this, here's a simple and reliable formula for determining when your soul is saying no. If you have to convince yourself and talk yourself into saying yes, then it means your soul is saying no. When your soul is saying yes, you don't have to talk yourself into anything. It is certainly a good idea to pay attention to the signs your world is showing you. But this does mean you need to look for signs in everything. Oh, the birds are flying high in the sky. What could this mean? Well, they're not afraid of heights, so they are flying high. The point is to keep in mind that phenomena may be guiding signs. As soon as you forget about this, pendulums will take you by the hand and you could become a victim of circumstances. If a desire makes you feel some discomfort and there is the possibility of refusing that desire, then do exactly that. Refuse it. The element of discomfort means that the desire is not coming from the soul but from the mind and the mind's desires are always imposed by pendulums. The same is true of actions. If you ignore the inner discomfort you are feeling, you may be sorry later. Therefore, if possible, it is better to refuse desires and actions that may evoke discomfort, doubts, apprehension, or feelings of guilt. Doing so will simplify your life and free you from a lot of problems. Remember too that only you can notice and interpret your own signs. You don't have to take a course on how to do it. You will understand everything on your own as long as you pay attention to yourself and the world around you and as long as you refrain from creating excess potential. And remember that the main sign you should pay attention to is your state of inner comfort each time you are about to make a decision. It's really worthwhile to stop and try to listen to the rustling of the morning stars. Letting go of the situation. Knowing about streams in the flow of variations relieves your mind of two overwhelming burdens. The need to rationally solve all problems and the need to always have all situations under control. Of course, these burdens will be lifted only if your mind is willing to relieve itself of them. And for this to happen, the mind needs a more or less rational explanation as to why it is better not to carry these burdens around. These two overwhelming burdens that our mind carries around were imposed on it in childhood. We are constantly taught, use your head. Are you aware of what you're doing? Explain your actions. Do your homework because only if you learn to use your mind will you ever be able to achieve anything in life. You dummy, won't you ever learn? Our teachers and circumstances made a soldier out of our mind. A soldier ready at any moment to find an explanation, to give an answer to any question, to immediately evaluate situations, to make decisions, to maintain control over what is happening. The mind has been taught to act rationally with common sense. This does not mean you should get rid of common sense. On the contrary, common sense provides you with guidelines for how you should behave in the world to survive. The only problem is that the mind makes the mistake of following these guidelines literally and too strictly. Obsession with common sense prevents the mind from looking around and seeing when things don't agree with guidelines. There are so many things in the world that diverge from common sense, and the best way to navigate them is to rely on the streams in the flow of variations. As it happens, expediency lies in these streams, and that is exactly what the mind is looking for. Streams also follow the way of least resistance. 
Nature is, in essence, perfect, and there is more expediency and logic in the streams than in the wisest arguments. Besides, no matter how much the mind is convinced that it is thinking sensibly, it can still be mistaken. Even when you follow the flow of variations, the mind will still make mistakes, but there will be fewer of them if the mind lets problems solve themselves without actively interfering with the process. That is called letting go of the situation. You must loosen your grip, lower the amount of control, not disturb the flow, and give more freedom of action to the surrounding world. Pressing and pushing the world is not only useless, but harmful. When the mind disagrees with the flow, it creates excess potential. With transurfing, however, another possibility exists. When you lower the level of your inner and outer importance, excess potential diminishes and obstacles virtually eliminate themselves. The same thing happens when you go around obstacles instead of resisting and fighting against them. And the more you do both, the more guiding signs can help you. The mind also has a tendency to regard events that do not seem to fit in its script as obstacles. The mind usually plans and calculates everything in advance, and if something unforeseen happens, the mind actively fights against it. As a result, the situation becomes worse. At that point, you have to give more freedom to the flow. After all, the flow is not interested in ruining your fate. It is the mind that ruins your fate with its ill-informed decisions and actions. From the mind's point of view, expediency is when everything is running according to the pre-designed script. Anything that doesn't agree with the script is perceived as an undesired problem. And problems have to be solved. A mission the mind embraces with diligence, but which only creates new problems. Think about it. When do people feel happy? When do they experience satisfaction? When are they satisfied with themselves? When everything goes according to plan. The smallest deviation from this script is seen as a failure. Inner importance won't allow the mind to accept the possibility of deviations. The mind thinks, after all, I have planned and calculated everything in advance. I know better what is good and what is bad for me. I'm being sensible. Life often gives gifts to people which they reluctantly receive only because these gifts are not part of their plan. I wanted a different toy. Reality is such that we hardly ever get just the toys we were planning to have. Other things come our way too, so we walk around gloomy and dissatisfied. Imagine how much more enjoyable life would be if the mind were to lower its levels of importance and recognize the rights of deviations to exist in the script. But because the mind is usually not willing to allow deviations in your script, it cannot use the ready solutions to problems in the streams of the flow of variations. The mind's manic tendency to keep everything under control turns life into a constant battle with the flow. It simply cannot allow the flow of variations to move on its own. And here we come to the mind's other great mistake. The mind wants to control not its movement along the flow of variations, but the flow itself. And from this comes almost all of our problems and unpleasant experiences. Real expediency, moving along the path of least resistance, cannot create problems or obstacles. Activate your overseer and for the course of one day, observe how your mind tries to control the flow. Something is proposed to you and you refuse. Someone tries to tell you something and you wave it off. Someone expresses their opinion and you argue against it. Someone does something his own way and you set him on the right path. You wait for one thing, but get something completely different and express your dissatisfaction. Someone interferes with you and you lose your temper. Something goes against your script and you launch a frontal attack to redirect the flow of events. Instead, try to loosen your grip of control and grant more freedom to the flow. This does not mean agreeing to everything or accepting everything that is handed to you. Simply change your tactics. Shift your center of gravity away from control and to observation. Don't be in a rush to wave things off, to object, to argue, to state your opinion, to interfere, to control, or to criticize. 
give the situation a chance to resolve itself without your active interference or resistance. You'll be, if not dumbfounded, then at least amazed. And something paradoxical will happen. Having refused control over situations, you will gain even more control than you had before. A detached observer always has a great advantage than a first-hand participant. When you look back, you'll become convinced that your control was against the flow. The suggestions of others make a lot of sense. Arguing is completely useless. Your interference is in vain. What you saw as obstacles are not obstacles at all. Problems resolve themselves just fine without your knowledge. Everything you got that you didn't plan for isn't that bad after all. Incidental phrases that were mentioned in passing turned out to be valid. Your inner discomfort served as a warning. You didn't waste excess energy. You remained satisfied. All of these are the magnificent gifts that I mentioned at the beginning of this book. But of course, you can't forget about pendulums. When you try to move with the flow of variations, pendulums want to make life difficult for you. They don't like streams in the flow because streams move in the direction of the least expenditure of energy, which means that you are now creating almost no excess potential and therefore not feeding pendulums. As a result, they have to try harder to reach you. But you know that the main remedy is always to control your level of inner and outer importance, and in that way, to remain free. Summary The mind interprets information using a collection of well-established labels. The soul doesn't think and doesn't speak, but it feels and knows. The mind is only able to create a relatively new version of a new house out of old bricks. Entirely new discoveries come from unrealized sectors. The soul serves as a mediator between entirely new information and the mind. The soul accepts unrealized information as knowledge without interpretations. If the mind is successful in interpreting the soul's information, a discovery is made. The mind is capable of unambiguously determining the state of inner comfort. Train yourself to pay attention to your level of inner comfort. Having refused importance, you will get the freedom to choose your destiny. Freedom of choice allows you to stop asking, stop demanding, and stop struggling. It allows you to go and take whatever you want. The structure of information is arranged into chains of cause and effect links. Cause and effect links give rise to the flow of variations. The paths of least resistance are arranged into separate streams. Streams in the flow of variations have in themselves the solutions to all problems. Internal and external importance throw the mind out of the optimal stream. Everything is a lot easier than it seems. Give in to this simplicity. It is not omens that work, but your attitude toward them. Guiding signs point at possible turns in the flow of variations. Life tracks differ qualitatively from one another. Signs put us on alert because they appear during a transfer to another life track. Signs can be distinguished by their ability to create the feeling that something is not quite right. Spontaneous phrases can be perceived as clear instructions that you may act on. Inner discomfort is a clear sign. If you have to talk yourself into something, it means the soul is saying no. If you have the possibility to refuse an uncomfortable decision, refuse it. It's necessary to loosen your grip of control and accept unforeseen events in your script. Importance gets in the way of accepting the possibility of deviations in your script. The mind strives to control not its movement along the flow, but the flow itself. Move the center of gravity from control to observation. 
Having relinquished control, you will get real control over a situation. If you move along the flow of variations, the world will come out to greet you.